Okay. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the workshop on benchmarking reproducibility and open source code in control. My name is Angela Schoelig and I'm, I've organized this with a team of people, but the ones who are here is Lucas, Federico, Adam, and Jacobo. And this is also our first workshop at a CDC conference. Um, so let's see how it goes. We have virtual participants as well as um, real um, participants and speakers. Um, we also do live stream this to YouTube. So I hope everybody is okay with this. Okay. So what motivated us to actually organize this workshop? Oh yeah, here's, you see also the other organizers, which uh, is Jonathan Howe from MIT, Peter Cork from QUT and George Pappas from the University of Pennsylvania and Sandra Hilche from TU Munich as well. Um, so what motivated us to do this workshop? So it is really motivated by controls approaches that increasingly rely on optimization um, that explore database methods and controls that increasingly uses advanced computational tools. So um, I'm sure every one of you has at least implemented a model predictive controller before, which uses an optimizer. And even in that case, it may be difficult to reproduce these results on a different computer with a different optimization toolbox. And if the exact parameters of the optimizer have not been shared in the paper. And so to achieve reproducibility in controls, we be believe sharing code is really important. And there, I, I guess, controls lags a bit behind other fields such as machine learning and robotics, where this has been a bit more commonly done because I guess similar features applied to those fields much earlier. Um, so today we have two themes. Um, in the morning, we have theme A on reproducibility and open source code. And I'll start with a brief introduction to the workshop and the theme. And then we have lightning talks. Um, these were papers that were submitted to the workshop. Um, and then at 11, uh, Magnus Egerstedt is joining us for an invited talk about an open source hardware testbed. And afterwards, we have Savio Fuller join us. And both of, um, and then we have a final um, panel discussion on the top topic with Stefan Sosnowski and Sawyer Fuller. And then theme B on benchmarking is happening after lunch. And again, we have a set of lightning talks. Um, and after the coffee break, two more invited talks and a panel discussion and then concluding remarks. And so for you as an audience, you we have um, a short moment after the lightning talks to ask questions, and you are also invited to really actively participate in the panel discussions. For we hope also to connect with you um, during the breaks. So there is a lunch break. Um, and yeah, I hope that this during the lunch break, we can have further discussions and after the workshop and before the welcome reception, um, we plan to go to a place and we'll share this later again, um, uh, where we could have some drinks. So what is actually our path to this workshop? So this, this path towards this workshop started when my team worked on a review paper on safe learning in robotics. And, um, and as a result of this review paper, we started actually open, uh, developing an open, co open source benchmark suit co called Safe Control Gym. And um, we also more closely studied the impact of releasing codes with publications and how much this is done both in the controls community as well as in the machine learning and the robotics community. And so I'll give you a few more insights into these three aspects. So what led us to do this review paper? What were our findings? Um, what is this benchmark suit about? And why should you care? And then where do we stand as a community in terms of open sourcing our code? And um, how does that compare to other fields? So um, when we started the 
review paper, we try to um, look at two core features that we see in modern um, control systems. One is we usually want very strong guarantees for controls and robotics. And that means stability as well as constraint satisfaction. And so we notice in the literature on safe learning and, and safe control for robotics that, you know, what we usually have in controls is hard constraint satisfaction guarantees. But um, if you look more at reinforcement learning algorithms, they usually come with no guarantees. And then there's levels in between. Soft constraint satisfaction means that we have, um, we encourage the satisfaction of constraint and a probabilistic constraint satisfaction is that we can guarantee satisfying constraints with high probability. And so, you know, in controls, they are usually, um, you know, concerned about really providing hard constraint satisfaction guarantees. But if we, you know, look at other fields, this is not necessarily the case. And then on the X axis, we have the complexity of the system on the left. If you have fully known dynamics, and I think this is something that you know um, we usually do in controls, we know what the system dynamics are, and sometimes we know um, the the limits or bounds on uncertainties. But we also assume these bounds are known. And then um, if we move all the way to the right, there may be systems where we really do not know ahead of time the exact model of the system, the uncertainties, etc. And if we look at typical applications, um, here we take the example in robotics, you know, um, the traditional assembly line robots lie here at the top left. So we, we often can, you know, we know the system well, we can model it well, we can provide limits on the uncertainties, and we can provide strong guarantees um, that the robot does what, it, what it's supposed to do and that it avoids collisions. But that is because the environment is very well defined. There are no humans in the environment and everything can be programmed and modeled ahead of time. However, if we kind of look at applications, applications that are on the horizon starting you know from self-driving cars to um, surgical robots we have an increasing complexity and increasing safety requirements because these robots move closer to us humans we expect them to operate in you know in human-centered environments and so that means also that um, we need more advanced techniques that rely on adaptation, rely on learning from data, and rely increasingly on more advanced computational tools. And if, you, if we rely on these, those tools have lots of, lots of parameters to tune, um, various ways to implement it to, for example, achieve really low latency. And so the code becomes more and more important. And so what we saw, this trend um, is something we saw, you know, in our review paper on safe learning in robotics. And if you looked at learning approaches that really enable new capabilities in robotics, we saw that this field is driven by two main communities, the reinforcement learning community, as well as the controls community. And comparisons and benchmarking um, was very difficult to do or imp almost impossible. And the reason for this is that, you know, if we look in controls, we deal with problems in this, in this area of the diagram. It's the same diagram with the same X and Y axis. So um, in standard control approaches, we can provide hard constraint satisfaction guarantees because um, we operate in, in an area where we know the dynamics very well. And you know, this still can provide really interesting results. For example, here um, we move the robot and this is purely based on model-based control, right? With the force disturbance. Um, but it has its limitations. 
And this is where reinforcement learning comes in. So reinforcement learning is a purely, the vanilla version of reinforcement learning is purely database. So there are no prior assumptions. However, usually these approaches also provide absolutely zero guarantees, right? Um, but they can do amazing things like this. I mean, if you think about um, solving this Rubik's cube with a robot hand, there's a lot of contact. Contact is difficult because it introduces hybrid dynamics. So you, solving this with, with traditional control methods is, is very difficult or impossible. Um, so this was this was learned in in simulation using reinforcement learning. Um, but what you don't see is that it only works one in five times. So 20% success rate um, for, for hard, um, for hard um, cases. And, and otherwise, so in, in four out of five cases, the cube falls down or the robot gets stuck or there's a timeout. And so while you know, the, the standard reinforcement learning approaches can be really powerful, they, um, they don't provide any guarantees and rely on a lot of data. And often this data is produced in simulation, so you also rely on a reasonably accurate simulation. And recently there has been a lot of work to kind of fill this wide area. And um, we categorize the, this work in three areas. Either approaches try to safely learn the uncertain dynamics, so you learn the model of the robot. Um, there are also reinforcement learning algorithms that encourage safety and robustness by including those kind of objectives in the reward function. And more recently, there has also been um, a lot of work from the controls community to um, append any learning controller with safety certificates and safety filter. And so all this work try, tries to kind of move up to the top right corner where we can have very expressive models and expressive policies while still guaranteeing safety. Right? And so this was kind of um, the outcome of our review paper on safe learning for robotics. The, um, yeah, there has been significant work, but still more to be done to really achieve um, amazing capabilities while still guaranteeing um, safety. Um, what we also saw when we did this review paper is that the um, examples the people used in the papers had a, a wide range of um, different assumptions. So on the one hand, some papers use simple numerical examples or crib worlds. This is very common in, in reinforcement learning. Um, some works use robot simulators and physics-based environments, and others tested directly um, on real robots. Right? And if we looked at how many of these works were actually available in open source, it's very little, right? So here we kind of categorize them based on the categories you saw in the previous slide. So um, learning-based control approaches, safe reinforcement learning, and safety certification and safety filters. And if you look at what, how many of the papers that we actually cited in our review paper have open source code available is relatively little. So to look at the numbers uh, in more detail, so um, you know we have less than one quarter uh, of um, open source code available, and often they have different prior assumptions made in the papers. The metrics that are that are used to define success um, varied a lot from like learning efficiency, data efficiency. Um, guaranteeing safety, et cetera. And um, a lot of the ex um, papers lacked real experimental evaluation. Um, so in summary, a lot of the research was rare, very rarely compared. 
And the approaches relied on sophisticated optimization approaches, data-based approaches, and computational tools. Um, yeah, and so and, and tested in very different environments. And here you see the statistics on the hardware experiment. So from the around 100 papers that we cite in our review um, that covered both the reinforcement learning as well as the controls community, um, you know, a, a bit more than 25% um, had actual hardware experiments. Despite we reduced, you know, really focused on papers that had robotics as an application in mind. And so that motivated us to um, develop a, an, a benchmark environment or simulation environment where we could actually try out the algorithms that we found in our review paper and compare them. And so we developed what we call safe control gym. And the key features of this environment is that we can define safety constraints, you know, which is really important um, in robotics, but also for general controls applications. You can incorporate prior knowledge. And this is something really where, where controls people are really good at, right? We often have a good understanding of the model of the system. Um, and, and maybe even certain assumptions about the uncertainty that we can he embed here. And, um, and we enable this by combining symbolic models that you can define in this environment with, um, and you can expand this with data that you obtain from the simulation environment. And you have a gym architecture, so an interface that uh, enables you to run any open source reinforcement okay. learning algorithm. So to summarize, you know, um, this environment really allows you to embed your prior knowledge in terms of uh, models into the learning algorithm and, um, and then run multiple different controls algorithm, starting from LQR all the way to um, pure model-free reinforcement learning and compi combining the results. And so, yeah, you can find it on GitHub. Um, and, and yeah, the, the motivation is really, we wanted to develop something that is uni uh, uniformly available to many people across the spectrum of reinforcement learning researchers to robotics researchers to control researchers. That is why we focus initially on a simulation tool, because that can be available to everyone and um, has a very standardized interface such that it can be expanded both on the side of more control applications and control algorithms, as well as on the environment side as well. So right now, um, the, the basic components are that we have we rely on an open source physics engine um, bullet, and we are compatible with the open AI gym interface. The symbolic framework um, is enabled through Cas Cassidy, and there is a YAML based configuration system. And so it can be expanded in different directions. Right now, we have three test environments, so three simulation environments the car pole. The 1D quadrotor, so a quadrotor that only moves up and down, and a 2D quadrotor, and um, are also working internally with a 3D quadrotor, but haven't fully released this. And why did we choose these environments? Because these were at least a common denominator that we found in the reinforcement learning and the controls literature. Um, and you know, you can do multiple tasks. Right now, we mostly work with either just stabilization or trajectory tracking. But yeah, of course, we would like to expand these environments further to, um, for example, robot arms or contact-rich environments where you, you have the contact, which is very difficult to deal with in traditional control. And so here you see a rough architecture. But what is important? Like, you know, 
uh, what is important is that we have already implemented a lot of the standard algorithms. And if you develop a new learning-based or model-based algorithm, you can compare it to all the algorithms that are there already. And so there's basically no reason anymore that you cannot very easily compare your algorithm to other, at least standard algorithms. And so we, on the one hand, have purely model-based um, algorithms that rely purely on the symbolic model, which is you know, an LQR, iterative LQR, and a linear model predictive controller. And then we do have um, safe, various safe learning algorithms, some more driven by the controls community, such as Gaussian process-based model predictive control um, or model predictive control safety filters and control barrier certification. But we also have the standard reinforcement learning algorithms, such as soft actor critics, proximal policy optimization, or uh, also some safety inspired RL such as robust adversarial RL. So these are these and, and more are there. And we hope that if you develop something in this direction that you you know test it and also open sources such that we can better benchmark different algorithms. We also had various related discussion and workshop on this topic. Um, and I'll point you to the web page in a second. So yeah, so right now we have three environments. I mentioned this, two tasks and more than 10 different implemented algorithms. And we hope you, you can add your algorithms there as you develop it. We also use this environment to actually do uh, a challenge, a competition at the last robotics conference at IRAS. And so um, there, we hope to actually benchmark algorithms in a different way by having a competition design where multiple, you know, different teams could compete and um, submit different algorithms. And so the objective here was to design a controller for a crazy fly quadrotor to safely slalom through a set of gates and reach a target. The particular challenge that's Dif different to other racing challenges is that there were uncertainties in the robot dynamics, in the mass and the inertia, and the environment, such as wind and the position of the gates. But we provided you know, the, the rough limits of the uncertainties um, to, the, to the competition teams. And the competition teams were encouraged to explore both control and reinforcement learning approaches um, and to see which ones work well. We kind of did a brief summary, just an archive paper on what the teams provided. And the competition was in a way that it was in simulation um, first. And the top three teams in the simulation, we actually um, allowed them or um, used, took their code and ran them on our real robots in our lab in Toronto. And so for that, we could actually kind of transfer the code from the simulation to the, the small crazy fly platforms in our lab. And it, it worked really well. So this is now also a sim to real environment. Um, yeah. Um, and if you are more interested to just quickly get a simulation environment for Quadrotor, um, we have a relatively simple and quite popular um, simulation environment that is called um, Jim Pilot Pi Bullet Drones. So it's an open source environment for reinforcement learning of single but also multi agent quadrotor or control. And so this is a separate stack of code um, that was intended initially for people who want to do reinforcement learning on physics based systems such as um, quadrotors and then possibly transfer it to the real world. And I guess it, it became particularly popular because it's very flexible and it's very, it's easy to use and nicely integrates with existing packages such as for example, also sta stable baselines three. And so, yeah, here's, here you see, I guess the quick installation. Um, we have also done live demos. So you can basically 
do this in a few clicks and you can run your, your multi quadrilateral simulation. And this, this package has also been very popular to kind of benchmark multi-robot um, control and reinforcement learning algorithms. Another thing I briefly wanted to um, point you towards is that beyond um, simulation environments and open source control algorithms, it's also very helpful and a common, you know, common practice in robotics to share data sets. And we have shared um, recently two main data sets. One is for indoor localization of quadrados based on ultra wideband, and the other one is a quite extensive data set um, on self driving data set under multiple seasons, including snow and rain, etc. So I think that's another dimension that is done a lot in robotics um, and, and machine learning and much less so in controls. So I guess just to go back, so we, we did this review paper on um, safe learning for robotics. We then developed a software package because we felt there was a need to actually compare the algorithms that we found in the literature. And there was basically no way to compare them um, other than starting with a, a new simulation environment. And, um, and we did kind of a very specific sim to real setup with a quadrilo. When we did all of this, um, we were wondering more and more, you know, how does it actually, how, impactful is open source code in, in the community in both controls, but also machine learning and robotics. And so the, we, we had a team of students to actually really, you know, um, um, go through all the publications in these fields and see what is actually the impact of releasing code with publications. And I think this was kind of the final step towards this workshop. We really wanted to see, is there actually an impact, a measurable impact? And so the key takeaway very briefly is increasing the num increasing number of publications um, are observed in all three fields, machine learning, robotics, and control that come with open source code. So generally all fields, um, you know, seem to um, publish code more. Um, but there's still a significant difference, which I will show you. And there's general, generally a positive correlation between code popularity and citations. So this is a correlation. We don't know what triggers what, but basically if your paper has lots of citations, it's likely also a popular code or vice versa. So let's look at the numbers in a bit more detail because this is really, this triggered us to kind of bring this workshop to CDC. So this, we looked at the data over a six year span from 2016 to 21. Um, and we looked at conference statistics from three fields. Um, so we used NeurIPS for machine learning. This is you know, one, of the, one of the main conferences there. We used the ICRA for the field of robotics. So the International Conference on Robotics and Automation. And for control, we looked at CDC. And so here you see the number of papers with code. And of course, you know, in, in our paper, we describe how we get these numbers and we automatically extract this. So uh, we tried our best to be accurate, but note this is a logarithmic scale here on the y-axis. And so uh, machine learning, uh, you know, has, um, has really made this a priority. And of course, this is also much more important in that field. So we see a very large number of papers these days to come with code. Um, robotics falls somewhere in between. Um, and, you know, CDC is much lower. Of course, there's many reasons that this is the case, right? And it's much harder to share and make code usable in robotics and in CD CDC. Um, there's still a lot of papers that work on theoretic aspects and uh, for which it doesn't necessarily make sense to sub submit code. If you look, 
if you look at the details, so, oh, wait, what's happening? So, um, yeah, so here are the paper numbers again for the three um, conferences. And you see the total number of publications and in gray. And they, I think, uh, you know, so for example, they are, the total number of accepted papers at NURS is significantly increasing over the years. And then in, in solid blue, you see the percentage of papers that came with code. And um, what is interesting is that there was a big um, movement in the machine learning community to improve reproducibility of results because there was um, a time where papers were basically not reproducible because the code was not available. And it was from the paper alone, it was impossible to reproduce the results. And that was when they started the reproducibility program where at the time of submission, you were encouraged to submit your code. And um, the reviewers were encouraged to download the code and see if they can run the code. And this had, had a big impact. So it was introduced here um, after the conference in 2018. And the, the number of papers with code jumped from 49% to 69%. And since then, it, it has been further increasing. Um, and here you see again, you know, the numbers for robotics and control, which are much lower. I mean, the percentage compared to the total is like around you know, 4%, 3%. And now let's look at why you should all care about um, submitting code. If you look at the citation statistics, um, and this is basically papers that were submitted in 2021, right? So they haven't had much time to accumulate citations. And these papers from 2016 had six years of accumulating um, citations. And you see in gray, the citation numbers for the papers without code, and in, in blue or orange and um, green, the citation numbers for papers with code. And the interesting aspect here is that, um, you know, the, the papers with code have significantly more citations and that difference also grows with the number of years since publication. Um, but we see the same trends also roughly in, in, in robotics and control. So even so many, there are much, much fewer papers with code. Those are also the ones that are generally more highly cited. And you could also look at a different um, plot. And this is harder to read, but it looks at the GitHub stars. So how popular is your code and the semantic scholar citation. And let's just pick one year. If you, for example, pick the year 2016, it's the, the blue line and um, an ellipsoid, which basically represents the distribution. Um, but um, what it means is that um, generally, you know, you, if you have higher GitHub stars, it also means you have higher citations. So there is a correlation between code popularity and number of citations. And so, yeah, this, this data of this paper on open source code is available on the web page, and you can have a look and you can actually modify it. So the data is probably not perfect. So if you find your paper and there's actually code and we didn't find it because we automatically, you know, extracted this from the papers. And if the code is not on GitHub, then we probably didn't find it. Um, so then you can update the data. Um, so overall, yeah, what, what really triggered, it's a bit delayed here. Okay. Um, what really triggered this workshop was that we looked at lots of papers in safe learning and we found that they come from different fields, mostly from the reinforcement learning field and the controls community. And that they have evaluated the algorithms in very different setups, which then encouraged us to developed this benchmark suit where we can compare these algorithms in an easier way. And we also looked at kind of the statistics around uh, open source code and its impact. And so here are a few links 
but maybe relevant. So we have a workshop web page. So if you want to go to the workshop web page, um, this, this is the link. We also have a web page called saferobotlearning.org if you are interested. Um, this is definitely highly relevant for people who work, for example, on safety filters um, in control or barrier certificates. Um, and there we have a mailing list you can subscribe where we also you know, um, announce workshops and, and other events. And just to do a bit of advertisement, we also have for multiple years now, I think six or seven years, we have started organizing these invited sessions on learning-based control here at CDC, which have become increasingly more popular. There are four or five um, at the CDC in the next days. Okay, great. So um, thanks so much. So this was the introduction. Um, I hope I sh could show you that on the one hand, as controls researchers, we should start comparing our um, results and algorithms to reinforcement learning approaches um, and close the gap between these two fields. And second, that publishing your code with papers, um, you know, makes your paper more popular in general. So now we have a session of lightning talks related to this topic. Um, and Lucas will start introducing each one of them. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. So we'll start with the lightning talks now. And the first one up is Professor Majid Samani on unlocking the power of symbolic uh, controller synthesis via Scots. And I guess we'll just go from here. I'll just give you the, you can stick it to your color. Okay, so here can you use the, this here. So, morning, everyone. So, I mean, the moment I saw the workshop, I said, great, I have to come and present the Scots. So, let me tell you what the Scots is doing. Uh, okay, there is a delay. <laughs> so, in a Scots, which is actually a code implemented in C++, you can actually provide the, so it receives a description of a plant. And what it tries to do is it tries to design a controller such that when you apply the controller to the system, the, the feedback composition satisfies some high level property. Here, I'm not talking about the stability, I'm talking about logic property, particularly those expressed in linear temporal logic, which are very expressive and they can be used for many uh, scenarios in robotic applications, self-driving car autonomous systems. So that's the idea. I'm given S, I'm, Scott is trying to design C. So, and how does it do? It tries to actually build a finite representation of your system. So you are given an ODE and it generates an automata that represent and replicate your system. And it, what does it do is it tries to actually design controller in the discrete domain, and then it refines the controller to the actual continuous domain. And all these step comes with formal guarantee, right? Here, I would like to emphasize that every step has a mathematical guarantee, meaning that the controller comes out of a SCAT, you have a formal certificate. So, Okay, it computes the finite representation of your continuous space system and it synthesizes the controller. It also have a small MATLAB interface. I know some of you likes working with MATLAB. So we provide that interface in case you would like to actually simulate the closed loop behavior in MATLAB as well. So it tailors to nonlinear control system. It supports perturbation. It can be measurement noise. It can be model uncertainty. It's open source, easily extendable and modifiable. So, okay, what are the dynamic we can see there? General differential inclusion, right? It can be nonlinear, no assumption over the dynamic. We allow uncertainty as well. So, the uncertainty in the form of hyper rectangle. And what does it do? It actually works with the sample and hold version of the system, right? We provide guarantee only for the sampling time. So, if the sampling time is small enough, you expect that the behavior is acceptable, right? So, 
okay, it generates a finite representation of your system. So here, this is an automata. It's a finite set machine replicating your differential inclusion. It actually, and then what does it do? It tries to design a controller purely in discrete domain. So of course, the key property is you need to establish a relation between your differential inclusion and your finite abstraction. Otherwise, you don't have any formal guarantee, right? And the relation we use is called feedback refinement relation. This is actually a relation presented in a paper who got the Excel VR part two years ago. So we are trying to actually mix the theoretical work as well as implementation, of course, making it open source that people can use it. And okay, what are the property of interests or the atomic proposition? Natively, we can work with polytopes and ellipsoid. For example, you would like to visit these two regions infinitely often, or you want to eventually reach this set, or you want to avoid uh, entering the ellipsoid, right? These are the property of interest. So these are the property which have been natively implemented inside Scott's. I think I'm good. So reachability, those of you are familiar with LTL, diamond means eventually, right? Invariance problem, that's safety, always safe. Of course, you can combine this temporal property, right? For example, if I use diamond box, that means eventually always target. That's exactly a stability we have in control theory, right? So if I actually change these two and say box diamond, so now it becomes infinitely often. So, and how do we implement those in a Scots using fixed point algorithm, right? So in order to satisfy or design a controller for reachability, you call minimal fixed point. And for the safety, you actually call maximal fix, fixed point. And now you can actually work with a nested combination of the minimal and maximal fixed point. And you can actually design a controller with more, more sophisticated uh, property of interest. So this is an example. We apply the Scots on this uh, simple bicycle dynamic. And the property of interest is start from here, go to the target set, avoiding colliding with the obstacle. So I would like to design a controller with a push of a button. I don't want to use any you know, human inside nothing. I just put the dynamic inside the Scott. And I would like to push a button and have the controller. Here, we are not interested in an open loop plan. I am interested in a feedback controller. So it means what I get is actually a feedback controller. And the benefit of feedback controller is robust, right? If you have uncertainty, if the uncertainty push you, but you are still in the domain of the controller, the controller will do the job. And by the way, Scott's generate also a, a binary code for you. So everything, it generates the code as well. You can readily implement it inside your platform. So there are two data structures supporting the Scots. One is binary decision diagram, which helps you with data compression. The other one is using sparse matrices. So here you see in terms of timing, so the construction of the abstraction between these two different data structures, there is improvement if you use uh, sparse matrices, but there is a cost and the cost is the memory that you need to implement the controller is higher, right? So, okay, this is another example. It also allows hybrid dynamic, right? I have a DC-DC converter, and I would, I would like to design a controller that keeps the, I think in this case, the current. No, actually the, yes, that keeps the current within this invariant set. So we design a controller, the gray area is a domain of the controller, meaning that if you start anywhere inside the gray, you always remain inside the gray box. So, yes. Okay, so that was a Scots. It's tailored to general nonlinear system, supports a robust controller synthesis. It's purely open source. You can access using this uh, GitHub and you can actually use it for other extensions. Actually, Scots have been used to develop six other tools. Right, and so for example, since support synthesis of controller, if you have communication channel, it allows non-ideality in communication network, delay, packet dropout. Test, design a controller without discretizing the space, a state set, only discretize the input set. So P phase, this is the one which I'm very proud, utilize all processing elements inside your computer systematically. It detects all of them and it actually distribute the task equally among all of them. So through PFACE, we came up with amities for finite, for continuous space MDP, PERC for reachability. For example, we use PERC to compute reachable set for up to a billion dimension. 
And omega thread finally is the two which suppose synthesis of controller for general linear temporal logic. It generates Rabin automata, it takes the product and solve the game on top of the product. So last but not least, these, you, you don't need to just, if you're a PhD student, you can actually publish tool paper. And in fact, publishing tool paper is more competitive than regular paper in those venue that we have published. And also it gives you visibility. For example, Scott's is my third highest citation. So if you develop a nice tool that people use, as the previous speaker said, you actually get visibility as well. So you also get, you know, publication out of it. So that's something I want to emphasize. So I don't know how many of you are member of PC on hybrid system. So here, the actually I'm the general, I'm the chair of the TC on hybrid system, and we are maintaining the list of all existing open source software tool in the domain of hybrid system. And so far we were able to, okay, this is going backward, even though I'm pushing forward. Okay, let's keep going. One more. Yes, okay. There is over 100 tools being listed in here. All of them related to hybrid systems, formal verification, formal synthesis, reachability analysis. Although control community has not been very active in two, actually hybrid systems community have been very active in two. So, Many of the test of time award in hybrid system community, they are all about reachability, reachable set computation. So, and that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Yes, don't take that. I think so. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have much time for questions, um, but yeah, if you have questions, please uh, just yeah, find each other uh, in the break. Um, all right, yeah, so next up we have uh, Katrin Baumgartner on the Akados uh, software package. Um, you okay. can flip it on. That's right. Okay, okay. Um, okay, works, I'm a bit delayed. Um, yes, uh, welcome to this uh, very short intro to the Akado software package. Um, yeah, Akado is a software, open source software package for fast embedded optimal control. It's uh, developed within the group of Professor Moritz Diehl from the University of Freiburg. Um, the main developer is actually Jonathan Frey, who cannot attend today, unfortunately, but um, I'm happy to uh, yeah, give you this introduction instead. Um, there is, of course, many, many more uh, people who have contributed to Arcados. Some are listed here uh, as authors of uh, this paper. Um, and of course, uh, Arcados is open source and you can find us on GitHub. Please check out <laughs> our GitHub page for um, yeah, the most recent version. Um, so what is Arcados? Arcados is, um, as I said, a framework for optimal control, in particular nonlinear model predictive control. It's all written in C and it provides several building blocks for your uh, nonlinear optimal control design. Um, approach. Um, so first of all, we have integrators. If your system is described by an ODE or DAE, and uh, then we can uh, provide you with explicit and implicit dual encoder schemes and also efficient sensitivity propagation. Then of course, Arcados is a sequential quadratic programming solver for nonlinear optimal control problems. And this is now very important. It's not a general purpose nonlinear programming solver. It's particularly tailored to optimal control problems and their particular structure. Um, yeah, we have lots of um, features and uh, to exploit some of 
structure in your optimal control problem, in particular convex or nonlinear least squares uh, type of problems. And then if we um, support the real time iteration uh, idea. So we separate into preparation and feedback phase, and we also provide efficient condensing routines. And of course, to solve the, uh, as the QP subproblem within the SQP method, we rely on other uh, open source solvers, um, QP solvers, and these are the ones that we are currently um, have interfaces to. And then most importantly, we um, support generation of self-contained C code so that you can readily that this code can be readily employed on your embedded platform. But on the other hand, as I said, Akaro is written, is written in C, but uh, you don't have to be worried too much. We also have um, very nice interfaces to MATLAB and Python. Um, I want to mention some of um, the works that we build on. Uh, one is Kazadi, of course, which uh, does the AD for us. Then HPIPM, which um, provides efficient condensing routines is also a QP solver. Uh, next point. Then uh, Blasphere is very important, um, which provides high performance linear algebra routines, which are really optimized for different embedded architectures. And then, as I mentioned already, various open source QP solvers at the moment, HPIPM, QP Oasis, QP Dunes, OSQP, and DAQP. Um, as we've seen lots of uh, demand and requests uh, for combining MPC and uh, learning-based approaches, I just want to briefly mention that there is already uh, implementations out there and you can use neural networks within um, your optimal control problem formulation um, within ACADOS. And I think one very nice tool uh, will be presented in the next talk. So I will uh, spare you the details. Um, yes, there's also some um, features if you're more interested in reinforcement learning and uh, maybe also imitation learning. And then I want to also highlight some of the more recent, um, more advanced NMPC formulations and implementations. One is um, a very efficient zero order robust uh, formulation, like robust MPC formulation, custom sensitivity propagation, uh, if you want to actually integrate your costs more accurately. And then this is maybe not as clear, but I think it's a very nice uh, feature that um, allows you to actually, uh, in a uh, very user-friendly and easy way, um, to customize um, the SQP methods if you want to implement your own um, new algorithm, I think this makes it now very easy to actually, actually implement new methods inside the ACADOS framework. Okay, and then uh, what we are very happy about is that uh, ACADOS is actually picked up by a lot of groups, a lot of different people with very different applications and um, um, also applied in real world experiments. So here I just picked some of the uh, most recent um, uh, publication where ACARDOS is actually used in um, real world experiments. So there's a robust obstacle avoidance um, task uh, in, in the mobile robotics field. Then of course, quad rotor control, where also we will have, um, I think a talk in the afternoon with um, more details but also fields as low temperature combustion engine and air path control and electric drives have uh, been using ACADOS already with actually quite impressive uh, computation times. I think here it's like kilohertz um, sampling time. And as a last application I picked here, autonomous racing control, but this is just some, some of the most recent um, papers that we found. Okay, and this is more or less already the end of this very short intro, and I want to use the last uh, minutes for call for uh, participation. Um, we are very much open to contributions and collaborations on ACADOS related projects. Uh, this is just some ideas that uh, we came up with where we are very happy to help 
if you, for example, have a very nice QP solver and you would like Arcados to interface it, um, yeah, I just want to stress that you should uh, uh, feel free to reach out if you want to discuss some project ideas. Yes, this is already the last uh, summary slide. Um, please check out our GitHub repository. Um, thanks to the organizers for their interest in our project, in our software. And yeah, if there's time, I'm also happy to answer questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Unfortunately, we're still running behind. Okay, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll have more time in the break um, to have some time for questions. Um... Oh, okay. All right, um, so now we have the next speaker, uh, which is uh, John Arisa Balaga from the Technical University of Munich, and we'll be talking about learning for Kasadi. So you can also clip it on if you want. Let me try. Okay. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Ah, otherwise I'll use the laptop. Okay, be better. So thanks. Uh, my name is John, and I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich. Today, I'll be presenting L4 Casari, so basically learning for Casari. I just want to say the, the previous talk in Akaro sets the bar really high, so I'll try to be up to the level. Before I start, I would like to make a small disclaimer. Um, in this work, I'm the second author. The first author is my colleague, Tim Salzman, and therefore today I'm talking on his behalf. So let's get started. What is L4 Casari? In order to answer this question, we need to take a step back and look into the existing framework of computation methods. And when we do that, we realize there are two kind of communities or two distinguished groups as the first talk has highlighted. On the one hand, we've got the data-driven approaches. And on the other hand, we've got kind of the traditional numerical optimization methods. So if we start with the data-driven approaches, um, these are the classical methods that rely on the first optimization methods, such as pack propagation. And the idea is that if we do the training properly and we provide them with enough data, we can model very complex phenomena. Um, the downside is that they require training, which is usually takes place on, offline, and it might take a long time. However, once we have done the training, the inference is kind of straightforward and can even be accelerated with GPUs or TPUs. Um, if we look into the existing frameworks, the most popular ones would be PyTorch, TensorFlow, or JAX. So that's one group. And now if we shift to the other group, to the numerical optimization side, uh, these rely on second order optimization methods because they use the Jacobians and also the sessions. And the benefits are twofold. First of all, we usually use first principles-based models for this. Um, and this gives transparency to the problems we are dealing with. And also we can provide guarantees because we can impose constraints in the optimization problems. The problem or the downside is that every single formulation is problem specific. So we have to tailor it to each case study. And therefore, if we wanna do it efficiently, it requires some expertise or some sort of engineering. And in this case, if we look into the software platforms that allow us to jump between different solvers, so QP solvers, NLP solvers, conic solvers, and so on and so forth, we would highlight Kasari, Ample, and maybe in the commercial side, Gurobi. A few might be missing, but that's kind of the existing scenario. So if we would have to pick like from each group, the most popular one, probably we would go for PyTorch in the data-driven side and Kasari in the numerical optimization. And this kind of takes us to the answer of the question, what is Kasari? The spirit behind Elf Kasari was to build a tool that would allow us to merge the benefits of both groups. And therefore, we use the handshake emoji. And here, we are not just using the handshake emoji just for the sake of using the, the emoji. It's because the emoji represents what L4 Casari is doing. L4 Casari allows you to take PyTorch models, so data-driven PyTorch models, 
and put them in Kasari as a standard symbolic expression. So I've given a bit of motivation behind that for Kasari. Uh, now I'll do a super simple tutorial trying to explain how to use it. You'll see it's really simple. So the idea is that it's intended to be used in Python, but you could also use it in other languages, as you'll see now. Um, kind of if you've got a PyTorch model trained and you want to convert it to Kasari, with Airflow Kasari, you just need to call one command. So you see it's straightforward. And once you do that, you get a Kasari function. And therefore, that Kasari function can be used as usual with MX variables, and you can use it to solve optimization problems, to do interpolation, take Jacobian, Hessians, all the cool stuff that Kasari allows us to do. And on the other side, we could also generate a shared library and use it to go into other languages such as C, C++, or MATLAB. And that way we would have like a Kasari function representing the PyTorch model in the other languages. So I hope I kind of made clear that the usage of Kasari is very straight, of Elfo Kasari is very straightforward. And now I want to show a couple of examples kind of depicting how powerful this platform is. So the first example is a nav like regards navigation in turbulent flows. And more specifically, the question we are trying to answer is that one, which we cannot see. Um, anyway, I'll read it for you. It says, which is the minimum energy path for a fish when swimming upstream a turbulent flow? So finding the minimum energy path, it's an optimization problem. And the turbulent flow, it's a chaotic system whose equations of motion we don't know, and therefore we use PyTorch to model it. Just to put this into context here, we see a GIF representing the river. So in the river, we put a stone, which is the gray circle, and that stone generates some turbulence. And the turbulence is depicted by the velocity field. And the pink dot is the fish and how the fish would evolve if it would be unactuated. And somehow you see it gets dragged by the current, right? It goes downstream. So what we do is we solve a minimum energy path. So we want to get from the green point to the red point with the minimum energy, right? And we do it in the standard multiple shooting approach. So we formulate this in Kasari, but the dynamics are given, let's say, in PyTorch. So I just want to make clear that this would also work with Akados, which was just presented before. So once we solve this, the solution we get is pretty intuitive, and it's the, the fact that the fish serves the current, as you see, kind of leverages the river in order to get to the goal and avoid the stone. Another way to understand this is that kind of it leverages the vorticities. So if it wants to go up, it uses positive vorticity, and if it goes, wants to go down, it uses negative vorticity. So here you see that we are able to solve a Kasari optimization problem with PyTorch thanks to for Kasari. And the last example, I don't know how, I'm, how I, I am doing on time. The last example is regarding motion planning with a nerve. So we've got a nerve, so neural radiance field based environment representation, and we want to find a smooth polynomial. So the nerve is given in PyTorch, and the optimization of finding the smoothest polynomial is give, it's done in Kasari. So basically, the mathematical specifics are that we use a polynomial of degree nine and we optimize for the coefficients. Then we've got an ERP, which is pre-trained. A famous one is available online. And basically, we solve a minimum snap problem with a constraint requiring for the curve to be obstacle-free, which implies using the NERF, the PyTorch-based NERF. And basically, we do this for four different case studies. And in all four cases, we get very smooth polynomials. So this is a second example. I hope I kind of showcased how L4 Kasari can be used in a very interesting way and the power of it. And of course, it's online. So please give it a shot. Uh, check it out. Try it and let us know your opinion. So thank you very much. Oh, you might All right, awesome. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, so now we have our last speaker for this session, uh, who, which is Amin Nukanovic uh, from the University of Freiburg, and we'll be talking about a software package on numerical optimal control. Yes. You guys can clicker. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I will talk about um, another software from the Freiburg group. And we uh, are concerned with a particularly difficult class of uh, optimal control problems. And um, so we consider non-smooth dynamical systems and they arise as soon as you have a combination of, of um, discrete and continuous dynamic behavior. And this happens, for instance, in robotic systems when you walk and make and break contact, when you manipulate objects, in electronics like in diodes where depending on the current you have or do not have uh, voltage or vice versa, or when you combine some first principles with uh, if-else conditions like in hybrid automatons. And all this gives rise to non-smoothness in your differential equations and the usual numerics falls apart. So you need to take a special care. And um, to solve this, once we have this model, we want uh, to formulate an optimal control problem and obviously solve it. And to do this numerically, we developed NOSNOC, which basically you know, our goal was to do honest and reproducible research. And we have both uh, MATLAB and Python version, depending what you prefer. And I first want to give you a bit of an overview of the algorithmic building blocks and class of systems you can treat. One way to classify this different non-smooth systems, they're not all same difficulty, and we usually classify them by degree of smoothness. And the, on the right-hand side, we usually distinguish, for instance, the first and simplest class if you have a continuous right-hand side, but non-differentiable, it's already sufficient to break apart standard methods. Or if you have a switch in your dynamics, like in uh, what we call NFT2, where you have a jump discontinuity in the vector field. And um, what you can do in NOSNOC is formulate such problems and for simulation, control, or estimation. And uh, when you do a lot of massaging of the problem, you get something that's uh, called a mathematical problem with complementarity constraints, which uh, kind of encodes this combinatorial nature, and uh, you need dedicated methods to solve it. So we implement all this. And for the discretization, uh, you cannot really use a standard time-stepping runge kutta method, usual multiple shooting like you use for smooth systems. So we developed a new method which is called finite ML with switch detection, and I'll show you in a second why we need it. And another part is uh, what we have is, um, sorry, is um, systems with state jumps like in the robotics. Um, we can transform this with uh, exact reformulation, which we call time freezing to get equivalent NSD2 system um, and to reuse the machinery uh, that we developed for, let's say, the simpler systems. Although you can also treat those guys directly here. So this is just an uh, overview of what kind of systems uh, you can treat very abstractly. Um, and I want to motivate why really not use just ACADOS multiple shooting and what you have. Um, there's some fundamental limitations if you use time stepping. So that's, uh, let's say, a roboticist would just use a semi-implicit Euler. Uh, but however, and it's fine if you do simulation, but an optimal controller, a little known fact is that the derivatives with respect to parameters, controls, and so on, do not converge. And I have here a toy example. You will see it will, because of the absence of convergence, you will uh, create a lot of artificial solutions and your solver gets stuck without you knowing it. And that with a dedicated method, you can overcome this difficulty. Another, let's say, more known fact is that uh, standard discretization methods have only a first order accuracy, which means if you want moderate accuracy, you need huge problems. And with switch detection, I have here a benchmark plot where we applied a bunch of different methods. Red is switch detection, blue is without it. And uh, we computed the controls, evaluated, and looked how much we missed a certain goal. And what you can see is if you do the tailored methods, you can improvements of orders of magnitude and accuracy for the same computational time. So this just to highlight the necessity. And I just want to uh, highlight some of the key features we have. So, I mean, this system's problems are extremely complicated. So you need a lot of massaging the equations before you discretize them and can apply the method. So this is all fully automated um, in, in an OSNOC and then all the when, once you have the discrete time optimal control problem, you get a very difficult one. And to solve this, you need tailored uh, methods, which we all implemented uh, as well. And we rely on several uh, NLP solvers, like IPOPT mostly actually, but we also support SNOPT and WARP and some others, uh, which I haven't mentioned. And of course, uh, we use Casadi, probably well known in the control community, mentioned a few times today. So uh, you don't need to learn much new syntax if you want to apply it. And I want to finish off with a few highlights. So it's a relatively new package, but we were already using it. For instance, we created recently a benchmark set of 600 uh, optimal control problems from this field, mostly to uh, address the applied mathematics community for solving the underlying optimization problems. They are extremely hard. And if you look at the existing benchmark, you would assume the field is done because they all saturate at 100%. 
but when you start start solving, I don't know, robotics tasks, the the uh, the world is not anymore so rosy. So that's we wanted to uh, a bit uh, test what's possible. And I invite you to check our example library where we have from many different field examples. So to I think it's the easy way to start. And we had earlier this year in, in Freiburger Summer School with many participants where we used already uh, where we were teaching this family of methods and we used already the software and the exercises and to get to know. And I invite you to check all the course material, which is freely available. And this week, you can meet us using Nosnoc on two occasions, of which I'm aware of, uh, once on Thursday and once on Friday, but it's my colleague Wim who's here. And you can check out what we do in more detail and get some technical details. And uh, and I'm very happy if you contribute with your applications and um, and uh, any source code, and I invite you to join us and to ask any questions. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, so actually we do have time for one question now, if anybody uh, wants to ask a question. Yes. Oh, shall I? Just have you applied this to legacy problems or to manipulation of Yes, we have applied it to, let's say, simpler problems. And currently we are preparing more like quadrupeds and bipeds. Uh, it's quite a lot of overhead and we actually plan with the guys from Toulouse the robotics lab to do it a bit more let's say on a higher level but yeah once we have the people to do it but it's work in progress short answer um, so currently it's mostly uh, monopeds I think jumping around jumping over obstacles and holes and or some simple manipulators which should manipulate some objects so just one object manip uh, actuated and around other objects and they should shift them around or, or around obstacles and yeah, the goal is to just not specify anything but the dynamics and the optimization discovers all the behavior. Thank you for the question. Okay, so yeah, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Um, and I think with that, we've reached uh, the yeah the first coffee break. Um, so we'll see you back here at 10.30. Um, and then we do the second uh, session of Lightning Talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Hyun Drew. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm co-advised by Professor Peter Stone and Professor Yuko Drew, where we focus on the robot learning research in the context of manipulation. So first of all, a little bit of my research. So I've been focused on how to efficiently learn contact manipulation tasks, such as how to make a Franco amico panda arm to make coffee, as, I, as you can see in this video, or how to make robots to learn to use tools to do all these kind of uh, non-comprehensible manipulation. So I've been focused on this long horizon vision based manipulation and also enabling contact with non prehensile behaviors in using the learning methods. So behind the scenes, what's actually happening is that the behaviors are generated by neural network policies, typically a transformer nowadays, and then it's learned from 50 teleoperate demonstrations, which is a small amount of data considering it's a vision based input. But that's only one part of the story, but there's another part of the story that's you know, quite tedious. So first of all, like from the perspective of MDP policy, where we typically formulate the robot policies, uh, it's basically a mark of decision process, right? So it's like the state SD is input to a policy, either it's a neural network or handcrafted programs and generate actions to the robot to get to the next state SD plus one. So the thing is that the decision making in this formulation operates at 20 Hertz. But there's another part of the story, which is that the robot system is operating at 1000 Hertz. So as you can see that there's a huge gap that between this MDP policy formulation and the robot, how the robot system operates. So learning how to bridge this gap is very hard when I was first started this, uh, this uh, infrastructure building. And even though I have backgrounds in automations, I've never been taught about how to program to actually make this kind of high frequency robot system to work. And this is, and the resources to enabling this kind of system to function is really, really hard to find. 
Of course, there are some like open source uh, code code base like uh, uh, ROS that typically uh, provide a lot of code base, but its ecosystem is just too bulky for any beginners to digest and to make efficient of uh, system building. And consequently, this bulky systems uh, induces a steep learning curve where you really need to spend a lot of time to learn how to use it while it really impedes some of the idea generation and idea delivery because a lot of research ideas have nothing to do with these engineering efforts. And moreover, there's no good documentation. So there's, even if you can constantly any details in when you're programming like system like ROS, you really need to go to the documentation which are often outdated and there are a lot of different versions that, that, that probably doesn't matter, doesn't apply to your version now. So basically, how to bridge this gap is the key question of what Deoxys provides. So Deoxys is a modular robot controller library implemented by me and from our lab that provides this bridge between the policy inference 20 hertz and the actual robot system 1000 hertz. So basically, Deoxys is designed to be easy to use, has high performance, and also provides comprehensive documentation. So in order to apply, apply this kind of uh, easy to use the framework and also make the system really have high performance, we divide this system into two parts. One is Python user interface, and one is a C++ implementation, which is also lightweight while abstract away the complexity of this kind of high frequency controller implementation. So in the Python side, this is all you need to do, like control inference dot control, and just that, that simple. And you can easily switch the controller type by just passing on the argument. And on the C++ side, this, this is the 1000 real-time control loop. And also, this, as I said, it's a lightweight implementation so that you can re really easy to learn how our, each controller is implemented in a single C++ file. Moreover, what we realized that we really need this kind of comprehensive documentations to support people to learn to use this package and also like, get the idea of how this how every robot system works. So first of all, uh, uh, we provide a comprehensive documentation that contains detailed knowledge of robot control. For example, here's an example of, uh, of the formulation of operational space controller. And also we provide interactive visualizations for people to understand what's the effect of each trajectory interpolations, where here we showed the, the different smoothness of trajectory interpolations and also the, its second, uh, second derivative. Also, we provide video visualization of sample code run. So typically what we encounter in the documentation is that they just provide two lines of this run Python one, run Python file two, and that's it. And you don't know what's, the, what's going on. And then if you're getting to the bug, then you will never find it out. So we provide a video in this documentation website so that it shows that how we can, uh, uh, how this code actually runs. And this is very nice because then like, I don't, you don't you really need to raise a GitHub issues when you have a deep bug and then check, double check with me whether if it's working properly or not. So Deoxys provides many controller options, which I will not go through into details. So it contains joint space control and operational space control, uh, like that has many versions of OSC and also velocity-based Cartesian uh, control. So with this, the with our Deoxys, you can easily switch between different controllers and easily to change the controller configuration on the side, just pass to, just for example, changing control gains on the fly. And then, as I mentioned again, easy to learn implementation details in a single C++ file. So Deoxys has empowered many research, such as focusing on object-centric vision-based manipulations, uh, vision-based robot grasping, deformable object manipulation, human in the loop manipulation, multitask learning implementation. And our framework has been disseminated to other institutes outside our lab. For example, in Stanford, people have used it in a large central model based to control uh, human pose uh, specified robot control and also human brain signal robot control. And all these projects are using the axis underneath. So scan here, scan this scan QR code for using the axis. And please contact me if you're interested in this code base. And just to summarize again, uh, lessons from 
implementing the Oxys, first of all, providing flat turning curve and good accessibility of code base will be very useful for the community to grow. And by and because if every lab's sharing similar infrastructures and having the same implementation logic underneath, then it is the prerequisite, a good prerequisite to, to lead to the reproducible research. And finally, provide comprehensive intuitive documentations will really help people to begin with. Even so with these documentations, even people without any control background can grasp the idea of robot control in a very easy and fast way. And thank you so much. A fast, portable, deep reinforcement learning library for continuous control. So first a bit into the motivation. So as we all have seen, deep reinforcement learning has achieved impressive performance in different domains, in perfect information games, in video games, and also in simulated robots. But uh, some challenges remain. So first of all, uh, reinforcement learning is plagued by prohibitively long training times. So these training runs often take hours, if not even days. Uh, also, most value um, in solving problems actually still in the real world, and these solutions often focus on uh, simulation only. So yeah, we have to bridge the simulation to reality transfer, and also we need to keep in mind the deployment of trained policies. Uh, so our approach to tackle these three challenges of large training times, the simulation to reality transfer, and the deployment uh, is to tackle the long training times first and keep uh, keeping in mind the deployment. So we were looking at some software choices. So the obvious one is PyTorch, which is very common in deep reinforcement learning frameworks. But we saw that it's very slow, often because of the CPU, GPU transfer, but also in general because of the overhead. So if we analyze the reinforcement learning for continuous control literature, we see that the focus for the policies is mostly on small, fully connected neural networks. And this has been very stable over the recent years. And this is not something that PyTorch is very good at. So then we also looked into JAX, and here we can compile everything on the GPU and gets reasonably fast, uh, but we also ran into workarounds quickly because of the immutability and so on. So our co conclusion was in the end that we write everything in pure C++. Um, and yeah, this also gives us the benefit that we can run everything on CPU, GPU, CUDA kernels, and also microcontrollers, which brings us back to the deployment. So with this, we introduced RL tools, a dependency-free, header-only, pure C++ library for deep supervised and reinforcement learning. And the main components are the deep learning components for the function approximation, and then simulation, uh, so simulators and interfaces, so for Pendulum, Mojoko, Multivotor, CAR, actually Acrobot as well. And then we have the reinforcement learning uh, algorithms, um, PPO, TD3, and SAC. And now I will go into some design choices. So since we are using C++, we can take advantage of the template metaprogramming capabilities of recent C++ standards. And so one result of this is that the size of all loops and data, data structures is known at compile time. So the compiler can heavily optimize them. And we don't have dynamic, dynamic memory allocations during training and inference. Uh, we also use a static multiple dispatch paradigm. It's kind of a functional paradigm and it's by, inspired by the Zulia's dynamic multiple dispatch. And this keeps modularity while not impacting the runtime performance. Uh, so it's kind of zero cost abstractions. But we still want to ensure a hackability. So we follow the idea of writing libraries instead of frameworks. As I showed with the simulators, we have batteries included but swappable. So all the functions can be overwritten by a multiple dispatch. And we want to have shallow abstractions and no hidden state and also no global state. Uh, so then I come to a benchmark. Uh, we chose the uh, pendulum swing up because it's a widely popular um, environment and we choose the TD3 algorithm because you can solve it in 10,000 steps and there we found that uh, RL tools is about uh, five times faster than the, the next fastest library which is the Julia reinforcement learning and all other um, libraries especially the most popular ones uh, are 7 to 15 times um, slower and since RL tools is a header only C pure C++ library. We can easily deploy it on a wide variety of devices. So for example, different laptops uh, or also um, smartphones and the GPU, then we can run it on smartwatches as well. Also the web browser. Um, if you go to rl.tools, the website, uh, you can run it in your own browser. And importantly, we can also train it on a microcontroller. So uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first ever training of a deep reinforcement learning algorithm directly on a microcontroller. So then we also looked a bit into the uh, deployment. So we want to have very fast inference on a wide range of microcontrollers. And we benchmark a two layer fully connected uh, neural network with 64 neurons each, because we, as I show later, we, we know that this is able to do end to end control of a quad order. So it's a highly relevant size of a neural network. And we find that uh, because our tools is pure C++, we can very easily run it on each of these platforms with a generic inference algorithm. And because of the um, static multiple dispatch, we can also easily dispatch to manufacturers DSP libraries. And then we also looked a bit into these DSP libraries and we managed by fusing networks to even implement optimized routines which push the uh, the control frequencies or the inference frequencies to 3.4 kilohertz, for example, on this crazy fly, which is a 27 gram micro um, quad order, which we will see later. And then we also did some sanity check with other published inference frequencies which match our findings. 
So yeah, we, we released a paper uh, about our tools um, with more details about the benchmarks and so on in Archive. Uh, we have a project page, which I highly encourage you to visit at rl.tools, and you can run the, the training of the pendulum swing up in your browser. It's a bit slower than uh, on uh, natively, but still should be able to train it in one minute. Uh, the code is on GitHub, and we have continuous integrations with test cases, and we also have a documentation with an interactive uh, C++ notebook. And now I want to go a bit into the goal of our libraries. So other libraries often focus on the research in the space of algorithms, and they also want to uh, have a large variety of algorithms and focus also on ease of use by, by using Python, basically. And we focus more on the research and development in the space of problems. So we want to have a fixed set of algorithms that can be applied to different problems. And so we want to, face, uh, to focus on training speed uh, and the inference and deployment on microcontrollers, so hard real time. And so you could say that our tools is supposed to be a bit of the Arcados for reinforcement learning. So if you're not familiar, Arcados is a library to create MPCs. And so they also focus on research and development in the space of problems. So there's a fixed set of optimization algorithms and people apply it to different problems. Um, yeah, and they also do deploy by C code generation. And so now I will come to one application of RL tools where we use RL tools to learn to fly in seconds. So we train in simulation and then we can uh, fly after just training for 18 seconds on a consumer grade laptop. Uh, here the training and inference setup is an asymmetric extra critic structure uh, because we can't observe the ground truth RPMs because of the motor delays. Um, but we feed an action history into the actor and the actor directly outputs RPM set points. And so it's end time control, train it in simulation and we directly deploy the policy onto the microcontroller of the quadrotor. And because the training is so fast, we can show the full uncut training process um, on this consumer grade laptop. So here I'm starting the training. We have a very simple UI where you can start the training and then you can observe it. And in the beginning, you can see that these quadrotors are crashing all the time. But just after about 18 seconds on this 2020 MacBook Pro, the quadrotors or the policy learns to fly. And when the training is finished, we can take the checkpoint, which is exported by RL tools as a .h file, so a C++ file. We can copy it into the firmware and directly compile it into the firmware and then flash the firmware, the compiled firmware, onto the quad rotor using this wireless adapter. And interestingly, the flashing takes quite a bit longer than the, the training itself. So this is uh, fast forwarded. And then we can give it the signal to take off. And then this is the train policy flying the crazy fly after just 18 seconds of training. And here we are just using uh, onboard sensing uh, by just using optical flow. Uh, so this code, we uh, submit the paper to uh, RAL, but it's already on Archive as well. Uh, the code is on GitHub. And since we are talking about reproducibility here, uh, you can run the same procedure that we've seen before, just with a single command if you have Docker installed. So I highly encourage you to try it out. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jan Dragonja. I'm a data scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and lead developer of Neuromancer, which is a differential programming library for modeling control and optimization that we have been developing together with my wonderful colleagues at PNNL. Our primary motivation is coming from our heterogeneous application space from a Department of Energy projects that require simulation and decision-making capabilities for energy systems in buildings, power systems in robotics or basic energy sciences. And there are a lot of prevalent challenges when it comes to physically consistent data-driven modeling that can support fast simulation of complex system amenable for optimal control and optimal design. We are employing recent advancements in scientific machine learning to tackle these challenges. When we look at the landscape of solution methods for numerical computing, there are two main domains. Domain-based methods like constraint optimization or differential equations, and machine learning methods like supervised or reinforcement learning. Because of this historical division of the communities, also the software tools have been divided into two categories. For people from controls, we are very familiar with optimization-based languages like Jump, Pyomo, or more control-oriented dynamical optimization like Asadi or Gecko optimization toolkit that provide you with interface for iteration-based uh, numerical solvers like Kurobi or Cplex. On the other hand, machine learning tools like Partridge and TensorFlow, they revolutionized scientific um, disciplines by democratizing the access to automatic differentiation for deep learning models. And what we see is coming next is so-called differential programming, which is a unifying approach for data-driven modeling and optimization of complex systems that is supported by automatic differentiation for subsequent gradient-based optimization. When we started to do research in this area five years ago, there was no 
open source machine learning library. So we start to develop our own and we call it Neuromancer that is uh, written on the top of PyTorch. And it is really a high level of abstraction for standard machine learning capabilities that provide the user um, interface that is similar to tools like CVXPy or Jump. So we are providing these symbolic abstractions that allow you to write constraint optimization and optimal control problems in very familiar language um, in a few lines of code. So here is some mock-up nonlinear constraint optimization problem um, in a setting where we are learning to optimize this problem by finding a parametric map of the problem parameters into the decision variables. And this problem can be written in few lines of code in our library by leveraging variable classes is very common abstractions in algebraic modeling languages. Write your constraints in few lines of code in these algebraic expressions and combine them systematically with a range of machine learning architectures um, in differentiable constraint optimization problem that you can optimize with standard stochastic gradient solver from a deep learning ecosystem. What our library provides you is the parser of this high level abstraction into domain specific computational graph that can represent the problem of your interest. And in terms of capabilities, we are supporting parametric constraint optimization or so called learning to optimize or end to end um, deep learning with constraints, where you can do it either via imitation learning or via self supervised learning where you are computing the gradients of the constraint optimization problem itself by leveraging physics information learning principles this allows you to learn accurate neural network representations of the problem solutions and replace optimization solvers with these fast learning based surrogates for satisfying hard constraints requirements we also support a range of feasibility restoration layers like proximal operators and um, other projection based type methods. When it comes to dynamical system modeling, we provide different levels of abstractions that you can employ, build your state space models, differential equations, neural differential equations, or in between gray box physics based modeling and physics informed neural networks to construct accurate surrogates for dynamical systems that can exploit prior knowledge about the system dynamics and structure like in the graph neural networks. And now when you have capabilities for modeling of dynamical system from data with some prior physics information together with constraint satisfaction, when you put these two capabilities together, you have all necessary building blocks for doing differentiable control. So the idea is very straightforward. You are combining some kind of surrogate model that can be obtained by classical system identification methods like state space models or more modern neural differential equations or fully white box ODE type models in end-to-end -end way through closed loop system optimization where the control policy can be parameterized by suitable function approximator that is differentiable such as neural network or polynomial functions. And how you train these models is through sampling the parametric space, very similar like you would do in physics informed neural networks through sampling collocation points. This allows you to evaluate the expectations of the optimal control loss functions and take the gradients that are necessary to train the control policy in model-based self-supervised way. This approach is very powerful for learning control policies in a sample efficient manner, for stabilizing nonlinear systems, for doing trajectory optimization, obstacle avoidance, and uh, providing some control theoretic guarantees for close loop stability or constant satisfactions with uh, conjunction with safety filters. So these are all the capabilities that we currently provide and will be continuing expanding in our Neuromancer open source software library that is freely available on our GitHub. And uh, if you are interested, please have a look on our extensive uh, Jupyter Notebook examples, we welcome external contributions or user feedback. Finally, I would like to thank to all my collaborators for the contributions and to the funding from the US Department of Energy. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested, uh, please shoot me an email.
I'm going to talk about the Robotarium, uh, which is a remotely accessible lab that we built at first at Jordan Tech, but now uh, a version also at, at UC Irvine. Uh, and it was an attempt to do something new in the, in the robotics space. And uh, I got so excited about the iterations. So the name of the talk is Reproducibility and Robotics in the Robotarium. It should be more art. Reproducibility and Robotics in the, the really, really radical Robotarium. That's the, that's the title of this talk. But I want to provide a little bit of a context for why I care about this. Uh, I'm a multi-agent roboticist. I've spent a lot of time working on how do you get teams of robots to do interesting things together. Uh, I've personally been very excited about drawing inspiration from nature. What's fun about this field is that it's populated with biologists, it's populated by mathematicians, it's populated by controls people, it's populated by roboticists, it's populated by computer scientists. Multi-agent robotics really is a field that is being attacked from a number of different directions. And here is a video from my lab that shows some of the stuff that multi-agent robotics concerns itself with. Uh, this is actually a lab, an experiment that's over 15 years old now. Um, the point is, in this case, a bunch of robots trying to form a geometric shape. Uh, they only have access to, to limited information. This type of video have been from a, any number of labs, uh, but I'm showing it for a particular reason, and that is, when you see a video like this, you should always ask, what is it that's not being shown? What's going on in the background? So I'm, I'm going to tell you some of the things that are going on in the background. There's an army of graduate students and postdocs standing around, making sure that everything works. Of course, there's a camera. Uh, in this particular case, we have a Viacom motion capturing system, like a lot of us have. Easily up to a quarter million dollars, but just for a bunch of cameras. Uh, there's a lot of computes going on. So the point is, in the background, when you see a video like this, here's the thing that's not shown. Money. It takes an awful lot of resources to maintain and run a world-class multi agent it's just complicated. Uh, it's getting slightly less complicated, but, but over time, it's almost become a, a resource competition rather than a competition for who has the best ideas. Who can deploy the most drones, right? That is partially a question of, you know, are you smart enough to have lots of drones? But it costs money. It costs money and time, and I fundamentally don't like this. I think research should be about who has the best ideas, not who has the most money. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to solve that. Uh, so there's very tender. It is resource intense. There were some other things that were bothering me about my lab uh, and labs in general. Most of the time, labs don't do anything. If you look at your own robotics labs, right, if you have them, the vast majority of the time, nothing is happening. It's rare that robots are actually running around. Night, they're certainly not running around. They're underutilized. That, that bothered me. The other thing that bothered me is I spent all this time rewriting device drivers that someone else has already written, and they haven't now got to implement A star again. And I mean, there's all, even though we have ROS, right, there's a lot of reproduction of, of effort. We, we just have to do the same thing over and over again. And by the way, while we're at it, it's almost impossible to compare. It's this algorithm for doing information control better than this other algorithm for doing information control. It's hard to compare. So we do any effort, we underutilize labs. It's hard to compare. It's hard to collaborate. If I have a really great algorithm for cyclic pursuit, how do we take that into someone else's lab and make their work better or make my algorithm better? I, I really didn't like any of these things. So that was kind of the, the genesis behind the role of and the idea was, well, let's build a robotics lab where people could upload code remotely and run experiments from wherever they were on the hardware at Jordan Tech. That was the vision. Uh, I first, I really wanted it to be, you're looking in at the robots, so I called it the robot aquarium. So there would be an aquarium for robots. And then someone said, there's no water, so then it was going to become a terrarium for robots, so the robot aquarium. Uh, 
I went to the National Science Foundation in the US, and this is literally the photo from the proposal, or the, the photoshopped picture in the proposal. Uh, I googled chamber orchestra concert hall because I kind of wanted it to look cool. We plopped in some Harvard kilo balls uh, mm -hmm. in the middle, some random screen, and then a GT logo, and then we said, this is what we want to build. Give, please give us money. And the National Science Foundation said, fine, here's money. And I said, thank you, and this is what we built. <laughs> Not quite. There, there's a little bit of a before and after. This was actually an early version, but we did start building it. Uh, and the first thing that happens when you build a remotely accessible lab is no one uses it. There are so many of these remotely accessible things that don't get used. So I spent a lot of time harassing my friends. So Jorge Cortes at UC San Diego was my first user. And I basically begged him to just, just send us something. So he just sent code. Oh, this was not uploaded in an automatic sense. But this was January 2016. This was the first experiment by a different user uh, on this rudimentary robotarium. And yeah, it kind of worked. Uh, I kept asking people to submit. So we had the three next users were also friends of mine. So Mark Swan from UC Dallas, Seth Hutchinson from Illinois, Masiko Fujita from Tokyo Tech. They were the early users, just to kind of show that we could do something. But this is still too small and too ugly. So we built a nicer robotarium. So in August 2017, we went live with something that looked much nicer. I wanted it to have, to feel a little bit almost like an Apple store meets a robotics lab. So it, had, it needed to be clean, it needed to be usable. Uh, I also really believe strongly in that there's no way of getting users if we don't get word out. So I did a lot of media. Uh, one of my most proudest media hits was the front page of the Wall Street Journal says, this robot lab has no idea what its robots are doing, which is true. We have, we have built a system where people could upload code and do whatever they wanted on the robots. And let me tell you what the first thing people did when they started uploading code. They started breaking stuff. <laughs> That's the first thing that happens, right? So here are some early versions where, you know, stuff started driving into each other. We now have aerial robots, but in the beginning we thought we were just going to go live with quads. So this is an experiment that went horribly wrong. Uh, because and in the air, life is messy, right? If you fall down, it's, it's, it's bad. So the first really order of business was, how do we avoid collisions? So how do we do it in a way that actually makes sense? And I have spent a career worrying about collisions. I had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge from 2007. This is before there were such a thing as self-driving cars. This is, I think, even to this day, the most famous robot-to-robot -robot collision. It is MIT self-driving car and Cornell self-driving car colliding with each other with no one in it. Uh, but I had, a, I had a beautiful, it was a Porsche Cayenne, and then we turned it into a self-driving car, and it, we did really well until we drove straight into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so collisions are bad. I mean, that was, that was the point for this thing. What I find interesting about collisions, though, is fast forward to today, and every major auto manufacturer is an example driving car. And there's an entire industrial ecosystem that tends to the different layers of the economy. So no one is shocked now by so much self driving cars, at least. But collisions are still problematic. Self driving cars still collide. And at the end of the day, taking a little detour into the world of collisions here. What's hard is the world is really, really messy. And this is known as the 100 million mile problem in self driving cars. So roughly in the US, fatal accident happens in the US roughly every 100,000 miles when cars are piloted by human beings. That translates to roughly 30,000 deaths in traffic in the US every year. Let's say that magically tomorrow, we woke up and we had self driving cars that as good as human beings. That means robots only kill 30,000 people in traffic. No one would accept that. The headlines would be, robots kill 30,000 people. What if we were twice as good? Right? What if self-driving cars were twice as good as human drivers? That means that only 15,000 people are killed by robots in traffic. There's no way we would accept that. 
So the bar is actually even higher than that for our self-driving car brothers, uh, for sisters. They have to be way better than human drivers for us to be okay with it. How many people can be killed by robots for us to be okay with it as a society? 5,000 people? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, 5,000 is strictly less than 30,000. The point, though, is collisions are messy and hard to deal with because we need a higher level from our autonomous vehicles. And lots of weird stuff happens during a 100 million mile journey, right? It's, it's impossible to train on everything that you're going to encounter, right? You think you've figured out everything, and then all of a sudden, there's a gallop. So the point is, it's a hard problem. Uh, but we've also spent a lot of time as a community looking at it. So Google Scholar, there's a little over a million uh, papers written about collision avoidance, obstacle avoidance. Close to 700,000 papers on uh, collision avoidance. What we did in the Robotarian, though, is we changed style because our problem, our collision problem, was different. First of all, we really needed robots to be very, very close together. The density is high. These robots are packed together. So anything that uses a 100 distance square repulsive force is not going to work because the robots are not going to be allowed to be close together. The other thing that's going on is the robots can help each other. Almost all collision avoidance that's out there is based on the fact that you're going to do whatever you do and I'm going to be safe no matter what. But you can actually collaborate and get much closer. Right? So there's a collaborative aspect. And the third thing that's weird is when someone uploads code, we don't know what the code is supposed to tell the robots to do. If I know that I'm going from here to there and there's something in the way, I can plan my way around it. But if I don't know that I'm going over there, I have to be much more reactive. So we ended up embracing barrier functions as a way of doing this. So basically, we minimize the distance between the actual user input, no, sorry, the user input. So the user writes code that tells the robots to do something. We minimize the distance between what the robots actually do and what they're told to do, uh, subject to a, uh, a safety constraint. That's basically it. I'm not going to talk about this in any great detail. I, some of you may have seen various functions, some of you have not. The point is, this allows us to do some things. And, this basically takes us to a view of the world where you have a system in general, and if you're a controls person, which some of us are because we're at CDC, the first thing we do when we're given a system is we stabilize it. We're obsessive about stabilizing things in this community. And one of the reasons, of course, is why do we like stable things? Well, that means that if we now have a stable system, we can start dragging it around. We can have an input that actually allows us to be bonded in, bonded out, or some variation thereof, right? So the point is, Stable systems are easier to control at an outer layer. What we did in the Robotarium is really this idea of just replacing stability with a runtime assurance. So we're running a, an, an assurance inside it. We get an assured system that we can now have the users do whatever they want with. And uh, this is what this looks like in the Robotarium. So here's an experiment where we have 20 robots and 25. And they're going to the outskirts of a circle. Periphery of a circle. They're supposed to go through exactly the same point in the middle and swap positions. So this is a 25 robot car crash. And that's what the algorithm is telling them to do. The safety controller kicks in when they're very tightly packed. And then with the constraints, safety constraints, they negotiate collisions in this way. So this is how we actually now, by default, run things in the robot journey. So the first thing that happens is we wrap a, an assurance around it. Uh, I can have opinions about that, but since we went live with the new version of the Terran, it's 2017, uh, we have over 700 labs represented. So distinct labs, not users. We have to sign up to be a user, and we have almost 5,000 distinct users by now. We've run over 8,000 experiments. Uh, what I'm excited about is we have now over 250 papers published where the Robotarium has been used by other groups as the experimental platform. So in some sense, it's, it's worked. Um, what I also like is if you look at the geographic spread of the users, not surprisingly, I've met the vast majority is North America, Asia, Europe. But you know what? We have actually four labs in Africa that are running experiments on the Robotarium. To me, that is exciting. Even if it's four labs, that still means that there are places on this planet where we don't have the resources to do spontaneous robotics that actually we're able to do things thanks to the robotarium. So even though 
the green sliver is small, it's still there. The one continent that's missing, of course, is Antarctica. Uh, so if you start a lab in Antarctica, please try the Robotarium, because I want to say that we have every continent on the planet. Represent. We don't yet. Uh, but to me, this was, this was quite, quite exciting. And uh, we wrote the paper in 2020 in the Control Systems magazine, where we basically outlined who the users were, what kind of experiments they, they ran. What also happened, which I'm quite excited about, is we saw things like federations. So we had a lab at Tokyo Tech running experiments there at the same time as they were running experiments at the Robot Parent. This is 11,000 kilometers between the lab and Tokyo, and 200 milliseconds each way in the lakes, and still they coordinated these behaviors. That was cool. Uh, we started seeing new robotariums. So this is the, the Ducky Town Robotarium in Den Haag, in Zurich, uh, when they have the, what they call the Robotarium Watchtower Camera Field. Field. Field is what I'm trying to say. So there were new robotariums. There's a Robotarium Paraguay that's been built. There's a Robotarium West at Oregon State. Uh, I now have a second Robotarium at, at UC Irvine. So this is one thing, but I do want to show you this. So this is what it looked like, the number of submissions from when we went live uh, in August 2017. And then we started picking up more and more. There are peaks, and we actually started to see that ICRA and I was that nice. So when conferences were due, we saw direct peaks. There were classes that started using the Robotarium. But the one thing I want to show also is this. What happened after March 2020? What, what actually, what happened in March 2020? The world shut down and we all went home, because that's when the pandemic hit. Georgia Tech decided that the Robotarium was a critical resource or a critical piece of infrastructure. So it was allowed to operate during the pandemic. And we just saw it grow and grow and grow and grow. So we had made a robotic lab, robotics lab that was pandemic proof also in some sense. I had a postdoc that showed up on Friday afternoons for an hour at work just to make sure that it hadn't burned up. And that was the only intervention we had during the pandemic. Uh, so this to me is, is terribly exciting. Okay, cool. So this is my vision for the Robotarium. I wonder, if you look at how si large, expensive science instrumentations are used. This is uh, an observatory, a bit of a CERN, right? Uh, it's people come up with experiments, and then for uh, observatories, you actually run them remotely a lot of times. So CERN have to be on location. But this idea of building something where people can propose experiments and then go and run it. So this is what I wanted it to be. It's certainly not quite that. So I want to end by just talking about some of the, the problems we encountered. And I think this is relevant for the broader usability story also. The first is, research is messy. If you're building a remotely accessible instrument that's supposed to be used for research, you have to allow it to be unsuccessful. Unsuccessful experiments are more frequent than successful experiments. So you somehow need to be able to allow unsuccessful things to happen. Uh, what we did is we wrapped these various functions around it. But what if you really want to try something where you have a new collision avoidance algorithm, but then you have to let us know when we turn off the, the various functions. But the messiness of, of research in terms of allowing for failures to be there is hard. There are tons of remotely accessible educational platforms where you get to pick values for PID regulators, but, but you don't get to break stuff. Here you actually have to be allowed to fail, because otherwise it's not research. The other thing that we learned quickly is, if we have one modality, and this is how you control these robots, uh, then it's not going to be that useful, because people want to interact with that was an abstraction. We have quite a large user base that are biologists that want to do things like, here's how tandem runs work for ants. They don't care about non uh, <laughs> uh, non-autonomic vehicles, right? They, they don't care about non dynamics. They don't care about flat planning. They just want to move from point A to point B. They need to be able to do that. There are people that care very much about understanding friction. They need to be able to be down at the friction level. And there are people that to do things like non-anomic integrators and you know, unit cycle models. There are people that sorry, they want to understand sensors, they don't care about sensors. So you need to be able to engage at many different levels of abstraction for something to be useful. Uh, the third thing though that we, we found out, and I call this reproducibility, is 
even in the Robotarium, people are hesitant to, if they submit code, we ask, can we, can we just store people's successful experiments so that we can use each other's code and try it out and try it on our, uh, on our platforms? Some people are okay with it, some are not. Uh, this is something that I still hope will happen that is more broadly accepted that people are willing to, to share their code. Because in all honesty, when we write papers and compare our, our algorithm to someone else's algorithm, Spend all our time optimizing our algorithm, and then we implement this, and I go, oh, look, we're better. Success, right? But we should really compare the best version of our algorithm to the best version of your algorithm. And the only way to do that is get your code to compare. So that's something we care a lot about. Uh, the last point, though, if you want to build a remotely accessible research platform, is this idea of users and community. Uh, I talked to quite a few people that have tried research remotely accessible research platforms, not in robotics, but there is a, a very successful one out of Rutgers University on wireless networking. There's a, a long-term uh, remotely accessible uh, lab at USC in uh, Los Angeles in cybersecurity. Uh, but there are also tons of these that fail. And here's, here's a quote from a Kevin Costner movie, The Field of Dreams, and you've seen it with his building's baseball stadium. He says, if you build it, they will come uh, in remotely accessible robotics. That's not true at all. If you build it, no one will show up. But there are tons and tons of examples of these systems that are not used. And I actually think one of the biggest problems for us in the community is instead of just proliferating this, and we have now a gazillion benchmark, it's very easy to write a paper and say, here's a new benchmark. But these benchmarks need to be accepted and adopted by the community. So I think for, for a workshop like this and a community like ours, kind of thinking through what are the types of benchmarks that actually matter? What are the types of labs that we really would like to be able to run our algorithms on? So that to me has been the biggest, biggest surprise. How much time we have to invest in early on to get a stable user base for something like that. So with that, I would like to say thank you. These things never happen in a vacuum. In fact, if there's anything in this presentation that you enjoyed, it's due to uh, former and current lab members and collaborators. And if you didn't enjoy it, Angela is to blame for me by the Thank you. Yes, I'm time for questions. I like questions in the audience. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I have like, questions. In your remote access laboratory, was there, can you also test the, can you also only test like control problems, like formation control, or can you also, of course, test different communication mechanisms? Like I switch, I mean, obviously you cannot switch from Wi Fi to a different technology, but maybe some, like, can you increase some parameters of communication? Yeah, so, so we made a decision that what this really is primarily focused on is mobility. Mobility questions, but then we got we got requests to try different sensors and try different communication modalities. So the answer is kind of in that we have we can make the robots hallucinate different communication modalities, different communication protocols, but it's not actually happening in one. The same thing with sensors. Uh, so we have a rudimentary set of sensors, and if you want to try something fancier, we either have it or we work with you to develop a model to, to fake that piece. So we are true to, this is a hardware lab where things are actually moving when it comes to mobility. We are simulating a lot of stuff when it comes to sensing and communication. So you can try it, you can play with the parameters, but you're not running actual experiments yet. You're running simulations on top of this one. Uh, I think that's another good point though, which is when you do something like this, you gotta know what it is that you're doing. And in our case, we are building a mobility more than anything else. I was hoping that it would crop up, you know, humanoid robotics, remotely accessible lab, and exactly what we've got up, which is different communication modalities. So okay. one minute. How many different robotic tech like scary setups do you have in the robot Ah uh, so we're doing a few things there. So first of all you, you can we, we have an experiment description language. 
uh, where basically we specify things like how many robots do you need, how long are they going to be out, what kind of dynamics do you want, what kind of sensing, what kind of comms. Then we have the projector, right? And what we can do is we project scenes. So you can actually write scenes. We've added certain Mars landscapes, farm fields, a lot of traffic, a lot of urban infrastructure. Um, and then go back to this thing of simulating things. Then the robots hallucinate collision avoidance risk. There's a problem there. So sky's the limit in that sense. Uh, we tried to make an experiment script and language that was rich enough to, to support a lot of things. But at the end of the day, you know, it's 25 robots that are moving around, and they are largely kinematic, so that's where the sweet spot really is. Uh, but yeah, you can simulate. You can pretend that you have a lot of different ideas. Do you have another question? Um, this is really incredible. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how many about the post coming in for one hour a week to maintain this. Like, at a level of automation, like, just availability, it's really impressive. And, like, how did you, how did you reach that? Yeah, that's a good point. It was incredibly time consuming to get to that level. So first of all, they always need to be on, right? So we have uh, inductive chargers, so they, the robots go up and they charge. And someone described this as uh, docking at the space station over and over and over and over again. So we spent a lot of time getting just the charging done right. The other thing that happened is, so in the beginning we had a small robot. Uh, we had to upgrade to bigger robots because if there was some kind of little dust or something that came down in the arena that was bigger than this, then all of a sudden they got stuck and stuff, something happened. So we spent a lot of time making sure that the arena was, was clean. What we ended up with at the end was a cleaning robot, kind of like the yeah, not only an ice hockey ring, that would just go every, every day or so and just sweep the, the arena. Um, but no, it, it took a lot of motivation to get to that point. And what, what Sean was doing, the postdoc, uh, I actually didn't put out, that was embarrassing. Um, also, <laughs> on the unsung heroes of science. Uh, a big part of that was he was making sure, because things did get stuck every now and again. But we actually managed to run without interruption for multiple months, which, which takes a lot. The other thing that I didn't bring up is once this took off, then immediately people started to try to just hack into the system. Right? So, through the text uh, office of information technology, I'm super nervous about how we actually secure this place from. You may not know this, but people on the internet can be a little weird. <laughs> so basically, we ended up, at first, you submitted code and ran it directly. Now we ended up having to have a meter and you submitted code and you had to basically go through the code and, and certify that it was, it was bad. And then you put it on. So we had to insert it. Yeah, you step in between. What that meant, though, is that. When you submit code, we don't run the code right away. In fact, you don't even get it. What happens is you get you get the video feedback. That's what you get. Uh, you send the data, whatever the data is. Okay. Uh, how long does it take for a user to let's say to from scratch to run the experiment? So now it takes. I, I can't give you an exact number, but it doesn't take long. So we have uh, we have a lot of example code on the website. Basically, insert algorithm here and all the infrastructure around it is taken care of. The surprising thing, so we thought we were really we're going to use ROS, right? Uh, that seems like the right place to start. A lot of our early users, they don't know ROS, they're biologists. They want to use MATLAB. So we actually pivoted it so it looks like MATLAB. In the end. Now we have ROS version and the Python work, but uh, the bar is actually very low. And we have example code that we can just run. Things like city pursuit and rendezvous information controller, just to, you see how it actually works. You can also decide if you want to have these be single integrators or unit cycles, or you can set how you choose. You, you basically set some flags for what kind of dynamics you're using. So I can't tell you how long it's going to take. It's probably going to take me a week, and it'll probably take you an hour. <laughs> I mean, if I have already an experiment that is going to be valid, I could. Uh, no, no, no. Most of the time, it, it, the, the turnaround time is now fast. Uh, it's rare that we have a queue. Uh, and the, the queue is, if you wait till the deadline for iOS and tomorrow, uh, you may actually miss it. But no, normally there. So most of the time, there isn't a queue, which is very long.
Final question. Yeah, so we didn't do it in the Robotarium for users, but I, I share your time. We're collision obsessed in mobile actuates, but you know, birds actually do things over that. Uh, you walk through a crowd and subway, you bump into each other all the time. And not all collisions are bad. So I, as a side project, I'm mean, much more. Uh, what happens when you allow collisions? And not only that, there's information to be had in collisions. You can use collisions as a sensor. Or just collision counters, right? So there's a sensor that allows you to do things. Can you have completely blind robots that can act out sensors? So I, I just think that's a really interesting question. Yeah. When you're going to nanobots in small scale, things like collisions are much easier than having a mini laser scanner that you were injecting into the bus before. So I, uh, I think human beings, we engage with the world all the time, and we move things out of the way. And then in robotics, we're so obsessed with well, don't, don't touch anything. So I, I think having a, a robots that engage more gracefully with the world, broadly, is, let's say, a valid and really important area. Great. This is a great way to finish. Uh, thank you so much for the meeting. Dr. Sawyer Fuller presenting virtually. Uh, Dr. Fuller is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. He creates biologically inspired sensors, uh, control systems, and mechanical designs targeting insect sized air and ground vehicles to investigate the flight systems of aerial insects. In addition to his work on insect flight control, he has also developed a broad hopping robot at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and has invented an ink jet printer capable of fabricating a millimeter scale. 3D metal machine at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, they recently developed a Python control library, which is a leading open source tool for the analysis and design of control systems as well as the for various set uh, controls. So, thank Dr. Sartol, and uh, you can start whenever. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to get a chance to um, speak. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, primarily two two aspects. Um, first of all, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you about some of my work um, in uh, designing control systems for robot flies and with, with some, some connection to our, our efforts there um, in designing open source um, software or using open source software and designing open source software to, to, in service of this task. Um, and the second one is some comments on uh, using open source software and in particular the Python control systems library to um, in, in education. And I'll, I'll wrap up um, in the context of our discussion here about uh, um, uh, benchmarking um, and uh, reproducibility in open source software, some, some thoughts derived. Um, we, we don't have a lot of opportunity to um, reproduce things because we were one of the I think two labs in the world currently that I know of that can build robot flies, um, but I'll but I'll draw on some of my experiences in a as a previous life as a grad student uh, doing behavioral biology, uh, where where reproducibility is very important when you're deriving um, uh, uh, stimuli for animals. So um, let me uh, move on to what we're gonna. The first part of this is that the robot flies part. So um, this, you know, let me tell you a little bit about what I mean by robot flies. Um, so what, you know, what we're after is a uh, kind of an ambitious effort um, to create uh, a fully integrated robot fly uh, that's complete with uh, the sensing and power systems that it would need to operate fully autonomously. Uh, so something that looks like this, this is a, this is a, 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 a robot fly from our lab. Um, and you can see it's, you know, here's the tip of a regular pencil, so it's it's quite small, uh, about the weight of it, it maybe two toothpicks. Um, but uh, this one doesn't have any autonomy. It, it, there's a laser hitting this, uh, this is a photovoltaic here. The power goes down these two wires, there's a high voltage boost converter down here, and it generates the signal to open loop to just barely take off. 
um, but it doesn't do much else. Um, and what we really want to do is turn this into a kind of a, a tech demo here uh, into something that's uh, potentially useful. Um, so maybe the next question you might ask is why would you why would you want to do that? Uh, why make drones as small as insects? Um, and there's kind of two reasons I think. There's a lot of reasons you might do it, but there's two that really stand out in my mind. One is that they um, they uh, have a potential to be much safer around humans. Think of a larger drone, there's a pretty significant impact hazard. Uh, but if you think of an insect-sized robot, really that, that impact hazard is largely mitigated, which means you have the potential to operate these guys uh, around people. Uh, close proximity to people, which is something it's hard to say is the case for almost any other class of robot. So super safe around people. Um, the other one is um, limited battery life of robotic flies. We think that there's a distinct possibility to um, overcome that. Uh, drones right now fly for about a half hour before they before they have to they land and, and recharge. Uh, we think that due to some uh, strong uh, helpful scaling laws that it might be possible to fly them indefinitely in the sun and or uh, when indoors do something like bond to a, a light bulb and then charge in close, close proximity uh, by taking advantage of electrostatic adhesion. And uh, both, both, you know, both solar power and electrostatic adhesion, uh, their strength scale as the length squared, where L might be some characteristic length. Uh, but mass scales as length to the third, roughly speaking, to first order, which means that you know this is the reason this is the case is because uh, the very low mass. Uh, but this helps us over here. So low mass means low power requirements. Uh, so we have these kind of two distinct advantages for insect-sized robots that uh, are a large part of what motivates us to um, to explore them as a potential alternative to larger drones. Now, um, that said, so that you know, these are some technical abilities, but what, how does that factor into where they would be used? Uh, we have a few ideas uh, for what they could be used for and what leverage these this human safety and indefinite operation from the sun. And one of those is this idea of um, uh, probably the nearest term one is what I would call um, low atmosphere, low altitude atmospheric telemetry, uh, which you can think of as sort of a, a weather balloon for uh, the indoor environment, uh, going flying around and measuring uh, air composition, airflow, that sort of thing. And you can imagine this would be useful in an industrial setting to find gas leaks, in an um, indoor setting to maybe find stagnant or unhealthy air or even spread of diseases, airborne diseases. Um, and in the outdoors, uh, it might include uh, doing, looking for forest fires on a very early basis um, or in an agriculture setting to find uh, disease onset or fertilization state. Um, but probably, uh, you know, in the very short term, uh, you know, I imagine them doing something like what uh, insects do very well, which is they would operate maybe uh, in, in an indoor setting and look for emissions of hazardous gases. So for example, maybe you run a, um, a oil refinery and you are collecting methane, but once in a while a, a pipe because of thermal changes starts leaking and you want to um, detect uh, and find leaks of that methane leak. So uh, what you might do is you might come to the site with a, a suitcase full of a uh, pelican case full of these robot flies, open it up, they swarm out and they use some sort of autonomy, obstacle avoidance. They're equipped with chemical sensors and they do uh, plume source finding much in the way that a uh, insect does uh, on, to find their way to the sources of these leaks. And, uh, and then maybe emit a beacon that uh, a human operator would then use to find and patch that leak. And we could hope, for example, this could uh, drastically reduce greenhouse gas um, emissions of methane, for example, if you could very quickly find leaks and patch them much faster than is currently possible. You know, there are ways to find leaks now, but they're very costly and cumbersome. So this is maybe a potential way to, to reduce leaks. Um, so let me, now I've given you the overview, uh, you know, so we're in this area of flying insect robotics. It's this intersection, you know, we can make small robots, um, there's some physics that are different at small scale, but at the same time, they're big enough that we can actually think about um, putting sensors and chips on board to give them autonomy. 
Um, and, and sometimes, you know, to solve these tasks, uh, we, we take a liberal dose of inspiration from, from biology. Uh, just to complete the picture, um, we, we, we build them with a, uh, you know, that a process to build insect sized devices has emerged. It looks, it's called, uh, we call it smart composite microfabrication, SCM for short. Uh, and it consists of cutting parts like this, uh, this carbon fiber composite sheet, bonding the layers together, um, and then creating folds through the shapes of these laser cuts, and then, and then folding the parts together under, under a microscope. Uh, and this has turned into a quite effective way to, to build small scale structure with, with very high um, both precision and materials property. Uh, and this is what one of the, um, the folding sequence for the U University of Washington RoboFly design. Uh, it looks something like this. And then we put the actuators here at the end and, um, and, bond some, and bond a wing to it. And we combine two of these to create something that looks like this. This is the University of Washington RoboFly it, as you can see, it's about this actuator part here in the middle here is about the size of the end of a pencil. So it's quite small. Mass is, this one is about one and a half toothpicks without that boost converter underneath. Um, flapping frequency comparable to uh, insects, about 200 Hertz. Uh, and it can carry about twice its weight uh, in payload for, for example, a battery or a sensor system. Um, the, and then, you know, the, 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 they're actuated with piezoelectric actuators, which give them the ability to do very muscle-like actions, almost arbitrary waveforms through the piezos, which give them, give, give us a lot of interesting capabilities as far as, um, uh, control. Um, and for example, here's some basics, uh, here's on the left is how you might do a roll where you just flap one wing with a larger amplitude than the other. Uh, for a pitch, you uh, shift the center of pressure of the two wings forward or aft of the center of mass, and that gives you a net pitch torque forward or back. Um, and in this way, we can um, control the robots like this. Uh, and here's a video of um, from our lab of one of these guys flying in, in free flight. I'll play that again. And this is in real time. So you, you, I have this as a very high speed video 60 hertz, but it's probably not coming through um, this the Zoom link. But uh, what, what you can probably see is the dynamics are very fast. So we have a challenge of very small robot, very low power computation ability, um, but uh, very fast dynamics. So these are some so two two th forces that we are we're you know to solve uh, that are kind of in conflict with each other. So today we you know uh, we have this. You know, so let me tell you about the, our research tasks right now. So that video shows the the airframe flapping and driving its uh, driving its wings. Um, but uh, you know, okay, that looks great. It looks like a fly, but it doesn't have lots of the things that a real fly does. It's using uh, motion capture cameras that you can't see in that video attached to the fly here. Uh, it's using a desktop computer. It's actually using two desktop computers to do the computations. Uh, one to reconstruct the motion capture markers. Um, and another running um, uh, Simulink real-time, formerly known as XPC Target, to run the control computations. So uh, closed source software, but it seems to be the right tool for the job for now. Um, and uh, then it's got a um, external, uh, this is a piezo amplifier because the piezo actuators are high voltage. So we've got a power off board as well too. And so ongoing is this task to um, put move you know, all these components on board. Uh, in, in, in other words, we want to, it's kind of a moonshot project to put all the, uh, the the autonomy all on board to include all the sensing, all the compute and all the, and all the power. So let's talk about the tasks for, um, for doing kind of the control and, and sensing, start with that. Um, first of all, what happens when you turn one of these on and flap the wings and open loop? looks something like this. Uh, they crash almost faster than you can see. I hope you didn't blink. Let me see if I can get one more here. And this is what it looks like in slow motion. So you turn it on and almost immediately it, it crashes. And even if even if you calibrate it a little better, it just crashes. Uh, so the first level, what we need to control these guys is something that uh, um, gives them some you know attitude stability. So we um, you know, this is the notional um, flight control system, and it entails uh, probably an inner attitude 
control loop that also controls velocity and then maybe an outer kind of a higher level control loop higher level autonomy that gives you uh, ability to do things like navigation or planning uh, so let's start with this inner loop um, you know we've got the conceptual notional flight control system that uh, where we've been targeting um, has a as an inertial measurement unit on board and an, uh, and an optic flow camera facing downward and then a, a Kalman filter based estimator to uh, estimate use estimate the state given this given this data here of course all this stuff has to be really small and, and lightweight uh so this is a you know one version we've we've been working on here this is a um sensor package that weighs 190 milligrams so about two toothpicks and it includes a optic flow camera to sense lateral displacements a uh, rangefinder to measure distance, uh, and a gyroscope and accelerometer on board. Those are these components here. This is the camera. This is the laser rangefinder. This is the um, gyroscope here. Um, and with these together, uh, we can show that we can get pretty good state estimation compared to baseline mocap. You see all these lines match up. You know your altitude, your lateral velocity, your 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 pitch angle. You know we get pretty good accuracy there. Um, but this is a bit uh, higher, a bit, bit too high of a mass for the RoboFly. Basically, the entire 200 milligram payload of the RoboFly would be used up for our, with our avionics, leaving no room for um, for sense for um, for a battery or anything else. Uh, and by the way, let me just mention um, uh, this is running. You know, we 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 simulated this this estimator in Python using the Python controls library. Uh, but then we uh, we implement the estimator in in C on board the, the microcontroller, and that's kind of our 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 path is we use computer aided design to to do the control design and then and then reduce it to C for speed on on board. Um, this is a you know this is kind of the way it, what it looks like. This is all wireless. There's a wireless link Bluetooth, and what you what you get with this avionics device is you know you can sense lateral displacements, attitude displacements um, in, in all directions. So essentially it's what you need to do kind of basic flight control, uh, but it's a little bit heavy. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time here? Let's see if we have time for this. All right, I think we can talk about this. I wanted to take this chance to dive a little deeper into some recent work that I'm particularly um, proud of. Um, it's, it's this idea, it's a, it's a new, um, idea for avionics and flight control uh, that appeared in, in science robotics last year um, that kind of has its unique trait that it is an avionic system um, that dispenses with some conventional wisdom that appears in most avionic systems and drones and almost any size aircraft, which is that you need a gyroscope, which measures angular velocity uh, as a core component of your flight controller. But when, uh, but it, down at this scale of a, of a robot fly or below, we run into this um, this issue that I kind of referred to in the last slide, which is that even with that avionic system, which is more conventional, we're running into some mass and power constraints. Where start that is too heavy and too power hungry. Uh, so how do you how do you cut the mass down a little bit? Um, well, a big source of mass and power is actually a gyroscope because it's an active device that sits there and vibrates. Um, so um, we show here that you can actually get rid of that gyroscope by using an accelerometer. Um, and that accelerometer, uh, you actually use that in two, two ways. First of all, it turns out that an accelerometer on a flying aircraft does not serve as an inclinometer, if you have ever studied accelerometers. Um, on an aircraft, because the aircraft is basically taking ballistic trajectories, it does not sense gravity direction, it senses airspeed. Um, and how do you do that? Uh, the basic idea is that your accelerometer is measuring forces, and you only have two forces. You have one that's the thrust of the wings, and the other is the drag on the wings. And it turns out the drag on the wings for flapping wing vehicles and actually propeller-driven vehicles um, is largely proportional to the airspeed. And this turns out to hold for um, some my uh, some work I did on fruit flies. Naturally, it's quite noisy, but we have a lot of data points, so we, you know we think it's it's plausible that this is the case. Basically, drag is proportional to to airspeed for flapping wings. And this boils down to that drag is velocity squared on the 
downstroke and velocity squared on the upstroke. And if you do the two squares and subtract them from each other, you end up the squared terms drop out and you're left with this um, proportional term that's proportional to airspeed. Uh, we also found it for flapping wing robotic flies too. In a wind tunnel, the drag is basically proportional to airspeed. So equipped with a model, we can say, well, if I know what, how much drag my accelerometer is sensing by sensing accelerations, then I can sense um, um, airspeed. I can detect airspeed using if, if I know it's proportional. And it actually doesn't have to strictly be proportional. I just need a model of the airspeed. Um, and then what I do with that accelerometer, accelerometer measures this funny um, quantity, which is specific acceleration, which is it doesn't actually sense gravity. It senses all accelerations except for gravity. Um, so it's, it measures the specific acceleration. So if you write that in body frame coordinates, um, you can write it in terms of the mass and the forces, right? Acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Um, so we have drag, here's the gravity force. Oh, and we subtract out the gravity, gravity force. And we're left that, uh, that the accelerometer is measuring only um, the drag um, for, uh, yeah, unless you, um, and it measures lift, but you know lift because you're feeding, you're, you're setting, sending lift in there. So if you subtract out the lift, which you know, you're left with this uh, only the drag term. Um, so then we can invert that using this model for our airspeed drag. And we say, well, this is our estimate. The airspeed depends on the mass and this, this damping coefficient and the measured airspeed. And it turns out that we can validate this even on a larger aircraft like a helicopter. We get a pretty good measurement of airspeed uh, just by measuring the, jet, uh, uh, the accelerometer output. So that's insight one. You can use the accelerometer to measure your lateral velocity uh, when there's no wind. When there's wind, it's perturbing. Um, it will perturb you, but uh, you know there's a way to measure that too if you add a camera. Um, but the other insight here is what you really need is attitude uh, estimation. And I'm going to just kind of run through this very quickly. Uh, the, the point is for all this is that uh, you can show if you do a linearization um, around hover, if you look at the observability matrix, very simple analysis, you can show that it's full rank and therefore uh, you can estimate the, the full state, which includes the attitude or the orientation. And that's key because once you know your attitude, then you can you can do uh, aggressive maneuvers. Um, a further remark, if you then add a camera, you can also show that you can estimate the speed of the wind, not the airspeed, but the speed of the wind, which is an external, external quantity. You use a Kalman filter to estimate that too. Uh, okay, so um, then we um, uh, did some simulations to prove this out. You know, you can we can do trajectory, flight trajectory control, and we can. Um, do uh, here's a here's a step response in wind, um, and our, our wind estimate slowly converges after a couple seconds. So we, we're estimating wind online, and then we can use that estimate of wind to reject it. Here's the velocity of the robot, and here's a gust of wind. The robot gets perturbed by the gust of wind, and then very shortly later, it rejects that gust of wind, and it's down here back at zero. So it's basically sitting in the air. Gust of wind hits it, it moves, but then it recovers, and then it's kind of keeping its same velocity at the end. Okay, um, just a summary, what we've got is a, here's our new avionics package using off the shelf hardware and it's just dramatically lighter than this kind of conventional system. We're down to milligrams instead of hundreds of milligrams and drastic, you know, microwatts instead of milliwatts. Uh, so this is gonna be great for, for future robotic flies. And we, you know, this is the first avionics system light enough to really go on this guy. This one's a little bit, maybe a little bit big. Okay, um, what's what's coming up next? Uh, I think I'm going to skip over this. We've been also using, you know, so so some of those simulations use the Python control systems library. Um, we're also working on the power control system. This requires a high voltage boost converter, and we got to learn some learn the signal, and um, uh, we're able to modulate the thrust from these wings. This is open loop. This paper here is about doing starting to do closed loop, um, and so we use uh, we use a Python based um, simulation of the circuit. Uh, in the course of designing this uh, learning controller that learns how to generate these sinusoids to drive the piezo actuated wings. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the byproducts um, of this has been um, some of my uh, my uh, contributions to Python control systems library, and there's loads of contributions here. Um, this, is a, this is, I think, um, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, package that falls under the category of control systems design software. Um, it, uh, it, it builds on this scientific stack of NumPy and Matplotlib and JupyterLab 
that um, have built up around Python. And, um, you know, we get, we're getting some pretty impressive download numbers now. Uh, probably uh, we get this, probably because this project started years ago before Python was that big of a um, programming language. And so we got this, uh, this early on, we got the oh so trendy control um, keyword. So it's easy to find this. We don't really know if these million downloads a year are from people only doing control systems design, but we like to think it, at least a good fraction of them are. Um, but this library started about 15 years ago, and it's kind of, um, there's 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 a good number of other Python libraries, but I think this is probably the most featureful at this point. Um, it's got uh, LTI systems, state space, frequency domain, uh, design, frequency domain, um, and uh, uh, time domain, and pole zero based, and, and state space based um, design tools. Uh, one, one area that I think it's got particularly strong um, uh, uh, capability is with uh, kind of nonlinear systems. It allows very easy interconnection of nonlinear systems and some optimization based uh, control toolboxes um, to include model uh, model predictive control and describing functions, for example. Um, so we have a couple to do's that still it doesn't have that'd be great to have. Um, contributions are welcome in this area. We, uh, we don't have a good way to do time delays yet. Um, we don't have a delay delay um, integrator. Python does not have a good delay-based numerical integrator, so that would be very helpful to have that. We also don't have a Simulink like uh, GUI. Um, if you want to know more about it, we finally got our act together and got a paper out about this. Um, take a look at it there. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, another nice feature that has come out of this is um, we're working on simulated complicated interconnected systems like this. Here's how it's done in Simulink. You kind of draw it up like this. This is Simulink. It's part of MATLAB. Um, our approach has been to, to fall back to doing um, kind of text-based connections. And so this, you know, to make a system like this with all these components, you create a bunch of them. You name each signal. This is inspired by Mat MATLAB's approach. Um, you name each signal, and then you do a interconnect, uh, run an interconnect function with this list of all these different um, uh, blocks, and it implicitly interconnects them and creates a new system that is the input-output system of this whole interconnected system. Uh, so we're 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 closing in on at least a a something like what you can get out of Simulink, which is which is nice. We don't have a graphical-based interface yet. There's a couple of graphical interfaces, but they're not um, they're not very robust yet. So they're kind of work in progress. We're working. We, we as a few options that we might want to kind of join forces with. Um, and then just very briefly, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, we've been using the Python control in, in um, a digital discrete time controls course at University of Washington, where, I, where I'm a, an assistant professor. Um, and we've recently developed this new lab that uses super cheap microcontrollers. Um, and it leverages the Python ecosystem. Uh, now you can write Python on microcontrollers. So we, we write the controller in, and design it in Python control, and then we implement it in a micro Python. And that makes for a very kind of smooth um, interconnection of these two systems. And the students then only have to use one type of uh, um, programming language, and it works pretty well for them. Um, micro Python is a little bit slow. And by a little bit, I mean actually quite slow compared to C, maybe um, 10 to 100 times slower. Um, luckily, that that's it's enough on this little microcontroller to run a you know a simple PID like control loop at up to kilohertz. So it's enough to do most things we might want to do. In this case, we design using an op amp and these these big capacitors. We uh, we have the students control a resonant system above and below the sampling rate or the Nyquist frequency associated with the sampling rate and deal with um, kind of issues that arise there. Um, so let's see. So let me let me just summarize where we are. Um, uh, what, what I've found um, in my experience designing robot flies is that we've made heavily use of open source software in the design of our control systems. That said, we actually, for the real-time part, we still use Simulink, uh, though we're actively moving toward um, switching to 
uh, microcontrollers running running C is 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 that part of you know for the low level real time flight control. Um, but uh, we found it's very useful because it um, you know open source means we're not depending on um, open uh, commercial software where they could change their licensing and um, and you have to deal with licensing when you're building complicated systems. So it's it's been very great for that. Um, and this also applies to education. Um, uh, we we don't have control. We had to switch away from LabVIEW because LabVIEW doesn't work on Apple Silicon based Macs. So we had to switch over, and uh, we can't do anything about if LabVIEW doesn't want to make LabVIEW for Apple Silicon. Uh, there's nothing we can do. But for open source software, by and large, the community will make stuff available. And so you know, this we've switched over to open source for our educational tools. Um, as far as the some some remarks on reproducibility and benchmarking. Um, Python is challenging um, to 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 release um, code that is it can be reproduced anywhere. Um, but I so so but we don't have a lot of need for reproducibility yet. But um, I I did want to mention maybe for for discussion. Um, I wanted to kind of point to one success story story I would say in the Python. Um, world and it comes from uh, behavioral biology, which has a very distinct need to have reproducible results that somebody else can do. And um, this this is a, a piece of software that was released uh, now almost fifteen years ago. Um, and um, what their solution was is to um, stop changing it. <laughs> uh, the 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 um, they, they haven't updated it since 2009. That's a very deliberate choice, actually, because they want to have this piece of software that run Vision Egg now versus 10 years ago, and you're going to get the same same output from your insect or psychophysical behaviors. So, um, and they use an egg, which is a kind of an old-fashioned release tool for Python that is has I think gone by the wayside. Um, so, you know, I think one open challenge right now in, in Python, at least my understanding, is that um, the, the distribution toolbox is not not very good. But in this case, what what this software imposes you do is you use an old version of Python um, and you can get reproducible results. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Can you hear us online now? I can hear you there. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Do you want to join as well, or just okay? Okay, great. I think um, given the time, we'll switch to the panel. So I just give you a quick overview of what is coming next. So we have a virtual panel um, with the current speaker and also Stefan Sosnowski. Um, who, who you see here. Um, and just to give you a heads up, so this goes roughly till 1230, then there is a lunch break. And after the lunch break, we have another set of um, lightning talks here in person. Um, and then a few more invited talks. But so um, maybe I hand over to Lucas to introduce the speakers and start with the questions. And this is interactive, so you can also raise your hand and ask questions. So this first theme today in the morning was about reproducibility and open source code. So um, if you have questions for either of them or also for the talk, you can um, ask them now. Yeah, so maybe yeah. start with um okay so if anyone is just you know joined right now and missed uh, the wonderful talk by professor fuller i'm gonna introduce him again uh so he's an assistant professor at the university of washington and besides working on um, insect-sized robots uh, he's also um, developed the python control library which is a leading open source um, tool for the analysis and design of control systems and then i'm also happy to introduce uh, Stefan. Sosnowski, who is currently a postdoc at the Institute of Information Oriented Control at the Technical University of Munich, uh, led by Professor Sandra Hirche. And 
recently has been working on the interface of control and robotics, going from Koopman operators all the way to um, manipulation using reinforcement learning. Do you want to start with the first question? Okay. Um, okay, so let's start with the first question uh, to, to both panelists. Um, so as we can see is that reproducibility is very critical to transparent research. However, there are various challenges um, in reproducing other work, for example, lack of implementation details or different optimization packages or even just like different programming languages. Um, and so what is your experience with reproducing other results in the literature and what strategies do you follow or recommend uh, to address these challenges? And yeah, whoever wants to start. Yeah, I'll just take the chance. Um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And um, I mean, basically, I guess we all have experienced that it can be quite challenging to reproduce other results. Um, I mean, on the one hand, we need to make a bit of a distinction. So for theoretical results, we typically have a very good idea and recipe and do this by uh, looking at the proofs that come with the paper. But for more algorithmic and numerical things, um, at least for us, the experience was a bit with a, a hit and miss. And that's backed up by data. So in the preparation to this panel, I found a really nice um, online survey from Nature. So Baker 2016 provided uh, an, an overview and uh, asked people if they could reproduce others' results and also their own result. And that was quite surprising because uh, you saw that 70% uh, of people claimed that they could not reproduce others' work. But what's even more surprising to me is that 50% um, said they couldn't even reproduce their own work partially. So you see that there is really a bit of a, a, a need there for standardizing reproducibility. And those figures, I mean, just by the way, because um, initially I also thought, okay, that must be biology or social science because the conditions are always hard to reproduce. But it turns out um, that uh, for physics and engineering, these numbers were at the same level. So it was 68% for engineering, which really came to surprise to me. So it definitely showed there is a need to do that. Um, I also have this in my own, let's say, anecdotal evidence as a reviewer for journals like the Transactions on Robotics. Um, I recently had a paper where we exactly had that problem. I reviewed it. Something looked a bit odd in the uh, in the figures and the plots. And then when I started to really get to the detail, why it just didn't match my expectation from what I saw with the um, with what they had written in the paper, um, I came across code from prior work that um, they based their work heavily on and I ran the code and tried to reproduce the results but it just didn't match so of course immediately the rest of the paper was kind of put under heavy scrutiny and was close to a reject because it could have been falsification of data turns out in the end uh, when they resubmitted um, they just put some very implicit assumptions and conditions on their uh, own implementation of the work. And when they provided some open source court code for this, that we could rerun the experiment and see that actually it was the case what they reported, all was good. Um, but this is, to me, one of the clear examples where just sharing the code and making it re your own work reproducible has a benefit, also a measurable one, in one that you just don't get rejected from uh, the, the uh, let's say, more reputable journals. And I think it's pretty much like, uh, like ethics. I mean, we all expect for human-robot uh, interactions that we also provide the ethics. So why not provide basically the baseline and the code and the data that we have for um, everything that is more on the data-driven side? Great, I've thank talked you. a lot, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. No, thank you. This was great. 
Um, Sawyer, do you have something to add? Are you muted? Yeah, I can do that. Sorry. Thanks. I was going to say, um, uh, I, I'm kind of surprised that, um, you know, any, you know, papers that are not, that are simulation based are, do not require release of software currently. I mean, I know, uh, certain journals, they, they require release of open of your, of your software, uh, for example, science robotics. Um, I, actually, I'm not sure it is. Does um, uh, like a transaction on automatic control? Does that require open source software or software releases along with its its articles? I'm not sure whether they do or not. For example, I don't mm. think so. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, that seems like I don't know. Is there any reason not to require that? I'm kind of surprised at this point that that's not a requirement. I know in science robotics, if you have to, if you have any significant amount of software or data, you they they force you to, to publish it. Other questions from the audience. Now, now is a great time. That's I think. So also mm -hmm. thanks for the talk. Um, so there are nice tools nowadays like Code Ocean or Papers with Code where you can actually not only submit your code in form of a repository, but you get something that is executable. What do you think about these tools? Because I don't so often you just get the repository and then you struggle for a long time to get the dependencies right and to get it running on your operating system. So um, yeah, just want to hear your opinion. Does, does code, so this is an issue we have with, with Python is this certainly that issue. Um, certainly if there's binaries released with it, you know, if it's pure Python, things are pretty straightforward, but as soon as you add binaries, you get, uh, or, or C code that you have to compile, for example, things get to be a huge challenge. Um, does code ocean have a solution there? I've thought of using like Docker containers, for example, that you would just release, for example, but I, and we have this, this huge, this issue is very acute in uh, when we're working in, you know, in education, every student I've found has a different Python installation with different dependencies that work, especially when you're interacting with hardware, you're inevitably working with um, uh, compiled binaries. Um, and it's been a huge issue for me, half the students, their code doesn't work. So it kind of reproduces there. It'd be great to have some sort of uh, kind of general releasable blob. It, maybe that's what Code Ocean is. I should look at that. Wait, are there other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, so I want to raise one practical problem. So I guess we are all here pro open source. Uh, but there's a huge part in our community, and this is industry, and I'm, I myself worked also in industry, and there, in theory, you can do open source, but in practice, not really. And if you require them to, by let's say, by rule to submit to code, you exclude them. So have you any comments how to practically solve this problem? Yeah, so I think this is about IP and protecting your code and maybe, you know, commercializing And that's a really, really good question. And honestly, I don't have um, an answer right at hand for that. I think very often, if we're talking about more fundamental research, then um, the pure methods are, at least in Europe, hardly, um, or it's, it's really hard to get a, a software patent on, on, on that. Um, so. I believe very often if you frame it right and if you're really looking at um, just the methodological implementation, there should be a way of releasing this as a software package without jeopardizing your IP. Um, but I see that this can be a problem also with uh, trade secrets or other stuff that you might feel like like losing out if you're giving away too much. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Hmm. I guess it's a it's definitely a good question because um, now, for example, in in Europe, most universities require publications also to be totally open access, right? So they do it on the op on the publication side. But what about the code, which may also be partially funded through companies? Um, yeah. So maybe a question in a similar direction. So there have been a lot of reproducibility efforts in machine learning, and they have been quite successful. But machine learning in that sense is easier because they often work with data sets. And, and then your code has to run on the data set. But in control, we use, uh, you know, we, we do closed loop control. Um, and so in addition to the controller code, you would also need to open source the simulation environment, or if if it's a real experiment, this is even more difficult. So do you think there's, um, we should try to adopt efforts like the ones in the machine learning community and what are the particular challenges for control? Hmm. I mean, I think we should definitely try because it's an, worthy effort that we should take. Uh, I see your point that, of course, you don't just have your, your data blob and you work on that. And I mean, data is easily shared. So there's little cost associated with that. Um, it's transferable for control and robotics. Um, I think something like what we saw with the Robotarium uh, is potentially a really, really good idea for that. Um, because at least running systems and making them available online is challenging, it's costly. Um, unfortunately, I didn't hear the audio talk from Magnus, but I, I think uh, at least from the slides it became clear that uh, just maintaining this thing is really already quite an effort in itself. Um, but if we wanna have something like a benchmark scenario or something that is comparable, it needs to be pretty much the same system. I mean, we had this, at least when I started in control um, with inverted pendulums and double pendulums, they were the de facto standard that everyone was tinkering with. And they were at least simple enough so that you could have one in your lab and run your results. Uh, and it would be at least somewhat comparable to to other results. So I think we've been there. We went away from this a little bit because systems became more and more complex to work with. But ideally, we should get back to this. Um, I don't have a real roadmap on, on how to get there. But I definitely support the effort. Sounds great. Yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll pull in pull on the thread of um you know, the, 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 the vision egg software that I mentioned that has a very similar task, which is to have make the using the same piece of code that it generates the same sequence of images. It's, it's a, it's a piece of, it's a tool for generating visual stimuli for, for animals, uh, for flies or insects or birds, or for, for example, um, and, I, you know, and its its goal is to make to, to to make this you know if you do an experiment now or ten years from now it should be the same thing, and I think part of the way it does that is by being very simple. And put on my control systems library hat. Uh, I think, I mean, that's interesting to reflect on. Could that be a a task that a open source design library should think about um, being able to reproducibly uh, generate. I mean, I guess right now, well, I will say that we um, in, the, in the control systems library as it's developed now, we have lots and lots of unit tests as a core component for uh, any, you know, as we think about any changes to the, to the library it has to have a step response that's exactly the same as what it was last week or last year. Um, and if that changes, there has to be a really good reason. Um, so from that perspective, to some extent, 
On the other hand, we don't have many guarantees. We haven't written guarantees or tests that our simulated results, for example, are correct. We have write unit tests, but we largely write unit tests against how the code used to work and a sanity check, but we haven't actually checked that the, that it's, it's, it's exactly correct. Um, seems like the, the library as it's currently designed is not very well, just ref I'm now I'm kind of just thinking out loud, is not very well designed for reproducibility. What you probably want is some very simple piece of code that has as its main emphasis um, correct correctness, not usability for design. So that may be a different task than uh, than what we're doing for the control systems library. And can I ask one question, uh, one more question about your library? Do you actually know who is using it? Do you have some idea about the statistics of the people who downloaded it from where they come, what they use it for? Maybe they cite your library if they use it in, you know, in their paper. Do you have some statistics? We. Don't have very, thanks for the question. We, we don't have a lot of information now. We, you know, you can look at PyPy stats and you can look at how many times it's been downloaded, but we actually don't know what fraction of that are actual people designing control systems versus they wanted some other control task, like to control the screen on their computer. And they were like, let's do pip install control. Uh, so it could be that a large fraction of those have nothing to do with control systems. Um, so we, yeah, that, that's something we don't really know the answer to. Uh, re relatedly, what we do know is that we get many bug reports uh, from around the world, um, which is great. Uh, I think we get we get bug reports and um, and uh, suggested changes from I think Chile and Indonesia and I mean you name it we've we've got we've gotten from that. So that that is anecdotal evidence that we're getting usage all around the world, which is very encouraging because it means, you know, I think we have a, you know, it shows that we're, we're a teaching tool that does not cost a lot of money. So that, that part is very encouraging. And I know it's being used in many controls courses around the world as well. Um, but how and how heavily it's being used, I, that is, that is something I don't know how to get that data. Mm, it's not yeah, yet. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we have more time for questions from the audience. So just making sure we get your questions in. Yeah. Um, when we do like benchmarks, we also often benchmark the runtime of uh, control algorithms. And uh, I, I think that is something which might be particularly difficult to reproduce because it depends on the uh, specific system where we run the algorithms on and sometimes even on the very same systems, the uh, runtime is not reproducible. So uh, do you have any idea on improving this? Hmm. Count clock cycles. <laughs> huh. But that's even hard to do because you might have different amounts of RAM and thoughts Stefan I I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm I'm trying to come up with something because I mean it's a really inherently difficult problem uh, because it depends on so many different factors um probably yeah probably I know that computer benchmarking this is a task that is a very um significant part of computer architecture design and there's very strict rules they have there's the spec benchmark of uh, spec in spec floating point for measuring processor speed and there they have a very specific set of sequence of things you have to do before you run their benchmark before it becomes an official score that you can report for your new processor that's probably yeah. i would if i had to say they, they have to you'd have to do something like that i think re restart the computer um, run the compiler with these these flags, something like that. You might need. To but spend. even there, we know that uh, I mean the companies were gaming exactly these benchmarks yeah. Yeah. because then they changed the driver to be specifically tailored to that one benchmark. Um, yeah, it's it's not that simple. <laughs> this is a really really tricky question. 
Yeah, so I think maybe a possible solution here might also be to do something like the Robotarium, which is like you also have like the same computing infrastructure where you then like use that to report any like timing numbers maybe. Yeah. So we are almost at the end um, of this. So maybe we ask one last question to both panelists, which is if you think about open source and reproducibility, especially in the context of controls, what would you like to see maybe, you know, next year at CDC? What can we do in the short term, I guess? Um, yeah. I, I think I think even conference papers should have as an expectation that source uh, source code that is used to generate plots should be should be released as part of the paper. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I, I is there uh, yeah is there yeah. reason not yeah, to have that? I mean, what what? Yeah, I don't know what the what the push what would be a reason not to have that as a requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely something I could support. Um, maybe something like the the NeurIPS checklist and requirement on yeah. releasing code. Yeah. That would be something that is really helpful. Um, we saw that now, uh, we, we have a paper at NeurIPS this week, and that checklist alone is a very strong incentive in submitting your code and getting it right and rethinking your paper, how it's actually written. And if enough of the information is provided to make it reproducible. Mm -hmm. So that simple checklist would be something that I think can make a difference and is already something that we could see next year. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that might help is maybe having, could be a small track for start, just uh, another track that actually allows reproducing results and showing that you can actually reproduce them. It's also something that we see in the machine learning community that they value reproducibility a bit higher in the sense that they allow the just to having the events and the stage for for that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great. I think this is a great way to finish. Um, we have clear lists to uh, things to do, like a, a NeurIPS checklist for control and maybe some kind of a track or session on reproducing results. So thanks so much for to both of you for joining virtually. And so now we have a one hour a lunch break and we come back to a set of um, in-person lightning talks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, it was great meeting you and sharing the panel with you. Yes, it was my pleasure that you had some fascinating thoughts. That was very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> well, I can give back awesome. the thanks for the cool talk. Thanks so much. That was pretty interesting. Thank you. Okay, can we get started? Okay, welcome back to the second part of um, this workshop. So this next theme is benchmarking and we have a brief introduction and then two sessions of lightning talks, um, one in person and for the other one, we have several people virtually joining and then there's a coffee break and afterwards, we have two more exciting invited talks and then a panel discussion with the speakers um, and finally some concluding remarks. So, uh, yeah, so save some some questions for the panel discussions. Um, and if you have time, we can also have a few questions for the uh, lightning talks. Okay, just um, if you haven't been here in the morning, so this is a workshop that um, um, my team 
most of the people here in the second row, Federico, Adam, Siki, Lucas, and Jacobo, they are all around here, um, have organized. And so if you have questions about the workshop or any, any follow-up um, ideas, don't hesitate to talk to them. My name is Angela Schellig, and co-organizers were also Jonathan Howe, um, Peter Korf, George Pappas, and Sandra Hirsch. And so, um, again, for those who haven't been here in the morning, a very quick um, summary. So the motivation for doing this workshop was that more and more um, controls approaches rely on computational tools, rely on more optimization, and rely on database methods. And um, we saw this when we um, wrote a review paper on safe learning in robotics, where roughly you know half of the approaches towards safe learning um, for robotics came from the controls community, and the other half from the reinforcement learning community. And um, and that shows how much the database approaches in control have also made it, you know, to robotics or uh, into the field of robotics. And um, when we saw this, we also noticed that it was very difficult to compare these algorithms. Um, most of the algorithms that we reviewed in the paper didn't have open source code and you know, the majority, the large majority was, has also not been tested on real hardware. And so we developed the safe control gym benchmark suit as a result of this, but we also looked more broadly into, you know, um, how many papers in the major controls, machine learning and robotics conferences are published with code and is publishing the code in some way impactful. And one way of impact um, is citations. Another way of impact is stars on GitHub. And so if you're interested in these statistics, you may want to have a look at the paper. But yeah, you definitely see a large discrepancy between how many papers, the percentage of papers that are published with code at the machine learning conference in Europe, in blue, um, in red, in robotics, and in green at the controls conference conferences and you know, the, the, the vertical axis here is um, logarithmic, right? So, um, and yeah, a quick summary. And I, I, I think we also saw, heard this from different speakers in the morning is if you, you can publish papers with code and they usually have a larger impact at least in number of citations. So, you know, the papers with code in all these three fields had more citations over the years than the, the average of the papers without code. Of course, you know, there could be other reasons um, that the people who generally are, um, you know, are better equipped teams have also the ability to publish the code and therefore it's not a direct correlation, but nonetheless, I um, think it's clear that papers with code generally had um, impact, broader impact. So we had the lunch social and just as a reminder, after after the workshops, if if you're around, you're happy to jointly go to um, a small bar to as a post workshop discussion and then go to the welcome reception afterwards. So now we have the first set of lightning talks in the afternoon. Um, and yeah, so the speakers can come come to the front, and yeah, if there's time, time we can have one or two questions after the lightning talks. Otherwise, um, we will have a coffee break um, to have questions. Are you touching mm -hmm. uh, So we'll have our first uh, set of lightning talks in the afternoon session, and the first talk is from. Uh, Hannah Krasowski from Technical University of Munich. And her talk will be on um, benchmarking for motion planning, showcasing combat growth and the um... yeah. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for having me. I'm Hannah. 
I'm representing the Cyberphysica Systems Group from Technical University of Munich. Um, Matthias Althoff is the professor of this group. And I will today talk about our, like we're developing um, software for uh, safe and robust control. And I will talk today about our most multifaceted tool, Common Road, which is a benchmarking, but also an open source um, platform. We have to go back to the next second. Ah, yeah, now it's working. Okay, so Common Road stands for Composable Benchmarks for Motion Planning on Roads. Um, this benchmark always consists of three parts. We always have a, we are dealing with autonomous driving and uh, yeah, driving scenarios. So we always have a scenario which represents our driving um, environment. We have a vehicle model and vehicle dynamics that um, unambiguously specify our vehicle and its dynamics. And we have a cost function, which we use to quantitatively evaluate in the end our solution. Then you would apply your motion planner, you generate a solution file that you can upload to our website where it's evaluated automatically and you're ranked with respect to the other submissions. To give you an idea, that's how an um, exemplary benchmark looks like or a scenario look, looks like, which is the most important part of the benchmark, I would say. We always have this planning problem consisting of at least one initial state and the goal region. And then uh, we also represent in the scenario the road network, the traffic participants, traffic lights. To show you the diversity of um, how what publicly available scenarios we provide, we really have different situations from urban driving to highway driving. Uh, here you can see a few solutions from uploaded. Um, so uploaded solutions and then the render scenarios uh, to it to like give you an idea how that uh, how a solution can look like. But uh, defining these benchmarks is really not enough. So um, that's just the baseline to yeah actually then compare different algorithms. So beyond that we provide three different types of open source software. Uh, one is motion planning utilities, then baseline motion planners, and we have creation, conversion, and interface tools. So to, I just want to shortly give you an example of each category. So for motion planning utilities, we recently published this Common Road Prime, where different types of criticality measures are implemented. For baseline motion planners, we have this Common Road RL, which is in reinforcement learning gym, uh, based on common road scenarios. So you can use that to evaluate your agent or you can use that to uh, also train your agent. And then finally, one important um, tool or simulation environment uh, which you encounter in autonomous driving is Kala. And we also, for example, providing Kala interface such that we can really interact with other open source and um, yeah, development that are out there. Um, I also shortly wanted to highlight what are important features that make a successful benchmark and really help to, yeah, um, that the community is also using the benchmark. Uh, I just want to highlight three of that. So what's very, very important is what we already heard multiple times today, that it's very open. So all the scenarios are publicly available on our website. You can download them. We have these different types of open source software, like baseline motion planners. And we not only provide the code, but we also provide extensive manuals and tutorials as well as an easy way to install them. So that would be my second very important highlight that it must be super easy to get started with it. We have usually Docker images and PyPy packages for our software and also tutorials to show how you could actually use the software. Um, and then finally, you need to develop a benchmark that's relevant. And um, so we um, publish different scenarios that are based on real traffic, but also very challenging um, uh, scenarios that were generated by false education or hand trusted uh, to really um, yeah, provide relevant benchmarks in the end. Uh, I want to summarize this with uh, the fact that this common road um, environment really is in a um, larger environment of tools we develop for safe control 
um, yeah, software. So on the left hand side, that are all uh, open source tools for benchmarking, but there are also like some baseline implementations for them. And on the right hand side, that is our reachability analysis tools. Um, so just to shortly introduce each of them, Common Ocean is inspired by Common Road and deals with motion planning on the water. We have this COBRA tool where you can configure different modular robots and do uh, motion planning with robotic manipulators. We are recently now starting a um, benchmarking um, environment for energy grids called Common Power. And then Cora um, implements a lot of different set-based reachability analysis algorithms. And AROC is based on it and using this set-based reachability analysis for um, optimal control implementations. So um, it would be great if you want to contribute to one of these projects or use them. And I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, so we have, for example, an interface or like um, there's this indie data set, which is commonly used. We have a converter for that. And I think there's also another other urban data set from um, China. I I'm not massively working on this, so I forgot the name right now, but yeah, there are different scenarios. Also from Munich, if you want to uh, do some scenarios in Munich. Yeah. Thank you. So then are all that based readability analysis algorithm. So that's the uh, core um, of core so it's, um yeah and we uh, have different algorithms implemented um but not oh, the set, uh, so we can deal with different representations of sets so we can use sonotopes or ellipsoids or polytopes or basically i guess most of the representations that are there yeah Uh, our second part is from the from the University of Tokyo, and the part is on the open source development of the University of Tokyo and the development of the Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jing Yeh I come from the uh, uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, the University of Tokyo. Today, I want to share with you the open source development of our group, the Utokyo Aero Robot Team. And we maintain all the code in one GitHub repository. So you will, you, you, if you want to try just to scan a QR code here. Wait. Okay, uh, here is my table of contents. My talk will generally include this point. Uh, first, please let me briefly introduce our group. Uh, the Utopio Aero Robot Team is led by Electro Moji Zhao. And uh, we are a very young group. I am actually the first doctoral student in our group. And uh, uh, the main research, research field of our group is Aero Robotics, especially the multi link Aero Robots that can change their shapes. Uh, the first generation of two-dimensional multi-link robot hydrous aggregating was developed at uh, 2016. Then this robot was modularized and uh, became hydrous. Then from here, there are two uh, evolutionary directions. The first direction is to uh, tilt the rotors and uh, then we get hydrous tilt and the uh, hydro sky. The other direction is to aid more deep, deep degree of freedom in joints and rotors. The first robot along this direction is the Dragon robot, which was developed in 2018. After that, uh, some work has been done by uh, decreasing or increasing the link number, including the protein arm and the 
spider. Uh, speak of controllers, the PIP control is the uh, most commonly used control method in our system. LQI is also used to dynamically change the control gain uh, because some robots will change the center of gravity when change their shape. Uh, and uh, recently, we're also trying to uh, use some uh, nonlinear control method, for example, nonlinear MPC. And by the way, we're, all, we're also trying to use Akados. So thanks for the uh, developers. Um, well, we hope to make our uh, robot system open source, uh, but our software is highly related to the hardware. So the challenge is how to make the whole system reproducible. Uh, first, let's talk about the high-level code, including the perception, planner, estimator, and outer loop controller. Uh, this part of code is relatively uh, easy to migrate between PC and the onboard computer because they're all run in uh, Ubuntu system. And uh, the solution for the physical part is also clear. Uh, we need two systems, one system for simulation and the other system for real-world implementation. So the challenge part is the middle level. Uh, the best solution is one code uh, that, that can be deployed in two systems. Uh, and uh, to achieve this goal, we will use different compiling tools in different hardware environments. Specifically, we will use CMake to make the code executable in the Ubuntu system. And when we want to do the real world experiment, we will use STM32 IDE to um, make, make, make the code executable in microcontroller. This design ensures that uh, uh, exactly the same software architecture is used no matter in simulation or the real world machine. Uh, we maintain all the code in one repository and just input these line of, lines of code the dependencies are automatically installed. Uh, then if you want to start, you can, you need to input this command, rose launch, the robot name, bring up dot launch, and uh, some pre parameters. Uh, then you need to start a Python script uh, to control the robot. And we make uh, the interface for all the robots the same. And more instructions can be found uh, in the wiki of our repos repository. Uh, now, okay, uh, now there are in total four robots formally supported. Mini Polar Rotor, Hydrus, Hydrus Guy, and the Dragon. Uh, just as I introduced before, uh, you, you need, need, need a new terminal to send the command and make the robot take off. And they're all sharing the same interface. And for some robots, for example, Dragon, uh, you can also start a new terminal and uh, uh, t command it to change the shape, uh, just like the video shows. It will change from a normal shape to Dragon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to make sure that our repository is always easy to use by beginners, uh, we will uh, regularly run some GitHub actions after each pull request and uh, commit, which is called continuous integration. In our test, um, we will assume that there will be a virtual user try to install the all the dependencies and uh, try some demos. And, uh, uh, in total, there are uh, three ROS versions are, te are tested. For developers, uh, CI will check the code compatibility with previous code. Uh, it, it also helps the fast implementation from simulation to re reality. Uh, and for users, uh, CI will make them always easy to use, no matter which ROS version they are using. And uh, in the future, uh, we want to make this system a general platform for multi-domains. And uh, because we have different kinds of robots, uh, we think it might be a good platform to test the general reality of different control algorithms. 
And we're also considering um, migrated the system to Roast. Okay, and that's all the content. Thanks for listening. I'm open to any questions. Yeah, thanks. I guess my question is, you do know our work makes us very accessible, but are there a lot of people who have the physical hardware other than your lab to like run this? I'm assuming there's not a lot of other driving robots yet in the world. Uh, I think there is only uh, two lab focused on this direction. Okay, so there is more than one. Yeah, yeah, just two. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that Okay, thank you. Our first talk is on the the Okay, awesome. So uh, I'm not Robert. Uh, Robert couldn't make it today. Uh, my name is Rohan. I'm a PhD student in the Autonomous Systems Lab at Stanford, advised by Professor Marco Pavone. Uh, help, uh, I will, you know, you'll have to make do with me today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers for organizing this amazing workshop. I've seen a lot of amazing stuff here today, and I hope uh, um, you know this uh, this work that we've been doing also fits in uh, here. Um, let me just change this quickly. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a flight simulator called Explain that Robert and I have been working on in our lab. Um, I want to stress here that Robert deserves a lot of credit for the work into the simulator that goes uh, in here, especially because he made all the videos that I'm going to show you in this talk. Um, I'll give a short overview of the simulation platform, the capabilities of our software, and problems that we ourselves are using the software for. Um, so, what is Explain? In essence, Explain is a video game. It's a flight simulator that you can buy on Steam and pretend to be a pilot with. And uh, what Explain is particularly well known for compared to other flight simulators is that Explain is renowned for the high fidelity of the dynamics and simulation and the components of the modeling. The quality is very high. Uh, you know, the simulator is routinely being quoted as the most realistic simulator out there. And so Explain offers us an opportunity to do realistic simulation of real aircraft, right? This is a model of a real Cessna in the video that is kind of stuttering on Zoom. And then uh, at real airports, this airport is a recreation of SFO, where uh, I came from yesterday. Um, and so we have been working to make Explain useful to con for control and robotics research, where our goals are really to leverage Explain towards a flexible, easy to use Python based simulation to offer real world dynamically challenging tasks to test controllers and leverage the graphics and the flexible scenario generation of the simulator to help advance the robustness of ML based control algorithms, right? We wanted a platform to do realistic control testing in academia. And, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of others, we are often guilty of testing on double integrators and planar quadrotors. And so could we graduate from, from, from this stage? Uh, we're not the first to pursue the use of explain and control. So as a brief timeline of what's happened here in 2017, some people at NASA wrote a plugin and Python client to interface with the game uh, to set, get and set data fields from the simulator data structures directly, which meant that any user needed to write some significant engineering plumbing to get an experiment going. And then in 2021, this Simulator was picked up by a number of groups, including uh, our group at Stanford and elsewhere as a part of a NASA university leadership initiative. Um, and they developed some infrastructure for vision-based aircraft taxiing at, at, at a single airport, which was a very narrowly scoped and not very extensible application. And so that's why we have now rewritten a lot of the simulation infrastructure to be more flexible. And hopefully the research that will happen on this platform will contribute to it towards a future of reliable, fully autonomous aviation, which I think is quite an exciting future application to be thinking about. So a brief description of the capabilities of the simulator, right? We're not just doing aircraft taxiing like in this 
video anymore. We now expose the full 12 degree of freedom dynamics model, black box dynamics model used by the simulator so that we can simulate full takeoff, taxiing, and landing operations using combinations of ground truth and vision for, for state estimation. And you can programmatically vary the environments. So you can vary weather, lighting, like time of day. You can change the airport, right? You use all the airports that have been implemented in the explained simulator already, as, a, as well as many different aircraft that you could use. Uh, just a quick list of some of the features that we have implemented for time. I won't go over all of them, but what I would like to stress is that we've tried to keep it similar to things that people would already be used to. So we can conveniently interact with the simulator through a Carla-like client object. Um, we expose the virtual cameras with software called OBS uh, to the user so you can easily get the, the images from Python. And then we provide some lightweight example scripts for setting up and running experiments and provide some utilities to log it and analyze experiment data. So what challenge task is this platform well-suited to test on, right? Dynamic, you know, flight is a very, challenging dynamics and control problem. And so by using the full aircraft dynamics for control, we'll get lots of interesting problems. For example, you know, the, the simulator will model things like ground effect. Um, since the this is essentially a video game, it runs as a separate uh, standalone piece of software. And so you need to write your controllers to be fast enough to do real-time real -time testing. Um, and then there's a number of realistic challenge uncertainties and disturbances that you can Think of developing, learning, and robust control algorithms for such as wind conditions, crosswinds, weather, altitude can affect handling, and you can even inject control faults into the system. We are also very interested in the interplay of perception and control. So we can define onboard cameras and stream the vision uh, for control in real time. And you know, you can think of doing things like interleaving vision and some kind of ground truth to, to simulate other sensors like corrupt, you know giving ground truth velocity and information corrupted with some noise and you get both position for vision and, and so forth. Um, you know, early examples of things that we've been using this simulator for is for example, fine tuning uh, ResNet to do runway position estimation. And I think here we immediately realized that doing something on a more real world simulator is immediately very valuable because you can see that the quality of the estimation is worse when you're further away from the runway, right? It's really hard to accurately measure that when you're far away. So. Does that mean that we should work a bit more on more interesting disturbance models like heteroscedastic noise and things like that? Um, a major research effort that we have started to work on is on building out of distribution robustness of ML enabled systems, where the main idea is that the ML models that you use for things like vision are only as good as the data that they were trained on. And eventually a robot will encounter scenarios that were somewhat different from the training data in a, in a real world environment and the models will perform poorly on that. So, you know, we've been doing things where we train on nominal weather conditions and uh, ask, can we detect and then avoid failures when the ML model degrades? For example, when it suddenly starts raining and you see the aircraft sort of interrupts and aborts the landing in, in this scenario. And actually we'll be presenting a paper on this as a shameless plug on, on Friday. So I hope you all uh, come to that also. Um, yeah, briefly to talk about future improvements and things that we are thinking about going uh, directions that we think about going with, with the simulator and some of the limitations is that in collaboration with some researchers at Georgia Tech and MIT Lincoln Labs, um, we're collaborating because they were working on using the simulator for ground handling problems. And so we want to add the ability to programmatically place objects and other ground handling vehicles in the scene to do things like detecting and avoiding debris on the, on the landing strip. Um, we're thinking about some some small uh, to dos like re-implementing experiment statistics tracking using tools like weights and biases. So it's very convenient if you're running many experiments. I think a limitation of the simulator is that under the hood it is a video game, and so we found that the sim speed is limited by the single CPU core performance of your computer. So with a good one, we've been able to achieve max three x real time simulation, but I think that makes it probably pretty difficult to take the similar to do closed loop RL training using, using this simulator. Uh, to get started with the simulator, please go to the link on the slide or scan the QR code here. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions. Do I need to buy the video game before I can use your simulator? 
Yes. Is it expensive? Twenty dollars, I oh, think. Something. When I bought it, it was twenty dollars. Okay. Maybe it was on sale. I don't remember, but yeah, it, it's less than for sure, less than less than less than hundred dollars, and I think it was less than fifty. Yeah. So I think by the time that I finish my PhD, there's not going to be real airplanes. <laughs> but um, I think this is probably difficult, and and the the simulator as close as you're going to get to a real aircraft as a as a student. But I know that at uh, NASA, the aeronautics division does do testing with real aircraft and control algorithms. So, you know, there is future scope. We are not planning on this currently. Well, Professor, do you still use uh, software limit for uh, implementation of open source uh, autopilot, like I before, uh, and the No. Do you want to try other The question is, can we run things like our new plane and the explore and things like that. Open source you could device. probably set it up to do that, but that is not currently part of it. Um, we have not written interfaces for things like that. This was purely like a, um, you could think of it as being close to an open AI gym API conforming system. Would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to work on that, yeah. let me know. <laughs> This is it all right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Armin, and on behalf of my colleagues Patrick and our supervisor, Basan Mazi Saeed, I will uh, talk to you about the stability and stability in our uh, domain, the cybersecurity mobility lab. Um, the domain we are working on is uh, EAD, so connected and autonomous uh, missions. And uh, how you would develop in this domain is usually either working with simulation environments or with real world uh, setups. Yeah, the left side uh, has some downsides. It's quite unreal, it can be quite unrealistic. You can have um, uh, a hard time modeling every aspect of the real world, especially in the physics. Uh, however, it's more easy to publish. Uh, if you have a setup, you can, of course, share it with others, and then it's more easy to replicate. Uh, today we heard about platforms like code ocean. Uh, yeah, we actually also use. Well, and on the other side, um, reward tests are great, but um, it's also Professor Ivashev mentioned they are very expensive, hard to maintain, and also come with a lot of security. Uh, for example, example um, communication uh, uncertainties or uh, want to synchronize the agent. They can always start at the same point when uh, when they start to uh, compute their algorithms. Yes, and to fill in this gap in between, uh, we developed a part of the visibility lab, also the PM lab, uh, which tries to combine both the drug and from both sides. Uh, maybe as a disclaimer in advance, so everything, of course, we use the work that we might have left already um, fully open source. Uh, we published blueprints to the lab, so we could basically rebuild it. Um, there's also the code available on GitHub, and uh, we have uh, several code materials. Um, it's where you can use uh, for the educational uh, courses. And uh, of course, we also use uh, Code Ocean when we publish stuff on Microsoft Lead and can directly link it. And uh, with the click of a button, then you can make it to the other uh, programs. Yeah. yeah, this right here is outside of the community today. Um, right now, I think nine or 10 users are driving around. They are actually driving randomly and trying to avoid each other. Uh, maybe to give you a better idea of the dimensions, this is the, the room itself. It's on a scale of 1 to 18. So they are really nice for like one and a half meters. And to face some of the challenges I mentioned earlier, we use the service oriented software architecture in some abstraction layer um, to, for instance, provide a reducible result by synchronizing the agents uh, each time the um, experiment is started. Yeah, the scenario itself is independent from the map you see in here. Um, the picture uh, printed and can be exchanged 
easily we also have a green screen to uh, modify um, the graph and um, we also do provide mixed traffic uh, so right here in the corner there's a steering wheel um, where a human can interact um, with the system this would actually look like this kind of Okay. Um, it is quite fast, I can tell you that. Uh, so we did some inspections on the control, uh, otherwise the humans would not keep up with the uh, vehicles. And uh, yeah, this is the ego perspective uh, for several projects we are working on. Okay, let's speak about accessibility. So having this lab is great, then, but um, they're seeing it as a resource, of course, and you need to find a free time slot to use it. Uh, you have to travel to the test bed. Um, I can tell you, Aachen is quite far away from here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this might take some time, and then you will need to get technical briefings, uh, organizational issues, like insurance and stuff. And uh, on top of all that, uh, the pandemic caused, even for us, that we can't, uh, wasn't able to use it at some point in time. Yeah, and to overcome the limitations, uh, we have the idea to uh, create a remote access. To go there. Um, the project was became remote. And um, within this development cycle, you could access the lab from anywhere around the world. And actually, I uh, today want to show you how to do that. Um, so I brought uh, the website with me. The registration process is very short. You can uh, start right away, and then you would be provided with some uh, exemplary projects. Um, so the time for you to get registered and run the first experiment would be like a minute. Um, the one you saw in the video is the Satchel Routing example, and this part right here is uh, quite interesting. So we will provide you the uh, necessary computational resources, um, so it's independent from the hardware. Um, this is great, so it also provides everyone with the same amount of um, computational power and uh, allows uh, for more comp comparability. So you would request the session, and if not all of you do it at the same time, you would get a session. Uh, of course, we are limited there. And then, uh, for instance, you could um, specify the amount of vehicles you uh, want to run, the duration of the experiment, um, the code I already chosen, and you could start it. You would get a presentation on um, the experiment. These are the planned trajectories. There's the possibility to plot data with uh, tables or graphs, um, also add an additional box, um, and there's the console. Um, if you want to change anything, you of course can download the project and modify it in your editor, or you use the inbuilt editor, which also um, provides like the basic functionalities that the editor does, the data and stuff like that. And um, yeah. This is like the simulation environment. Um, why I'm showing you this is um, the, uh, the the main part to it is the uh, connection to the real world, and this is done by in two ways. You either can submit your experiment, then it takes maybe one or two days uh, so it gets executed, or you can use a real time connection. Uh, and this is what I'm doing right now. So I made a deal with my colleague. He stood up quite early um, to turn on the lab for us. Um, and then you would get this uh, view where in the middle you can see a webcam connecting uh, to the lab right now in Aachen. The dark block right here is uh, part of the project to uh, set the surface layer and we can put it away. And now you can see the users are with their real IDs and their positions right there in the lab. And if I say uh, run right now, everything you see now is the real time data and not the simulation. Uh, on the video? Yes. I told them to go into the corner and wait. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, you wait. Probably going to sleep after this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Right. I stopped so you can know it's over. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, what can you do with this? So we have several applications that you can start right away with. The one is the motion planning um, competition uh, where we use the real world database like in the around uh, provide you a set of uh, easy complex tasks. 
but to solve. And if you are interested in it, uh, you could start right away um, for the training of the algorithm. And by April of May, uh, the trials are uh, set, so you would then need to submit your code. Um, this one is addressed more to researchers. The other one is uh, rather for students. Um, but if you are interested in the educational part, uh, I would like to invite you to my talk on Friday, um, where I will present the CTM Academy, um, which uh, yeah, an open source code everyone can use, where the package will be so implemented based on uh, the professional problem. Yeah, and to conclude, I brought uh, the most important pictures. Um, I had to talk for this session. Uh, actually, both are possible. So there are various ways to perform the vehicle. Uh, you could use direct commands or the library we are providing, then it would be the back, um, trajectory command. Um, everything is on C++. Um, so there's a main loop where um, you are notified about the correct state of the uh, system, and then you will need to um, coordinate your agents. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, we give some points uh, to start to follow them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about the resolution of how and I'm just concerned about the wild things that comment. One way out of those wild things is just a few ones that you give at the beginning, and we would have no more of this and commonly comment that we get. So, here we have a pre layered architecture. Um, on the high level um, controller, you would get um, sent a point. You can send them uh, in, in advance, and then uh, on the low level, there's a uh, Controller getting this point and calculating everything in between. So the user don't need to deal with every uh, point in time. Uh, this is done with the uh, controller by the company. Is there a way to switch the uh, It is. Yes, that's the need also possible. So that's one of the ways to control it. Um, like for the CPM Olympics or the Academy, you wouldn't want to do that because that increases the difficulty uh, a lot. But yes, it is basically possible. And maybe I should also mention so the CPM Remote project is uh, with C++, but you could also go uh, and uh, install the software on your own and with Smart Lab, which is maybe uh, more better side. Yeah. 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 And I hope you'll wrap up this session. Uh, thank you again for the Now we'll have another set of speakers. Yeah, we'll have a, no, we have one live. Uh, Enrique Sor uh, Soria from uh, CERN, I think will be giving a presentation next. Yes, the mic. Yeah. Is the same okay with this? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erika Soria, and I'm working as a mechatronics engineer at CERN. CERN, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, European Center for Nuclear Research. And we do uh, fundamental research on particle physics. Uh, at CERN, we have uh, different types of accelerators where particles are made accelerate and heat together to produce new particles and then uh, certain properties are observed in order to infer um, these properties as well as properties of matter. So you may, may wonder what this has to do with the CBC. Uh, actually, there's a lot of engineering work behind uh, to this physics experiment and specifically I'm working the uh, controls, electronics and mechatronics group. As a group, uh, we have different responsibilities at CERN. One is, oh, sorry, you want to visualize this idea? Next one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Just a bit of delay. Sorry. Uh, so we, uh, we do the, we implement, design and implement the mechatronic systems which go into the accelerator machine. Uh, 
Uh, among these, we have the collimators, which are the system uh, which has to have to clean all the particles surrounding the beam so that the beam is as focused as possible and as clean as possible to maximize the number of collisions in the experimental area. We also do the uh, boards or the cards for the low-level uh, control uh, for accelerators, transfer lines, and experimental areas as well. And as a more recent activity, we also design and uh, operate the robots for uh, remote inspection and maintenance of radioactive areas. Basically, the idea is uh, to avoid sending humans in radioactive areas uh, and instead sending robots. And the, um, the device you see uh, on top, uh, on the right, is the collimator, which I was mentioning before. There are linear ones and rotational ones. This is the rotational one. Uh, which means that there's a, a piezo acti actuator uh, rotating a, a stage, a mechanical piece supporting a crystal, and then the crystal has to channel the particles towards a beam, uh, towards a dump where uh, just particles can be uh, expelled from, from the major uh, trajectory. And the position of the crystal or rotational position of the crystal is uh, measured with uh, interferometric heads. Well, this is to give you an overview of the activities that we do. Uh, and I said that we also provide instrumentation for all the experimental areas. So here I show you one, which is called high rat mat, high radiation materials, where we do collide the beam with materials and see uh, measure different uh, uh, physics properties, as well as, as we move some uh, components around in order to make them uh, heat or not the beam. Um, so you can just see here some of the uh, usual sensors and actuators we use. Um, so the major challenge that we have in controls is that we very often want to uh, rapidly prototype some, some control algorithms and test them. And of course, if we have uh, MathWorks available, it's very easy with Simulink to just create a couple of blocks connecting them, but actually, uh, we would like to be more open source also as a mission. CERN has the, uh, let's say, one of the mission is to share the knowledge with the partner countries uh, funding CERN. So we would like to have that, but open source. Um, and also, uh, actually, uh, with Simulink, what's also, what can be hard is the connection with all the most recent Python libraries, which is not direct. Uh, instead, we want to be uh, we want to be able to uh, integrate that directly uh, within uh, our software. Uh, moreover, uh, as usual, we want the software to be modular, maintainable, and uh, we would like to have it uh, impacting uh, impacting a larger community than just CERN itself. Uh, so, uh, the solution that we are developing is called NodeEdge.io. It's a graphic programming software but it's written in Python. And so it's directly Python compatible, meaning that you can, uh, in theory, very easily plug, uh, plug all the Python libraries to it. Just need to program a graphic interface for that. So this is what we're, we are doing. We've already uh, implemented, we spent a lot, uh, lot of effort implementing uh, routines for the automatic generation of blocks so that we don't have to uh, hard code A plus B equal to A plus B. But uh, we have routines that taken the inputs of a function and the function itself can generate a block, a graphic block representing that function. So we plan in the next months to uh, have uh, populate many more uh, libraries than we have now. And we are trying to follow CI CD standards, uh, modern standards uh, with GitHub actions. Um, so there are two components to the software. There's the graphic editor, as much as Simulink provides the graphic editor part, but there's also a visualizer, uh, which is the, let's say, if we have to make um, a comparison with uh, LabVIEW, that would be Diadem, where we can open different files, compare different runs, and uh, import different uh, data formats. Uh, in the main editor, you can connect blocks, uh, and then you have a simulation mode, uh, which is very basic, but we plan to, to pro provide more uh, integration methods uh, very soon. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see all the different blocks, and on the right side, you can see the parameters of your node and change them 
to your needs. This is the graphic uh, data analyzer part, the component. Uh, for now, you cannot yet directly import the data that you generated from the simulator, but this is on ongoing work. Uh, the idea finally is not only to be able to import any kind of data from other types of software, uh, or at least the most common uh, data formats uh, used in robotics and control, but also to directly input the data that you generated from the simulation itself uh, within Knowledge. Um, this uh, data analyzer has been de designed with uh, interactivity in mind, so you can easily drag and drop curves, you can edit signals, and save your configuration and even export the new data that you generated. Uh, and as an example of an application, Maybe the data visualizer part is a bit more mature than the editor itself. So uh, during operation, it was very hard to find the right parameters for this device, which is a laser Doppler vibrometer, in order to measure the uh, vibrations of the targets hit by the beam. Uh, since the uh, intensity of the beam would raise with time, we couldn't configure it prior to the um, experiment because we wouldn't know exactly what um, uh, kind what range of vibrations we uh, we could expect and very often simulation data don't match reality so when we ask the users to give us some ranges very very often they're off uh, so what we did is to directly retrieve the data with ni hardware a pxi uh, that would come as a tdms file then we were able to import all the different files from the different runs visualize them interact with the graph and find uh, quickly the parameters that we needed to set. And of course, this is just one uh, use case that, it, that I just described, but there's uh, still a lot of work ahead. And uh, some of the, let's say on the wish list, there's a fact of integrating the a user database so that we can uh, store, let's say we can have account and people could in, in potentially even collaborate on the same project, which would be uh, very nice, actually, if uh, people could leave comments on different types of blocks uh, so that, uh, yeah, basically it would let people work together on the same model without synchronizing on another channel like Slack on the side or something like that. Um, also, as I said, uh, on the wish list, there's also adding many more libraries and potentially uh, the next one on the list would be the Python control library. So I'll probably get in contact with the speaker of this morning who's very interested in having a GUI uh, for Python control. And for the uh, data analytics part, it would be very nice to also be able to connect to uh, cloud, uh, to the cloud in order to retrieve data and directly stream the data so that we can get, um, they can get plugged directly to the main editor. And with this, I conclude. And uh, if you have any applications in mind uh, for the software, I'm very happy to get in contact with you, with you. If you want to contribute, then the project is in GitHub. Uh, it's a node edge, uh, It's called Node Edge under the Node Edge domain, so it's very easy. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy uh, if somehow this can be useful. Uh, to a larger community, so you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, or no problem. One question if there is one. Okay. How do you envision this to be used in the future? Like that? Uh, for me, what's annoying in Simulink is that it's really hard to make it compatible with, uh, as I said, Python libraries. And also being it open, uh, closed source, it's kind of hard to, uh, or, well, it's even impossible to just change things as they are. So as I was saying before, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was as I was using Simulink and the ROS toolbox in order to uh, control several drones, but just the the ROS interface was too slow in MathWorks, uh, so I had to switch and to re-implement everything from scratch in Python. So this would be directly compatible with many open source uh, libraries that exist already for control robotics, etc. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Speaker. And so next, uh, we have a virtual talk um, from Michael uh, Bocello from Technical Innovation Institute. Um, and we'll put that video on just next. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what things we can put. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Bozello, and I'm here to present our latest work, a drone racing data set that we called Race Against the Machine. We recorded it at the Technology Innovation Institute of Abu Dhabi, in particular at the Autonomous Robotics Research Center. But first thing first, what is drone racing? Drone racing is an e-sport where pilots drive a quadcopter through a series of portals that we call gates, like the one you can see at the left. And then pilots try to complete the three-dimensional track as fast as possible. The idea of the dataset is to support the development of autonomous drones that could possibly be the best human pilots. Of course, the aim is not just entertainment but is to push forward the technologies of autonomous drones. In this, drone racing is an ideal benchmark to measure performances as you face complex aerodynamics and an important sim-to-real gap. As core features of our dataset, we have fast and aggressive flights up to almost 21 meters per second and both autonomous and human piloted flights. Those flights have been performed on two trajectories, a lemniscuit and an ellipse. We then have high resolution, high frequency data with slow jitters. And in particular, we have visual data from the RGB camera, inertial data from the flight controller, and, G and, and six degree of freedom pose from the motion capture system. For the RGB images, we provide labels for the gate detection in the form of bounding boxes, but we also provide coordinates for the gate's internal corners in form of key points. The dataset is then completed with the recording of control inputs and battery voltages. As you can see, this dataset is really versatile, and we hope it could be a one-stop resource for pursuing multiple lines of work, including scene understanding, vision inertial odometry, mapping, planning, and data-driven control. Several drone racing datasets existed already, so why developing a new one? To the best of our knowledge, this is the first dataset having in-flight gate labels from non-synthetic images. And this is also the first dataset that marry RGB high-frequency non-synthetic images with IMU, mockup, gate positions, and other data. All of them acquired from high-speed flights. On the other hand, our dataset lacks the presence of complex sensors, like the stereo camera or the event camera. This is because the human pilots use only an RGB camera to control the drone. And so we believe that this will be the case also for the future of autonomous racing and autonomous drones. To ensure reproducibility, we also released the full design of the drone used to collect the data. Uh, and it includes the bill of material, the 3D models, and the building tutorial. We also released the code that we used as a reference controller during the autonomous flights and the parameters of the flight controllers, in particular, the parameters of beta flight. We also hope that this platform could spread in the autonomous robotic community as it has important features like holding an, a powerful embedded computer, uh, so an Orin NX, while still able to achieve high agility and speed, in particular speed up to 179 kilometers per hour. Also, this platform allows for both autonomous and piloted flights without any changes in the hardware. The dataset is composed by 24 flights, 12 autonomous and 12 piloted, piloted and uh, for each one we have 6 ellipses and 6 lambdascape. This is due to the 6 settings we had, so combining the 3 settings of brightness and the 2 settings of, settings of the camera. In particular for the brightness we had dark, medium and bright, 
in terms of environment brightness. And for the camera, we had two settings, auto exposure and fixed exposure. As for the camera settings, the trade-off is between the image uh, brightness and the um, motion blur while passing the gates. We released both raw and interpolated data. For the raw data, we released the raw specs and the single CSVs dumped from all the data sources, including the flight controller, the camera, and the mock-up system. To simplify data usage, we released also time-synchronized comprehensive CSVs containing all the data interpolated to either the camera timestamps or fixed frequency timestamps. In the second case, each row indicates the image with the closest timestamp. Images and labels are instead released in zip files. To give you a glimpse of the recorded data, you can see on the right the columns of the comprehensive CSVs, which includes the timestamps, corresponding images, IMU data, the commanded channels, the battery voltages, the drone pose from mockup, the velocities, the gate pose, and the corners coordinates. Along with the data, we released some supporting scripts, a couple of scripts for visualization, one, one to visualize the data and one to visualize the labels. We also provide the camera calibration and some scripts that can uh, elaborate the data, for example, to be used as standard bags, uh, ROS bags, uh, or to interpolate the data uh, at an arbitrary frequency. We also release the code that we use for the camera calibration and the code used, as I said before, uh, for the control of the autonomous flights. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope the community will enjoy and uh, find useful this work. So are there any questions we have? We might try and uh, contact them. Hello, Michael, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Are there any questions for Michael? We got one here. I can repeat it to you if you can't hear it. Okay. Is that the racing here? Like, can you get it to 20 meters a second in that space? Okay. So the <laughs> so they're very impressed by how tight and how fast you fly. So is that picture there the real place where you fly that quickly? Yes, it is. It is the indoor arena we used. Have you had any impressive uh, crashes? Yes, yeah, it's like I can. Yes, quite a lot. So before reaching the level we are now and that we used for recording the data set, we had very impressive crashes. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. But you can ask, tell that actual size. It's a bit bigger than the Okay. 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 Um, in the interest of time, we'll keep going. But thank you very much for joining us, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, our next virtual presentation is from Tim Saltzman at the Technical University of Munich, and he'll be presenting on neural MPC, which should be very cool. He's not here to join us virtually, unfortunately. Singapore from Germany, and thanks for joining my talk today. I will present our work, Real-Time Neural MPC, Deep Learning Model Predictive Control for Quadrotors and Agile Robotic Platforms. But instead of just focusing on the method, I will focus on how this research project was enabled by open source software in the first place and how it eventually led to new open source software. I am Tim, currently a PhD at both TU Munich and Google DeepMind. Today, I mostly want to give praise to fantastic open source software from other researchers, which enabled my research, especially highlighting what makes them great open source software. In the second part, I will outline how ML Kasadi was developed to enable real-time neural MPC. ML Kasadi eventually led to Alpha Kasadi, which my colleague John already presented this morning. Neural MPC builds on the work data-driven MPC for quadrotors from Davide Skarmutsa's lab out of Zurich, 
I was immediately interested in enhancing their approach using Gaussian processes with deep neural networks. The code was open source on GitHub and, even more importantly, reproducible on multiple levels. While providing code to run their work on real-world hardware and within an advanced simulation environment, they, most importantly, provided a simple simulation environment purely in Python without hardware or software dependencies. So, with a simple git clone command, you have a working prototyping environment. Agilicious, which includes Agisim, was open sourced from the same group earlier this year. Agilicious is a hardware and software framework tailored to autonomous agile quadrotor flight, which means it is an open source manual to build the Agilicious quadrotor hardware platform. Further, it includes the necessary software to make it fly. It also includes the simulation platform Agisim. Agisim is a high fidelity quadrotor simulation which allows you to test control algorithms as close as possible to real world conditions without actually having to fly with real hardware. Agilicious includes an open source hardware platform where detailed build instructions are available. Further, onboard software and low-level controller are ready to go. Most importantly, the Agilicious hardware platform and Agisim are interchangeable via ROS. If an algorithm works in the simulation environment, you can connect the hardware to the same ROS network and just switch over. So, thanks to previous open source frameworks and research, we are able to start from a working prototyping code base, a high fidelity simulation environment, and a working hardware platform that can seamlessly connect to the same infrastructure as the simulation. So, what is real time neural MPC and how does clever software architecture solve a research problem? This will be a bit simplified, but basically, real time neural model predictive control replaces parts of the dynamics model with a learned neural network. The main problem faced is that even very small networks naively rebuilt in Casadi using matrix multiplication and simple activation functions within Casadi are still too slow to be run as, as a dynamic model in MPC with a frequency above 100 Hz. The solution is theoretically simple but not straightforward from the software side. We realize that local approximations of the learned dynamics model around MPC's multiple shooting nodes is sufficient during optimization. This enables us to parallelize first or second order approximation generation around all shooting node states in PyTorch on a GPU and pass the local approximation to Casadi or Carlos. The resulting software package ML Casadi enables this entire process with a few lines of Python code. Using this method and ML Casadi to implement it, we are able to increase the size of our networks we can run in a real-time window within our specific MPC setting by a factor of a thousand. While ML Casadi solves the specific problem of model predictive control to model aerodynamic effects for flying quadrotors, we realized there is a general demand for learned models within Casadi based optimization procedures. This results in learning for Casadi, which generalizes to include all possible PyTorch models directly in a Casadi graph. The specific ML Casadi capabilities are included as a subset in L4 Casadi. L4 Casadi enables all sorts of cool applications such as motion planning within neural radiance fields or efficient navigation within a turbulent flow where the flow dynamics are learned by a neural network. My colleague John did a presentation this morning dedicated to L4 Casadi. So if you want to know more details, feel free to check out the recording. Or check out the L4 Casadi GitHub. With that, I wish you all a fantastic CDC conference. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Tim. And uh, our final virtual presenter will be Spencer Titart uh, from our actually our own lab at University of Toronto. Um, and he will be he won't be able to join us virtually, but uh, we'll watch his presentation. Accessible sim to real for benchmarking and hands on education. This is you. You are a passionate researcher who develops amazing reinforcement learning planners for drones. Your algorithms work very well in the simulated environments you have set up. The issue is, as soon as you implement your code on a real drone, nothing behaves as expected, causing you frustration. This is the problem of sim to real transfer, and it is the problem that our work hopes to address. We propose a zero-shot sim to real pipeline specifically for the Crazy Fly quadcopter. Our work builds on the existing Safe Control Gym simulation environment. The software is built and maintained by the Dynamic Systems Lab. It implements physics-based simulation for quad rotors in a single agent configuration. While all the work shown today is in the Safe Control Gym simulator, we are also re-implementing our work in the Gym PyBullet Drones repository, as the latter more easily supports multi-agent systems. Crazy Flies are quadcopters built with research in mind. They are lightweight, easily expandable, and have an open source firmware stack. This has made them a popular choice of platform for researchers around the world. The Crazy Swarm package, released in 2017 by USC, further extends the functionality of Crazy Flies by enabling multi drone control. The package provides support for motion capture systems, a ROS wrapper, and Python bindings for select firmware features. In Safe Control Gym, the focus is on low-level control and the user provides as input the force applied to each motor of the quad rotor. The primary issue with this input mapping is when you train learning-based models or tune non-learning-based models in this environment, a remapping needs to be done for the algorithm to function with high-level control interfaces used in the real world. This remapping may change the effectiveness of the model. This is where our work comes in. We aim for zero-shot sim to real transfer between Safe Control Gym and Crazy Fly drones. We do this by creating Python bindings to the Crazy Fly firmware that includes all val value-altering firmware functions. We further provide a Safe Control Gym API that is identical to Crazy Swarms. What this allows is for the code and module models to be trained or tuned in simulation with both the Crazy Swarm API and the Crazy Fly firmware in the loop. Essentially, software in the loop of the embedded C firmware in a fully Pythonized simulation environment. Our system has two parts. The first is PyCF firmware, which provides extended Python wrappings for the Crazy Fly firmware. As accessibility is paramount to our values and our work, we have built and tested the bindings on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The wrapper contains firmware functions that change the value of a command, this includes the onboard controllers, the emergency checking systems, the planners, and the sensor data handlers. We also wrap the high-level commander module, which gives access to high-level commands such as take off, go to, and land. There are several parts of the firmware we have chosen not to include in our wrapper, as their functionality appears to have little effect on sim to real transfer. We do not include the firmware communication protocols, as we assume that signals are sent at a constant frequency. We do not include the calibration modules, as simulated data can be read perfectly without the need to explicitly account for bias in our sensors. We do not include most of the hardware drivers. Lastly, we do not include the onboard state estimation pipeline, as we assume access to a motion capture system. Without motion capture, degraded performance in SimTriol is to be expected. The second part of our pipeline is the firmware wrapper class in the Save Control Gym package. This is the class that enables copy-paste controller design to facilitate the work of students and researchers. It has an identical interface in Safe Control Gym as real-world drone controllers have with Crazy Swarm. While ROS nodes can certainly be designed around this package, it is not a requirement. With this pipeline, we began testing in-house with samp sample controllers we designed. After achieving an average error of 5 cm throughout flown trajectories between sim and real life, we decided the package was ready for external users. We used the package to evaluate real-world performance of controllers designed for the Safe Robot Learning Competition hosted at IROS in 2022. The video on screen is one of the submissions from this competition. 
The pipeline left the research sphere and saw benefits in education in a graduate level course at the University of Toronto's Aerospace Institute. The course saw students design planning algorithms in simulation and evaluate their algorithms on real drones. This application really highlights the use case for this code. The students were able to fully focus on algorithm design without having to worry about the sim to real transfer. With each of the external testers, we have been able to refine the system to improve accessibility and identify some of its shortcomings. As the primary benefit is the system's ease of use, we see this work being broadly applicable in both education and research scenarios where high performance control is not the research objective. Finally, we also want to highlight the system's limitations. First and foremost is that we have noticed that as maneuvers become more and more aggressive, the gap between sim to real increases. We believe this could be accounted for by tuning noise parameters in the simulated environment, but this is not provided by default. Our system does not currently support multi-agent systems, but we are actively developing this and will be releasing it alongside the Jim Pybullet drone sim to real release. Our system only considers Crazy Fly drones and does not generalize to other platforms. As mentioned earlier, our system performs best in environments with a motion capture system. If you would like more information about our system, or would like to try it yourself, the project repository and a preprint for the IROS 2022 competition are linked here. I would like to take some time to thank my collaborators on this work, Jacopo Penerati and Wenda Zhao from the Dynamic Systems Lab, thanks to Professor Angela Scholeg for supervising this work, and to all the users and testers of our package, the R&D team from Ecuman Labs in Argentina, the UTSC team from China, H2, a robotics student team from Singapore, and all of the Aero 1217 students from the University of Toronto. Without these contributors, this work would not be possible. Thank you for listening. So that's the end of this session, and we'll have a 20-minute coffee break, I believe we have budgeted, and then we'll be back for our two speakers, um, Cheng Li Lui and, uh, and Tony Raffin, and then we'll have a panel discussion between the two. Uh, so yeah, come back in about 20 minutes. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So well, welcome back, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, Anthony Raffin. Anthony is a research, a research engineer with the German um, Aerospace Center, DLR. He's interested in include robotics and reinforcement learning, and uh, he has been leading several open source projects uh, focused on benchmarking robotic uh, reinforcement learning for robotics, including Stable Baseline 3 and RL Baseline 3 Zoo. Uh, these are projects that um, they have hundreds of parts, uh, thousands of stars that have been used by thousands of researchers, myself included. And they are uh, one of, if not the go to re open source uh, resource implementation of uh, deeper enforcement learning algorithms. Uh, this is my third time uh, listening to a talk by Anthony, uh, a couple of times, uh, three years back in, uh, in ICRA. Uh, but this is the first time since the release of uh, Stable Basin 3 2, 2.0 a few months back. And so I'm very eager to discover what he's about to present. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So <clears throat> today I would like to talk, um, my talk is going to be uh, the intersection between software engineering and reinforcement learning. And um, Can you make full screen? Uh, we, we are seeing your browser, maybe. Yeah, it's, 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 it's intended for now. I, I would make it full screen. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I would like to talk about practical tips for reliable reinforcement learning. And yeah, uh, what I want just to show is if you want to follow along and have all the links, it's already available on my website. So, um, and, and you can you can see it now. Now you should should see it uh, full screen. Yes, perfect. OK, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I've already been presented. I'm um, uh, working at the German Aerospace Center and my research is all about applying reinforcement learning directly on real robot. And this uh, implies for me that I also maintain the stable design library. Um, so let's start with a bit of motivation. Um, and, and the first thing I, I would like to, I mean, remind you, if you don't know already about it, is that reinforcement learning is hard. So let's say you're trying to compare algorithm A and B. So here on the left, 
you've run several experiments for quite uh, some time, so here on uh, 10 million uh, time steps, and you are comparing the performance. And looking at the learning curve here, you would say that A should be better than B because um, it learns faster and it learn and it reaches a higher score than B. Uh, the truth is, and this is a real experiment, uh, A and B is the exact same algorithm, but it's even worse than that. It's the exact same code with the same hyperparameters. The only difference is it is the epsilon parameter, which is a value to avoid division by zero uh, in the optimizer. So normally this value is only meant to avoid division by zero, but here it has actually a great impact on the performance. So in RL, small details and implementation can have great impact in performance. So you need to be extra careful when you implement and when you use uh, RL algorithms. And, and that's why actually I spent quite some time uh, trying to have reliable uh, implementation. Um, so this is the outline of today. I'm going to present a bit how do we manage to have reliable implementation using Stable Baseline 3. Um, then I will talk about a, a similar project, which is going together with Stable Baseline 3, which is the RSU. Um, and I will talk about how do we make sure that we have reproducible experiments. And of course, everything that I'm presenting is using RL as an example, but I think it, it should be applicable to any uh, empirical science. Uh, I will then give some tips on implementing a new algorithm and finish with a technique that I'm using more and more, which is having a minimal implementation. I will also give some links for best practices for empirical uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so if you don't know already about it, Stable Bezat 3 is a set of reliable reinforcement learning implementation. Uh, we provide many algorithms, many state-of-the-art algorithms, and all through uh, easy-to-use interface API, uh, so that in three lines of code, you can already declare uh, your agent, train it on the custom task, and then query it uh, quickly for um, action once it's trained. But the main thing about the library is we ensure that we provide reliable implementation. But why do I mean by reliable? So one thing, of course, is that we uh, benchmark our implementation and test them against published results. So we, we spent quite some time um, making sure that we can reproduce the result from original paper. Um, and, and we actually found some um, hidden tricks while doing so. We try also to follow software engineering best practices by having a high code coverage. So code coverage is um, the percentage of line of, of your code, which is covered by at least one test. Uh, we uh, type our code and check it statically here using MyPy. In terms of tests, we usually uh, decompose them into three types of tests. We have what I call run tests, which is just checking that the code runs without any error. It doesn't mean that it's doing what you want. We have unit tests, which is a um, much smaller test, but checking a specific feature and checking that the result is exactly what uh, we want and checking that uh, the small component is, is doing what is expected. And finally, and I will show an example in the next slide, we have performance test, which is not about runtime, but here about checking that the algorithm is optimizing something, is learning something and is not uh, fully random. Of course, having an active community, so with more than 3 million downloads, um, make it, it extra reliable because if something is wrong, if something is not working properly, you can be sure that someone is going to complain. And in that case, we tend to uh, try to fix the problem quickly. Uh, finally, um, we have a complete uh, documentation with many examples, uh, many tutorials and notebooks that you can try out online, and our API is also fully documented. Uh, let's finish with a quick example of what do I mean by, for instance, doing a performance test. Let's say you would like to test PPO, so proximal policy optimization, which is one of the most used reinforcement learning algorithms out there, and you want to check that it's learning something in your test. So what do we do? We declare, we first define a small training budget. So we kept the maximum number of iteration and we set it to as small as possible. Um, and then we train it on a simple environment uh, using that budget. And after training, we evaluate it. 
And the test consists in checking that the performance reach for this small budget is above a given threshold. And if you do a tiny change in the algorithm, then it will maybe still learn something, but not reach any more of these thresholds. But so this is one way to check that we don't introduce any regression um, in our algorithm. And um, SB3 doesn't come alone. It comes actually with uh, three repository. One is about having more algorithm. So it's SB3 country. One is about having fast implementation in JAX. So from five to 20 times faster than the PyTorch one. And then we have the RSO, which is uh, for everything which is about experiment. So Stable Business 3 is all about the basic components for our algorithm and the algorithm. And the zoo is all about training, evaluating, but also plotting and having some uh, additional metrics. And the zoo is a key component for having reproducible experiment. But how do we do to have reproducible experiment? So the thing is, we log everything that is needed automatically to reproduce and compare different runs. Um, the idea is to minimize the potential mistake uh, when you run an experiment by only letting you focus on your task and not on the different training script. So in practice, it provides you with training, loading, plotting script, and also automatic hyperparameter optimization. We have integration with weight pattern biases and hugging face. I will talk about that uh, a bit later. And we have more than 200 pre-trained models with tuned hyperparameters. So if you would like to apply um, your um, RL to a new problem, you can check out the hyperparameters to, uh, that worked on similar problems. Um, and finally, and I think it's relevant for this workshop, we have a full uh, benchmark of all of our algorithm on many different tasks. And this benchmark is fully open source and you can check out uh, every log. So how does it work in practice? In practice, let's say you would like to train an agent on a task, save checkpoints every um, 10,000 steps, and also maybe do some, uh, via some change in your task, which for instance, change the gravity. Um, and this is what you would do. Uh, so you would just call the train script, specify the algorithms, specify the task, specify the different, um, the checkpoint frequency and how often do you want to evaluate it. And then you can directly on the fly modify the hyperparameter or modify parameters of your simulation. And, and the thing that the zoo do for you, and that would be actually valid for any uh, other run, um, it saves everything about this run to allow you to reproduce it. So you don't need to want, um, wonder what did I do in, in it? What did I change? Everything is saved. In practice, we have one folder per experiment, and this folder contains so everything that you need to reproduce it. So it contains all the custom command line argument that you pass. It contains the hyperparameters of uh, your model. It may contain the normalization uh, statistics if there's some. It contains all the checkpoints, and some, um, and contains the evaluation results and 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 the stats result like the episodic return. Um, the interesting thing is because all experiments are formatted the same way, it makes it easy to plot, compare, and also follow the best practices for comparison of the different algorithms. So here again, once you have do, did many runs, you can do with just one line in the terminal, um, uh, plot everything and compare everything uh, in a systematic way. And as I say, we have Actually, if we have a benchmark all of our algorithm and all the log and results are available online. So what does that mean? That means that you can check out online. So here is on weight and biases, a group algorithm by whatever parameter you want. You can activate, deactivate them. You can take a look at indiv individual runs with all the different metrics that are logged. You can even have a look at the exact parameter that we use to run uh, to, to run the, the algorithm, but it's more importantly, it allows you to compare if you want to try out a variation of an algorithm, it allows you to compare it to it. And this is what we, we did actually very recently. So in gray, we have a PPO, which is a normal hyperparameter. And then we did a small variation. And I will talk about that 
in, in the next section. We did a small variation on how we estimate the value, and then we checked uh, against uh, the, 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 the open RL benchmark that we have. And that way we can quickly see uh, from here that the value loss is much higher than uh, in the previous uh, runs. So this really allow you yeah, to, to compare and check everything and everything is, is uh, open. And uh, let's finish with some uh, robot videos. So every robot video that I will show today are uh, using stable baseline, the zoo, and uh, maybe Contrib or, or SBX. And here I was comparing, so um, how to learn fast, uh, how to walk with an elastic quadruped. And I'm comparing a different level of prior knowledge. So on the left, you will have reinforcement learning from scratch, and then you will have some uh, prior knowledge using an open loop controller here a central pattern generator and and then i tested different variation of uh, combining the open loop controller with rl and then optimizing uh, everything online everything is done uh, here and learn on the real robot and of course the best result is uh, obtained when you optimize the open loop controller directly on the real robot and combining combine it with reinforcement learning and, and here it's very important when you do a real robot experiment ac actually to, to have a reliable implementation and to have um, experiment that you can reproduce and, and you know how to continue, for instance, the, ex the experiment over uh, several days. Um, so I presented Stable Baseline 3 on how to have reliable implementation. I presented the Zoo, uh, which is about reproducible experiments with training, uh, evaluation and plotting and the different metrics. Uh, but now I would like to give you some tips on how to implement a new algorithm. Those tips, I will use again RL as an example, but I, I think it's applicable to many fields. So what to do when you want to implement a new algorithm? One thing, of course, is to first read the original paper several times. Make sure to check out the appendix also. So here you have an example of the DeepQ network, so DQN. Um, and if you if you scroll down and, and go in, in one of the extended table of the appendix, then you realize that the, there's an important hyperparameter that is mentioned only there, um, that they only update the network every four uh, step in the simulator. And, and this is the kind of details that is usually very important for either runtime or for performance, and that might be hidden or not so clearly written in the paper. So that's one thing. Another thing is, of course, to read if it exists, the existing uh, implementation, especially the original one, because um, sometimes, and that's especially the case for PPO, there's a lot of tricks, implementation details, which are mentioned, which are not mentioned in the paper, but present uh, in the code. As an example, PPO um, uses uh, GAE for uh, advantage estimation. So this is mentioned in the paper, but it also uses a TD Lambda estimator for the value function instead of a Monte Carlo estimator. And this, if you look at the core and you're not careful, you can uh, easily overlook. Um, we have actually a blog post about the 37 implementation detail of PPO um, that is published at iClear uh, blog post track if you want to learn more about that. Um, so once you have read the existing implementation and the paper, then what you should try to have is uh, have something that uh, kind of work uh, on a simple problem. So trying to have some sign of life on toy problems. So why toy problems? Toy problems because <clears throat> uh, they are normally fast to run. You can also design them in a way that you check exactly uh, what your algorithm should solve and it make it easy to, to debug. And by sign of line, I mean that your algorithm should do something that is not fully random. And here, as an example, I was checking that PPO with memory, so with a recurrent neural network here, PPO LSTM was working. And the way I did it, I was checking on the pendulum environment. So the pendulum, you need to swing it up and then keep it upright. Um, so what I did is I removed the velocity from the observation, which make it impossible for a normal PPU implementation to solve, so without memory, uh, because you need to know about the angular velocity to actually balance it properly. And that's what you see on the left. So PPU 
uh, without memory just fail on that simple task where uh, people with memory actually reaches the, the highest score that you, you can have on, on this problem. Um, and yeah, and, and iterating quickly on simple problem is very important because if you need one hour to know if your algorithm is working, you, you're never going to make it. The next thing I do usually is step-by-step -step validation. So of course, I, log, I try to log every useful uh, values that can tell me something about uh, the algorithm. As an example, I'm, I, I can log the mean and max Q value uh, or the um, uh, explained variance. And then I usually use a debugger to step through the code and especially checks the different shape. Uh, because there's something um, in, in NumPy which is called automatic broadcasting, where uh, if you add a vector to a matrix with a column uh, with one column, you would expect yourself to have a vector at the end, but um, an NumPy does some broadcasting and at the end you end up with a matrix. So this is an example of a bug where it runs. So it will be hard to debug because there's no real error, but it doesn't work uh, because it's not doing what you expect. Um, and of course, uh, the last thing I do, and I would also highly recommend to do that, is to visualize what the train agent has learned. Because looking at the behavior learned usually tells you more um, about what is happening than just looking at some metrics or values in your term. And once I have so an algorithm that is um, looking not completely wrong, what I do is and I validate unknown environment. So um, Having environment that you know allows you to quickly know what kind of behavior has been learned. If the behavior is the best, uh, um, is, is the optimal one, or if there's some problem, for instance, in exploration or some problem uh, somewhere else. And, and of course, start with simple problem, easy problem, and then go harder uh, in, towards harder and harder problem. And usually when you finished um, benchmarking your implementation on, on the hardest problem that you know, then you can be sure uh, that uh, your algorithm is not completely useless. Um, let's go through quick some examples that I encountered in the past about um, implementation uh, error or bugs that are hard to, to debug or, or to find. One example was, as I said, the broadcasting error in stable baseline Two, uh, so in, in, in TensorFlow, and here it was suddenly failing. Um, so at the end, we had the we didn't reach the performance that we expect, but um, it was not failing completely. Another thing that is important for you to know is implementation of optimizer between library might not always be the same. So um, the RMS prop implementation of TensorFlow is slightly different from the PyTorch implementation, and as a result. Implementing the same algorithm in the two different framework will result in, uh, in different results. And more recently, I was implementing DQN in JAX, so with SBX. And again, DQN was almost working, but not reaching the performance that I would expect. Um, and by looking at, at the Q values, I realized something was wrong uh, in there because it was not reaching the values that I would expect. Um, and then I found out that the target network was not updated. And I got many more of those kind of problems uh, in, in the backup slides. So what can you do once you have a reliable implementation and fully tested? Then you can actually learn directly in the real world in, uh, in 10 minutes. And this is what I did also. I learned from scratch. Uh, so that's why you won't get the best result uh, using RL and directly in the real world. So after five minutes, it will learn to do a first step. And then after 10 minutes, it will reach kind of the maximum uh, performance. <clears throat> so yeah, after four minutes, it does the first step. And then quickly, it will learn to walk. Um, and here, yeah, the optimization is done online. And there's many gradient steps happening. Um, at every step uh, with a robot. And here you need really need to make sure that your implementation is correct. Otherwise, uh, you will spend hours on the robot uh, instead of minutes. 
The last thing I would like to talk about <clears throat> is a technique so I've been using more and more uh, recently, which is useful both for learning and other uh, many other cases, um, like thinking about how to simplify your code base. And the idea is over time, usually you have a code base that grows and grows and get quite complex. Um, but it's good from time to time to try to um, to implement a minimal implementation out of this complex code base. And why do I mean by minimal implementation? I usually mean to have something that is standalone with a minimal number of dependencies. So the best would be to have a single file implementation. And this implementation won't cover all the possible cases, but you need to cover the core uh, feature of your algorithm. And the idea is that that way you can reduce complexity and you can also think about your whole code base or what is needed and whatnot, and how you can simplify things. Um, but having also something that is standalone with minimal dependency, it make it also easier to share, also reproduce your experiment because um, instead of running a code base with 10 or 100 of file, you have a single file and that may make it also easier, easier to, for you to um, share your ideas, uh, explain to others what you're doing and also learn uh, about um, the algorithm. So as an example, there's a clean array library, which is a set of single file implementation. And it's really great for learning about the different algorithm because we have a single file and then you can directly tinker uh, in there. And this lower the um, uh, entry, the, the, th the threshold for newcomer because they don't have to look into 10 different files to understand what is happening. Uh, you just have to look into one file. Of course, by doing that, you can also find some inconsistencies and bugs. And that's actually what happened to me. And I will show an example um, in the next slide. Um, and, and this will allow you to also improve back your complex code base. Um, of course, because uh, this minimal implementation, or if you do multiple minimal impl implementation, you kind of duplicate code. It's a bit hard to maintain, so it's maybe not the best on the mid term, long term, but it's a very good exercise. So uh, for yourself, but also to share your ideas with other and to make it more reproducible. As an example, so I was recently searching for what is the simplest baseline for locomotion um, and comparing to reinforcement learning. And I wanted to share the idea that I had and check that um, it worked as intended, because usually you describe your method, but then you, you do some implementation uh, details and it doesn't really work as you wrote uh, in theory. Um, so how does it look like? So I found out that just having simple oscillator at the joint level, so one oscillator per joint, uh, was enough in a lot of cases for locomotion. And here, it's uh, the, the frequency between oscillator is shared uh, between all joints. And I had a medium code base, so five to 10 files that was um, avoiding to have some duplicated code. And I tried to condense that into only certain line of code. And by doing so, um, I actually found out some inconsistency and a potential bug in my code. And then I could fix it both in the single file implementation and back in the complex code base. And the idea of uh, this simple baseline was actually to showcase some shortcomings of reinforcement learning and show that we can do successful seem to really transfer if you have the right prior knowledge. Um, and here I will compare so reinforced learning in simulation transfer to reality compared to the very simple open loop baseline uh, that is not using any randomization or reward engineering. And, and the reason of why it works is because it has the right uh, prior for, for learning. And yeah, if you apply RL, what it will do, it will learn the perfect uh, behavior in simulation, which is having a very high frequency uh, behavior. This allows you to actually hack the simulator and have a very high reward in, in there. But of course, it doesn't work on the real robot because uh, the because uh, the system acts as a low pass filter. And then you can do the same uh, with the open loop baseline. And because you have the right prior about locomotion, uh, it will work in simulation and in reality without any trick.
Um, finally, I would like to give you some links to very important resources if you do empirical reinforcement learning or just if you do actually any empirical science. One is a guide about empirical design for experiment, how to uh, design experiment to compare the algorithm, how to make it fair. Um, and it has a lot of uh, takeaways, nice takeaway which is written. And the other one is how to evaluate things properly, how to have um, to do better evaluation, do better science, um, and have, for instance, proper confidence uh, interval and, and compare different uh, algorithms. As an example, they recommend to use the interquartile mean to so IQM instead of the mean for aggregating score. The idea is that you discard the top 25% and the bottom 25% and you uh, do the mean on the remaining 50% of your scores. And that way you can have something that is representative of your data, but that is also insensitive to outliers. Um, so let's conclude. So what have we seen so far for having reliable um, RL and reproducible experiments? So I've presented some tips that we use in Stable Baseline 3 for having reliable implementation. I've shown how with the zoo we log everything and make it uh, reproducible. Um, given you some tips on implementing new algorithm, how to minimize um, the time spent into uh, developing algorithm or how to minimize the time spent into um, uh, debugging things. And of course, no worry, I, I, I never get it right the first time, so it's, it's still hard uh, despite all the tricks. And I finish with a technique which is um, allow you to more easily share your um, um, your ideas, but also allow you to learn about other ideas, which is having minimal implementation uh, of your code base. And of course, I highly recommend you to check out uh, the two links I've shown uh, previously uh, for best practices for um, experimental reinforcement learning and for better evaluation. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, that's the moment. Yeah, okay, so uh, if we have questions for the speaker, we'll re I'll try and relay the question uh, from the room to Antonin. Um, but do we have any questions? Sure. Question, I don't remember which slide it was, but um, it said that basically two different algorithms uh, were implemented, and therefore only really have to solve it. That sounds surprising and then sure so and the question was on one of the slides you presented two algorithms with two different implementations uh they forgot which slide it was um and they were wondering kind of what was the difference between the two implementations and uh i think it was yeah. for rms prop yeah pytorch versus ah uh, yeah okay okay ah uh, yeah um uh yes it's uh here yeah um so the the difference actually in uh, rms prop um it's how they use again the epsilon value so one is using it uh, i think inside the root square and the other one is uni using it outside the root square uh we have some links for that uh, rms prop yes uh and, and basically, I think it's just, uh, yeah, if you can check out there, uh, I think the, the main difference is how they use the epsilon value in, in the optimizer. Um, actually, you have the same issue, I think, with Adam uh, between TensorFlow and, and, uh, and PyTorch. So there's some, some de the details are in there. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, in the back there. For reinforcement learning, as we use the reinforcement for control, as Steve said, so you need a reproducible mean version so that you can train your control. And uh, the one kind of answer that oh, could be is uh, simulating it first and then apply plans where you learn models or track your setup. But for that, the, the, your learn controller is not be harming your system in the first time. So, in the, in the example that you showed, at least the system does not break, but yeah. there, uh, there's, a, there's a limitation where there are lots of 
So, yeah, so I have a similar question too, actually. So a lot, as we see in a lot of your examples, how you train in simulation and you transfer to your real robot, but how do you not make, how do you not break it when you transfer it to the real robot? Like how do you, are there, what guarantees you have there? Is that, yeah. Or like, how, yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, so, so one thing is most of the examples I've shown you, I, I don't transfer, I just train directly on the robot. Um, but then, of course, then you have the same problems. How do you not break the, your robot? So um, a, a lot of care need to be done in, in the um, experimental design. Uh, so defining an action space uh, in a way that whatever action you take, uh, you will not break your robot. That uh, usually uh, mean having a, some kind of safety layer around your RL algorithm. Um, the other uh, actually thing is that the robot I'm using, because of its elasticity, it has um, serial elastic actuator and very soft spring, it, it is very robust. Uh, so I know that uh, despite the RL doing very weird things like what we, we've seen here, um, I know that it should not uh, break it um, right away. But of course, uh, if, if you want to if you want to properly do it, you need to, to do some care. And one idea here would be to have some kind of low pass filter or use a bit um, a better exploration or penalize any um, high frequency action. Um, and, and, and so the, the answer is, is yes, of course, you, you need to, um, to spend some time in experimental design and, and um, ensure that the, the safety of, uh, of your robot. Um, but in my case, as I said, I'm mostly trained uh, directly on real robots, so I I know directly if it works or not. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, sure, Anna. So, um, so I really like this idea of the minimal simulation. Um, I was wondering, obviously, you didn't see how your code base currently fails, and you possibly have to refactor it. And I always think that it's very hard to do it when you're trying to refactor it. Do you have any like advice on what is a good enough thing that you definitely should refactor it right now in the length of time, or is it a good thing always? Yeah. So <laughs> the question was regarding you know your minimal working example and how you uh, refactor your code, and the question is kind of well, when do you choose to refactor your code? Because it can be a lot of work and kind of what, what does that design trade look like for you? Mm -hmm. um, so, so in my case, it was when I was Francis, writing the paper and wanting to make sure that before doing a massive experiment, um, checking that everything was right. Or um, at the moment, I, Francis, recently I asked my student to do it because I wanted to help uh, him, but the code base was too complex and, and that at the moment, I ask him to to do uh, that kind of refactoring, but it's it's not fully refactoring here. It's you you don't really change your code base. You just out of your code base you extract uh, some minimal implementation. Of course, by doing so, you can actually refactor later your code base. Uh, but the idea is more to to extract uh, one algorithm and one feature of of your code base and showcase it. So usually you do that when you want to check that everything is working as ex expected or want to share your code or want people to learn about it uh that's that's when i, I would do that okay um we should probably move on to the next talk um but that was a fantastic talk um and we will he provided some links so we'll probably try and provide the slides uh, on the website afterwards so you can check out the links and everything like that and he's yeah he's also on the panel but yeah we'll uh, thank him for his talk and now Siki will introduce the next speaker. So our last speaker for the workshop is from Professor uh, Chang Liu Liu. Uh, Chang Liu is the assistant professor in the Robotics Institute at SMU, where she leads the Intelligent Control Lab. Uh, her research interests include robotics and human-robot interaction, motion planning, and control. The goal of Chengliu's research is to build intelligent and autonomous systems that think, behave, and interact with the world in the way that human beings do, so they can better assist and collaborate with humans in their daily lives. Chengliu has over 30 open source projects centered around safe control, including benchmark on interactive safety, and composable agent toolbox benchmark. And 
um, we're happy to have you today. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. I think so. Okay. All right, I'm sharing. Um, yeah, just let me know if you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, then I will not try to get into full screen in case. Yeah, all right, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm Chang Liu, and here I just want to share with you about some of our recent attempts in developing benchmarks in control. Yeah, and just a little bit of background. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor in the Robotic Institute in Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, um, our main projects are mostly focused on how to achieve safe autonomy through either design or verification, and how to enable safe human robot collaboration, and how can we make robots um, help human uh, in more intelligent manufacturing environments. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually, um, we didn't start to think about benchmarking kind of uh, until like a 2018 time frame. I started my PhD in 2012 and published my first paper on how to ensure safety during human robot interactions in 2020, uh, 2014. Um, and uh, five years later, I realized that there are so many similar algorithms to ensure safety and uh, we don't have a very clear understanding um, about which one performs better. So then I started to think about more um, benchmarking and uh, that leads to our first benchmark developed called BIS, uh, which stands for Benchmark uh, Interactive Safety. Yeah, and, and the motivation is as I just explained. Um, yeah, we saw many algorithms. The algorithm we propose is called SafeSet algorithm. And at the same year, there's this control variable function paper, which is very famous now, get published, um, introducing a very similar algorithm. And also one year prior to that, there's a slightly more safe control paper published, um, also contain very similar ideas. Uh, although the hyperparameters of these three algorithms are different, but the final control structure is very, very similar. And it's very hard for us to understand advantage of a control method in um, the either control method in different dynamic interactive environments. Um, and in the as a motivation to get more statistics for better understanding and evaluation would be this interactive safety benchmark, which contains a variety of uh, robots as, as well as a variety of like uh, modes for human robot interaction. And here's one simple example. Uh, we have this two link scare robot uh, and also a like a human subject. Okay, here the uh, blue dot. Yeah, and the goal for the robot and the human are essentially to reach the goals marked in corresponding colors uh, while avoiding collision with each other. Yeah, the human may already have some collision avoidance behavior, but the robot should also ensure that there's no collision. Uh, and uh, we implement uh, those existing algorithms, control barrier function, potential field, sliding mode, and our previous algorithm, and want to see uh, which one performs better. But that's actually also a hard question to ask. Like, what is the uh, evaluation metric should we consider? Because there are so many randomness. The uh, human's uh, motion can be kind of, the human's policy can be different and the uh, goals can be generated differently. Now, in the end, we come um, into this conclusion that we should uh, do a lot of random testing and uh, plot uh, this efficiency and the safety trade off to as an evaluation metric to say which one performs better. Essentially this trade-off tells us like a, a kind of uh, what is the combined um, behavior. Essentially we want the uh, algorithm to be safe, but it, it not at the um, kind of expense of sacrificing or all, all efficiency. Uh, meanwhile, we also want the algorithm to still let the robot finish the goal reaching task, but uh, the robot should not uh, jeopardize safety to do that. Uh, and uh, in this plot, we are doing a lot of kind of uh, random testing. And uh, for example, for the control variable function approach, we did a lot of random testing you can see in the blue dots. And then we take the convex plot of the uh, efficiency and the safety um, trade-off as convex plot of those dots and then plot this trade-off curve. And then we say one method is better than another one in this evaluation situation if the uh, trade-off curve is to the 
upper right and wrapping the other trade-off curve of another approach. Because in this way, at the same safety level, the uh, algorithm with this, for example, the purple one has better efficiency. And then with the same efficiency level, the algorithm has better safety. So this, we believe, created a uh, meaningful comparison. And with this analysis, we actually are able to combine some of the advantage introduced by control barrier function approach and some advantage introduced uh, from our previous approach and uh, get a uh, best performing one among all ads during the purple here. Yeah, so this is our first attempt. Uh, and uh, with this one, and we published this paper in CDC, actually, 2019. So this initial attempt is actually, I would say, uh, it's good. And we met our initial goal in terms of generating statistics to uh, get better understanding of different algorithms and better comparison. But there are also a lot of remaining issues. For example, the um, kind of implementation of the results cannot easily transfer to hardware platform. Um, and if we do this eva do an additional evaluation on hardware platform, I would expect the trade-off curve will be very different um, because there are so many simulations in the uh, this uh, simulated-based evaluation platform. And also, um, the benchmark cannot easily uh, extend to compare algorithms that go beyond analytical control law or QP-based control law. Um, and also, since we need to do a lot of testing on random generated environments, we are also not sure what is the right distribution of the environment we should generate to create a more fair comparison. Okay, and on top of this uh, first attempt of interactive safety, we started a new project called Composable Agent Toolbox. Yeah, and the aim for that one is to mitigate some of the issues uh, we saw in the Yes, that is, we want to include as many control methods as possible, no matter they have analytical control law or qp based control law, or they require more structure. And also we want the uh, method to be directly transferred to hardware control. Yeah, unfortunately, I would say this is a failing attempt. Uh, we stopped this project, uh, almost stopped this project in 2021, um, because we find it, extremely hard to define a uniform interface that works for all algorithms. And, and here we mainly refer to model-based algorithms and the dynamic systems. So for example, if you consider a robot arm, um, the, you have the state space, the um, Cartesian space, the um, joint space. Um, and for all different spaces, you, need, you can have like a different algorithms for estimation, different algorithms for control. And uh, it is very challenging to bring them into one common like uh, uh, kind of uh, benchmark. And uh, we did make some compromises in order for uh, us to still kind of generate relatively good control. For as taking the robot arm example, um, the compromises we generate is that we decompose the task-based control and the joy-based control. So we first control the any factors and then control the arm. But this is just one way to control the robot. Uh, definitely not representing all possible ways to control the robot. And because of that, um, because of those compromises we made, the toolbox is no longer that attractive as a research tool. But in the end, it, the, the effort is not totally wasted. Uh, in the end, we assigned its way to my course. So then I'm actually currently using this toolbox uh, to assign homeworks as a way to teach students how we can add different components into a model-based controller. So this is the second attempt we made. And uh, the third benchmark that we have been generating is a slightly different topic. Um, it's for neural verification. So the first two, GAS and CAT, are both for control tasks. The third one uh, is for verification that is verify whether a, for example, neural network based control law satisfies some safety criteria or not. Uh, and that project that did this type of benchmarking, uh, we had this idea uh, when I was doing my postdoc at Stanford. So if we uh, look into the timeline, like uh, um, around 2014, a lot of deep learning based approach uh, get people's attention. 
Uh, and uh, three years later, people, the first verification approach of those neural networks, it was introduced. And uh, starting from 2017, there was more and more algorithms for neural network verification coming out. Um, but back then, in 2019, the situation is there are too many different algorithms making different assumptions and hard to compare. So then uh, what we are doing is to kind of read into the details of each algorithm and uh, try to unify their assumption, unify their interface, as what has been explained uh, for deep power algorithms that Anthony was discussing. We're essentially doing the same thing. And then we introduced this um, toolbox called neuroverification.jl um, that we kind of unified all the algorithms up to 2019. Um, and the, on top of that, we find um, as the field is still kind of generating new algorithms, just implementing our own algorithm like in this toolbox is not enough. We need to engage more of the community so that um, we can further define the standards of what is the kind of right way to create specifications for the verification algorithm and uh, how should we better compare um, algorithms, especially those newly developed algorithms and what is the future research direction. So with that in mind, we introduced this competition called International Verification of Neural Network Competition, uh, which was first launched in um, 2020 and uh, we just finished the fourth year of this competition. And I would say this 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 is a um, so far it's a very successful um, attempt in this field as we generated a lot of benchmarks. We are not generating benchmarks um, by our own. We solicitate benchmarks from both academia and industry so that they can tell us what is the uh, immediate question they want to be solved. For example, we solicited some uh, a tough driving benchmark. And uh, interestingly, we received a submission from a um, uh, autonomous driving company um, that is kind of verify whether a image segmentation network is always working correctly. That problem has never been thought about in academia. And after the industry submitted this benchmark, there are more, more, more and more people looking into this problem at, and apply the verification approach to those new problems. Um, and the, so we have just finished the fourth year of this competition. And uh, you can see here is a comparison of different years. We didn't include the fourth year's data, but throughout the first three years, um, the uh, number of tools participating is slowly increasing. And the number of benchmarks submitted uh, is also increasing. Um, and then you can see a very interesting trend is that for new papers published in this domain, this verification domain, they are constantly cites the benchmarks that has been used in the competition and uh, that has been almost used as a like a comma or standard benchmark for all new papers, which is exactly what we hoped while we uh, launched this competition. Yeah, so the lessons learned for this benchmark effort is that community effort like engaging the whole community is actually a right way to uh, push things forward. And that definitely led to more promising results. Um, but there are also some, some issues. For example, the event, although we solicited benchmarks from participants and also tools uh, from participants, but the evaluation is still run by the organizers. And uh, it actually took several days to finish one round of evaluation. So it's still time consuming. And uh, as the organizers become more and more busy, we, yeah, we actually need more people to help us to run those evaluations. Yeah, and the second thing is that the, um, since we already have done this for four years and uh, the first place winner has been that single tool for four years. Um, this we see generates some negative impact on discouraging people to submit their tools. So then currently we're also thinking about how can we attract new people um, and uh, keep this um, kind of competition um, kind of still evolving dynamically instead of um, being kept within a small range of community. Yeah, so this is the uh, third attempts we made. 
Yeah, and uh, currently we're doing the fourth benchmark. And uh, the fourth benchmark is essentially uh, getting inspired by all three previous benchmarks. This fourth benchmark is called Guard. And here we are still trying to benchmark like safe control related stuff. But since we got this conclusion that model-based uh, control is very hard to benchmark, so we started with model-free um, methods, especially safe reinforcement learning, uh, safe deep reinforcement learning based approach. And uh, yeah, we did those into the benchmark. Uh, and the second is inspired by our experience with this uh, verification benchmark that the evaluation takes too long. We intendedly to make guard a fast tool so that we can run the evaluation efficiently within minutes. Yeah, and uh, with those in mind, uh, we specified the following algorithms and the following tasks, robots and the safety specifications for a guard. Now, the goal is to make it comprehensive in the sense that it should cover a right, wide range of robotic, robotic systems, which uh, are usually used in the real world experiments, as well as safety specifications. Not only safety specification for collision avoidance, but all kinds of safety spec, such as avoiding um, like uh, overheating, avoiding um, getting into um, or avoiding bumping into some adversaries. Um, and also we tried to make the whole framework extendable, meaning that the algorithms can be easily extended to new ones. Yeah. Um, as you can see, there's some actually some overlap uh, with this guard and uh, the tool Anthony just introduced, uh, but guard is more focused on the safe learning for control. Yeah, and uh, in order to speed it up, uh, we also like uh, integrated this guard with um, MJX and JEX so that we can run parallel training. Yeah, and uh, here's a comparison of um, guard running in different environments. So um, for safety gym, which is the first generation of safe R benchmark, um, the evaluation is very inefficient. So it can only run several steps per second. But uh, if we, and the safety gym uses actually gym environment, but if we switch the gym environment to Mojoko 3, and the, the, the evaluation speed actually is already boosted, but that is still not enough. Um, by adding MJX and JEX framework further, we can make the evaluation much more faster. And here's a video showing how fast it is in real time. And then we just use this a very simple point about training as to illustrate that. So this screen recording is in real time. There's no sped up. Everything happens in real time. And uh, yeah, we launched a thousand parallel environments. And this is training from scratch. At the beginning, a low reward. Just a few seconds later, reward increase and then further increase. Yeah, and uh, as you can see, we within five seconds we can run two to the two E five evaluations, which is much faster than before. And also, we have enabled this to be kind of run locally on your personal PC. So that that's a big step towards allowing um, researchers and the students to quickly evaluate uh, or compare their own algorithm against the existing ones. After one and five minutes, we have evaluated three to the E6 environments. And now the stuff converge. And uh, the final policy is shown here. So although this robot is simple, but this is whole video is to show you that how fast uh, the new benchmark can be in the evaluation. And we believe this is important to the field. 
Um, the takeaway message for this attempt is listed below. So it's definitely much easier to benchmark model-free control as it's much easier to define interface. We only have this learning algorithm and then the policy. Um, so then we don't need to worry about how can we connect your estimation module with your model-based control module and whether your model-based control requires some optimizer like MPC or it can be simply written into a analytical control law. Yeah, so, uh, but I've also seen some like a, a new attempts to benchmark or provide a common framework for model-based control and those are very also very successful. Um, but compared to the, our previous attempt, CAT, um, this model-free version of guards is much more scalable in, in evaluation, and uh, we believe it will have um, more impact in the future research. Yeah, and as, we, as I've been emphasizing that, speed actually matters a lot. Um, the evaluation speed actually determines how fast you can make your further development. Yeah, and um, our, all our goal is to make everything fast enough so that we can quickly evaluate, quickly generate the statistics about um, the performance and the quickly evaluate the newly developed algorithm. On top of that, we also noticed that there are several, you know, there's already a lot of um, RO-based benchmark. Um, and then nowadays, actually just coming from the beginning of 2023, there are also some safe reinforcement based, based benchmark. Yeah, and uh, there are different attempts from all over the world. Then and the next question to think about for the community is what is the right mechanism to engage the whole community to contribute to benchmarking the safe reinforcement learning? Should we merge all the benchmarks into one or should we keep different developments and uh, try to compare different development and um, coming to a conclusion of which one is better for which task. All of these are open questions. Um, and uh, I will also be very interested in engaging in further discussion and figuring those questions out. All right. Um, so this talk is mainly to share with you our experience in the development for benchmarking, four different benchmarks. Um, and the major conclusion is that benchmarking we believe is very important in control for, for the research. And meanwhile, it is also hard, especially if we're considering model-based control. With that, I would like to thanks for your attention and happy to take any questions. Awesome, do you wanna do a couple of questions before the panel? Um, I'll relay the questions from the room to you uh, online. Um, do we have any questions? Sure, Federico. What difficulties did you encounter in the like, trying to compare different models? Approaches? So the question is, what kind of were the difficulties you encountered when trying to compare different model-based approaches? Yeah, so it mostly is um, how they how they develop the model. So if we treat different model-based approach as as a like an individual single black box, I think that's easy to compare. Um, but what we want to do is to decompose it a little bit further to understand whether it is the estimation module that led to the success, or is it the, the if for MPC, it's the optimization module that led to the success. As we want to get a deeper understanding, we find it's extremely hard because different model-based approach have, essentially have different interface, uh, which is hard to align. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question, I think, here. We're going to try this new mic. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah. That's okay, great. Perfect. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. It's a rather open question that I have. It's about safety. And um, I feel most people understand it as defining a set in input or in, in state space or in output space. And then yeah, either stabilize that set or if it's the unsafe set prevented you go there. But did you have a discussion on what safety actually means, or is that something community has reached a consensus on? Yeah, 
So, uh, so far, I think the community reached a consensus on safety as a safe space constraint that your system needs to satisfy. And, uh, um, but given other type of constraints, not all states within the initially defined state set exist a control input to remain the state for future states uh, in that state set. So then we need additional approach to, for example, synthesize a barrier function, to synthesize a safety index, or even value function considering the Hamilton Jacobi um, reachability analysis so that we can keep the dynamic system kind of forward invariant inside the original user specified the state based constraint. Um, that is the, I would say, current understanding of safety. Thank you. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, thank you for the talk. I wanted to ask mainly that uh, in the last question that you said, uh, what would be like the common uh, mechanism you can have to combine methods from both uh, both fields? Like should it should should it be like task based? Should it be uh, like a policy based or something? Like like where will you start that uh, discussion from? That that's a great question. So I don't have a clear answer, and uh, that's also something I've been thinking about. I think for robotics community, it is um, relatively straightforward to use task based approach as a framework to combine different methods. Um, but in control community, as previous papers, it's more natural to be more kind of method oriented. Um, but using method oriented one, it, as in our previous study, it's very hard to benchmark um, because different methods uh, or different tweak of the method is aiming for solving different problems. So then there probably does not exist a common ground. For future developments, maybe this task or anything is an easy first step to explore benchmarking control. Um, yeah, but there may, may be additional challenges associated with that. Open question, I don't know yet. Okay, thank you very much. Do you wanna, let's uh, thank the speaker again uh, for a great presentation. Yes. Okay, so now we'll start the panel discussion. Um, I'll quickly, for those of you that just entered the room, I'll briefly introduce the speakers again. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll pin you guys on the Zoom here so everyone can see your faces. Um, so again, we have Antonin, uh, who is from the German Aerospace Institute, DLR, uh, who's very prominent in the open source community for uh, reinforcement learning, stable baselines three, um, and has contributed significantly in this research is used by thousands of people around the world. And we have uh, Cheng Ling Liu, who's uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, who leads the Intelligent Control Lab. Uh, and as you've seen, she has uh, a breadth of experience trying to implement benchmarks and different open source uh, uh, contributions to the field. Um, and so we have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, I'll start. The first one is, um, and I, so the first one is, we have seen an increasing number of competitions in robotics and machine learning conferences. Um, as well as new newer benchmark tracks in these fields. Um, and in your opinion, like what really makes a good benchmark or competition challenge? Uh, and, and could you provide some examples? I think we've seen some already of, uh, of these. I don't know if Anton, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Chang, you already presented, I think some, some nice examples and feature of what is good benchmark. So, I would I would say when, when you do a benchmark, you need to have in mind what do you want to check. You cannot check everything. You cannot uh, be too general. But if if you're too narrow, then it won't be interesting. Um, so for me, a, a good benchmark would be a, a benchmark that is designed to to check a specific uh, feature of an algorithm. Um, and you need to actually really document uh, your design choices and also the limitation of that benchmark. As an example, if you benchmark only in simulation, yes, you can have a, a thousand of uh, environment and to make it very easy to benchmark new algorithm. Uh, but this is something that you cannot have on the real robot. So you need also to keep that in mind of design choices uh, and limitation. For good benchmark, um, I don't really have in mind. Um, all benchmark lists that I know are, are always a bit imperfect. Um, for instance, the Mujoko or the locomotion benchmark, they are 
um, good because they are fast to run and it's easy to compare different algorithm and it gives you already a good um, view of what is the performance or runtime of your algorithm. But uh, then they are they tend to be uh, too simple and now algorithm actually the newest algorithm tend to hack the simulator which make it a bit useless. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard to design uh, and you need to design yeah to really define your your choices. At least that would be, that would be a first thing and, and another thing is you need to be careful with your metrics that uh, to avoid that the metrics become the target uh, then then it defeats the purpose of, of the benchmark also. yeah um i would like to add a little bit um, i think the the one the benchmark for new replication uh, is one good example of good benchmark because it serves the purpose of um we need researchers together and also provide a common evaluation platform uh, for a newly developed algorithm. Um, but meanwhile, we also see the trend of, uh, or the potential issue of overfitting to the benchmark. That is the newly developed algorithm is they're not for like specifically for problem solving, but for benchmark solving. Um, that's definitely something we want to avoid. Um, and the, throughout years, we develop approaches to avoid that. For example, randomize the benchmark um, parameters so that people cannot guess ahead of time what is being used there. So then that encourages people to introduce more general approach. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, what is a good benchmark? I think in general, it should be used as a common ground for future development. And uh, it should be extendable such that if people develop new algorithms, we should be easily in, uh, it should be easily integrated into the benchmark in the future. And also if people in the people find new problems, it also should be easily integrated into the whole benchmark platform easily. Yeah, so that's my take. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've got a question for you and a remark at the same time. Um, like, like for me, the best benchmark would be, of course, to have it on, especially for control algorithm, to have it on real hardware. Um, the problem with real hardware is it's every hardware is different. And even though you have some open source hardware and development, um, even if you build the same robot twice in your lab, the two robots are always a bit different. So uh, how would you deal with that? Because for me, yeah, the best benchmark would be already to have some real hardware. Uh, but it's, it's, I think, a hard problem. What would be your approach for that? That's a great question. So the approach we're, we're taking is to bring everything into ROS or anything similar so that we have some like a certainty of the interface. And, uh, and from that and benchmarking the real low level control, torque level control, it's still a very open problem because as you said, the interface are different the motors may also be different um yeah so we're not sure what may be the best way to benchmark those low level control do you have any any idea or any good practice to solve the problem um i, I don't really have the solution but what i've seen so far is is some uh, cheap and open hardware would be part of the solution. Another solution I've seen, I think that was organized by TU Darmstadt was, or others, was to have, um, to centralize uh, the algorithms, like to, to test different algorithms on the same hardware. And that way you, you require people to send you the algorithm and then you test on the hardware uh, there. That's another solution. Um, again, it's not easy because then you need to agree on an interface. Uh, but at least for me, that's a step towards um, better benchmark. <laughs> mm, I agree. That's actually essentially what it was happening in the benchmark for the neural verification. Although that one does not involve controlling the hardware, uh, controlling the hardware robot, but it requires every algorithm to be run on the same GPU, same CPU. And in the end, the, we as the organizers collect all the benchmark um, tools and run it ourselves. 
we have I have one more question and then we open it up for the audience as well. So I have a question. How do you actually do fair comparisons? Um, because that's not trivial, given that, you know, for example, little hyperparameters make a big difference. Um, and so in, in machine learning, when we when the whole um, benchmarking is around a data set, they often divide it into, you know, a training data set and then an unknown um evaluation or test data set right that is unknown and you submit your code um do you have any comments around how we can do fair comparisons in in a kind of closed loop control setup please go ahead yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm still organizing my thoughts mm. Yeah, first of all, I think for closed loop control, the benchmarking task is very different from benchmarking a machine learning model, which the task is benchmark machine learning model is relatively static, um, which you just give the input and check the output and that's done. But for a control, you have this sequential decision making stuff going on. Um, what's happened in the past will affect the input to your future. And then this kind of stuff will accumulate. Um, so that provides a, or that creates a challenge in interpreting the results. For example, if your robot does mm -hmm. under some policy does not end up going to the goal, what was the cause of that? We can, we can simply write a metric that is saying, okay, if the algorithm does not have a uh, goal reaching behavior or have low success rate in goal reaching, then it is not good. Um, but I guess for the community, what we care most is about like a, what what's going wrong. And uh, this diagnosis, okay, I'm deviating from the fair comparison, but let me finish. The diagnosis is is important. And I, I, I for myself, I, I don't know what is the best solution. And uh, from that end, the, creating a fair metric is really challenging. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would like to, to add actually um, about, about fair comparison and um, good design. This is actually the two links I have linked at the very end of my presentation. One is really about how do you ensure fair comparison? And one recommendation for instance is to include um, the budget for hyperparameter automatic hyperparameter optimization when comparing algorithms. So you don't only compare tuned algorithms, but you compare them and you englobe also the, the hyperparameter tuning in that. It's still not perfect, but it's again the steps towards um, better comparison. Um, and, and the other thing is yeah, having, I think, better um, quantitative result and better statistical comparison. Um, and, and it involves again having, uh, for instance, um, good estimation of confidence interval so that you 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 don't say this algorithm a is better than b is you you're more likely to say a is probably better than b uh, according to to this metric and um as an example in in the recommended thing that is done it's there's something called performance profile which instead of giving you one single value you have a, a full uh picture of what is happening like does the algorithm work all the time, does it give very good performance only uh, for a, sh a small fraction of your runs and, and, and poor performance in the rest? And, and that way you can already um, improve comparison and, and avoid saying A is better than B, but maybe A is uh, probably better on those metrics for this kind of uh, um, task. And, and I think that's I would say, a good step towards uh, yeah better comparison and, and and more fair comparison. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Let's open the discussion and ask some questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah um, I want to uh, add a bit to this discussion of fairness, because in my opinion, the most important thing in when it, when it comes to fairness is to to clearly define the problem which is to be solved. Um, in the case which has been mentioned in, in machine learning where we have a test data set and a training data set, the goal is not to achieve good performance 
on the training data set. And the goal is also not to achieve good performance on the test data set, but the goal is to achieve like good classification errors on the whole um, like distribution of images. However, here we have an issue. The distribution of images is not available and we cannot um, evaluate, if it were available, we could not evaluate the performance on it because this distribution is an infinite dimensional object and we just are not able to yeah, compute this performance. And so we need a surrogate for the um, performance on this, um, yeah, on this problem. And that is what makes the fairness even an issue. If we were able to evaluate the true performance, the real thing we wanted, fairness would not be an issue because everyone would agree that this is the ultimate goal. And uh, yeah, testing on the ultimate goal is obviously fair. So if we then go back to the control problem, we would ask ourselves, um, okay, what, what makes the, um, what, what is the ultimate goal? Or yeah, and because if we, if we say, that we, we just do a benchmark and performing good at this benchmark, then I would say, okay, this is obviously fair because I have provided to the, um, to the practitioner or the, to the guys, who, to the people who want to uh, participate in the benchmark or in a competition, uh, the, the problem definition. And um, yeah, the, the simple goal is to, to achieve the best score in the problem, which would be fair. However, when we, when we have a benchmark, usually I guess our goal is not to be good for a specific model or a specific plant, but to achieve good performance on like a whole set of plants, uh, which again might be infinitely large. So that make is what makes the problem hard. And so um, essentially, if we try to copy the thing from machinery, we would have, a, we would, actually need a training set of models in order to uh, give the yeah applicants, practitioners a chance to tune their algorithms and then the test set of models um, to on which the the end be the benchmark takes place in the end. But of course this is I mean this is just my view on it. Um, I don't know if it adds something to the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Maybe to ask the panelists. Um, so basically, the question was: Is fairness really a, you know, an issue around kind of the test evaluation models, or is there more? For example, if there would be already a fixed model, um, can there still be fairness questions or or fair comparisons questions just because of? how you, for example, tune the hyperparameters and on how much data or something like that. Um, I, I actually agree with the training testing idea that was mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to provide a slightly different perspective. So um, the reason why we want to do benchmarking is still trying to perfect the methodology uh, instead of solving a very specific application problem. If we already have a very specific application problem, then that means our metric is already very clear and the platform is already very clear. And the whole maybe purpose is to tune the hyperparameters to make sure that specific problem is solved perfectly. And uh, on the other hand, creating benchmark is to, to ask answer the question whether for a similar range of problems, whether this single approach will always perform the best or not. And uh, there, there's this gives the rise of the need to create a distribution of problems. And uh, the distribution of the problems are hard to characterize. Then we do this training and testing approach. And uh, maybe the training and testing, although the name is called like that, it is not used similarly as uh, what ML people will use. The training sets may be uh, some models that human designers will see. And then we can like uh, tune the uh, our controller um, or so. And then um, after the controller is tuned, we can hand it to the benchmark for testing. Thanks. Um, may maybe I, I would add to that. So. We, I think 
most of the time when you propose a new algorithm or control algorithm, you, you usually have one application in mind. You, you, st you started it for solving a problem and, and the purpose of a benchmark would be then more to compare it to what is already there and, and telling you if I don't want to apply it only to that application, how good would it maybe uh, do if, if I want to apply it to another application that was not the, the first, um, the one in mind at first. Um, and maybe a partial, partial solution actually to this train and test uh, problem and also um, instead of checking on just one task um, is, is to have some kind of normalized score that so you can aggregate uh, different tasks and usually you should aggregate tasks by uh, what they are checking or what they are testing so grouping the different tasks uh, depending on, on, on what they are doing for instance if some are checking safety some are checking um, runtime um, that, that would be a solution and for the train and test problem um, I would say in, in control it's it, it's hard to have the distinction because at, at the end you usually want a control algorithm that work for your plan for your hardware and you don't really care if you you might you might have trained on this hardware but if it works for the, this hardware for this application you're all good you don't need to uh, to um, to have it outside this, this scope so um, but of course, what you would like for instance, to test is, for instance, is it robust to some perturbation? Is it robust to some variation? Um, that would be more, I would say, the, the test uh, case for, for your control algorithm. But it's harder to really define, I think, a train test uh, because the application is, is different. Okay. okay thank you. So we have very little time left. So let's give the audience some space. So we have two more questions. So, yeah. Hi, I have a thought in mind since uh, this morning because we were discussing open source and how it can benefit uh, researchers by giving them more citations. But actually I was thinking, um, is there any added return on investment that we can see from publishing code open source, especially if we are companies and not only researchers. And so we already have a community around in some sense. Um, while let's say if we are in a research lab, which is rather small, I can see the return on investment in the fact that probably the research thread is only run by a single person in the lab or few persons and exchanging information can of course uh, give uh, more um, uh, emphasis to the research and then uh, in the effort of publishing the um, documentation as well probably the next uh, person coming into the lab can also take the research over more easily uh, instead of reinventing uh, the wheel every time but in companies and this is maybe more a question for you Antonin do you see any return on investment um, of publishing the code open source on top of the fact that it's a uh, extra effort because of course, once once we have something that works, it's not enough to have it clear enough for other people to run it. And uh, yeah, so I don't Thanks. know if um, the question finally was clear. <laughs> I, I think I get the, the I got the gist of it. So um, to to answer the question, that so what is the benefit of open source and for for the company or for uh, here uh, research institute? Um, and and yes, it, it's it's quite some cost to uh, open source some code because then you need to remove all commercial parts. You need also to clean it, make it usable. Um, but it usually, if if you want people to use what you're doing, uh, open sourcing it is 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 a good way. Like as an example, there's some algorithm for DeepMind which is called MPO. It's probably the same performance of PPO, but because uh, the code was published only very late and there was no open source implementation. Um, this is one of the reasons I think for why this algorithm, despite potential good performance is, is barely used because it was maybe complex to implement, but there was no, no open source uh, implementation behind it and, and no resource behind it. Um, and, and by making it open source, yes, you will have actually um, people probably more using it at least people will be also able to replicate your algorithm and um, it will give you a bit of visibility um, 
So from in my, my institute, because of, of the Cebu baseline library, now some, some people know a bit more about DLR and that's a, a good uh, return in, in investment, I would say. At the same time, also by open sourcing your code, this forces you to improve quality. Um, and improving the quality of software is not only good for open source, but it's also good internally. So um, in, in that case, yes, um, I would say it's a, it's a win for both sides. But of course, you need to be careful. It's quite some effort, so you probably don't want to open source everything. Great. We had one more question in the audience, and I think this will also be the last question, and then we, we can still have some informal discussions after. Thank you. Um, so uh, in the introduction, and um, we heard a lot about how uh, the controls community has not really started valuing the act of benchmarking, baselining, and comparing uh, with only one or two percent of paper sharing code and things like that um, to both the panelists and the organizers of of the workshop. I was sort of wondering, you know, in in domains like RL and computer vision and so on, we've seen massive value add from doing the benchmarking. And clearly, everybody in the room here cares about this also, otherwise we wouldn't be here. What what suggestions or what thoughts would you share with us here on how we can convince the 99 other percent of people at CDC that they should start valuing this also? And should we be doing things in restructuring conferences to incentivize uh, code sharing and things like that more? I think I'll give the word to the panelists because I have a quick summary um, from kind of lessons learned during today's workshop and I may answer this. So do you have any more comments? Yeah, you can, you can already, but yeah. Um, panelists, any comments? Like how can we encourage the controls community or do we even need to? I think it, it's one good point, right? Not everything in controls is about computational tools, but more and more is. And so, yeah, do you think how, how can we incentivize the controls community to share code and yeah, think about these topics? Yeah, I think I, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, first, I think um, maybe we are not trying to encourage the rest 99%, but maybe the rest 50% who is doing more computation oriented uh, control to share code. And I, from my past experience, I find creating a, like a common platform uh, or common problem template is very important to ask people to kind of benchmark their algorithm against. So for example, for people doing robot control, we can have this uh, well-established uh, gym environment so that people can submit their control algorithms. I think gym is, can be used not only for RL, but also like other type of control. And for people doing maybe like a power grid stuff, there can be like other um, similar kind of common power control um, problem that can be shared and then people can test on top of that. Um, I've seen that hybrid control community or more formal methods community, they, they have those um, like a hybrid control problems and they, they organize um, those annual competitions and uh, send awards to winners. Um, that also provide a very good incentive for people to um, release their code, share with the community and uh, try to solve their, uh, try to apply their um, algorithm on those commonly defined problems. Mm -hmm. I would add a, a quick, quick remark. Um, yeah, I would say for also as an incentive, what you can do um, is have a special track for software. That's the case, for instance, for the Journal of Machine Learning or a special track for benchmark. And also have, um, that was the case for iClear. But I'm not sure they are still doing it. Um, and some reproducibility um, competition. To, uh, to have students trying to reproduce the result from the published paper. And, and that's, I would say, a different incentive to, um, to open source and so make it more reproducible. Fantastic. So let's first thank the two panelists again. Thank you.
thank you so much for joining virtually. And um, we'll finish the um, workshop just by a few things I heard throughout um, today. And I think things that we can take home. Um, so take home messages that, you know, maybe we all can work on together. So what I've seen today is, and these are just a few lessons, right? There was much more, but I've seen in, in several talks that reproducing other works is challenging due to a lack of, for example, important parameters and implementation details being reported in the paper, also the space limits that we have in papers, and even reproducing own results is not always possible or easy. Um, and so then there's um, tools that enable various, so uh, yeah, if you, Sorry, these are notes that we took while we were <laughs> while we were running the workshop. So um, they are not. Um, I hope I can make it clearer as what we have on the slide. One thing is that if we, um, you know, open source tools, this can enable various applications and real experiments. So what I wanted to say with this is that multiple people showed that their code was used and in various different real applications and real experiments way beyond what they had intended the code to be used or what they would have been able to do themselves. And um, one of the talks um, in the morning session also emphasized, I think for all the graduate students in the audience, that you can publish software tools. I think this is also important to emphasize. Again, you can, you can publish this and these papers can have a big impact. And we heard that in the hybrid um, systems community, a lot of the test of time awards were for, for software tools that were developed and published. Um, and then we also saw that open source can really accelerate research because um, the learning curve is much, uh, much less steep because if the code is open source and well documented, it's much easier for a new graduate student, for example, to learn about the techniques and reproduce the techniques and then build on top of them. So overall, it can really um, accelerate research. And, and in the last talk, we saw that making um, efforts towards minimal implementation and reducing complexity can be a good idea beyond just open sourcing the code to further, I guess, understand um, the results, understand your own code, and, and really break it down to the minimal um, relevant equations. Um, and one thing I think we also heard basically in every single talk is that people are looking for contributions to their projects and there's many um, opportunities to contribute. And this may be also a great way for anyone who is maybe even working more theoretically in controls or, um, or has less experience with writing code. Um, contributing the, to these projects is kind of an amazing learning experience, right? If you expand one of the open source tools that we saw today, you, your code will be reviewed by someone who is an expert who can give you feedback on, on your code quality, on comment, um, on how you comment your code, etc. So if you feel um, you're not ready to kind of open source your full project, maybe you want to contribute in a small part on an existing project. And then what can we do as a community next? And I think there were a few different um, suggestions. And one was a NeurIPS like reproducibility checklist. So I think this is very doable, right? Um, I mean, it needs to be coordinated with the um, co next conference organizers, but just having a checklist of what is important to report in a paper to make it reproducible. And then there was also, I guess, a question by um, the earlier panelists, why not require code for all simulation-based results in control? Because, I mean, those are purely code. There's no experiments. You could require the code for the simulation in the controller. Um, and then to further incentivize this, 
this was also just brought up um, a second ago is can we have benchmark and reproducibility tracks also in control um, similar to what happens in machine learning or hybrid systems so I think this is also something interesting to do so I think there are some very small relatively small steps that one could take to first um, on the one hand contribute yourself and I guess also more on the organizational side to really push this topic further so I think we'll end with these to do's for all of us and um, yeah hope you also um, take the time now after the workshop to connect with each other and and exchange further ideas so thanks everyone for sticking around and hope you have a good CDC thank you oh oh yeah yeah and if um if you want to not hang out in here in this room um uh, feel free to join us in the in the dallas cafe and bar um i think if you consult google you will find it on google maps and and can find your way just there i think we still have to pack up but yeah um we'll go there for a little bit till the welcome reception starts. Okay, great, thank you.